Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Green Ribbon Science Panel Meeting. My name is Carrie Rasmussen, and I'm with the Department of Toxic Substances Control's Public Participation Program. On behalf of the department, I would like to thank you for taking your time to be here today. Let me take a moment to announce that in addition to those of us that are here in the room, we also have people joining us via the webcast. Thank you all for being there today as well. If you are tuning into the discussion via the webcast and you'd like to provide input, please email your questions and comments to Safer Consumer Products at dtsc.ca.gov. Today's meeting is also being recorded and transcripts will be posted to the DTSC's public website once they are made available to the department. Finally, I want to announce to all attendees that today's Green Ribbon Science Panel Meeting is subject to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act to preserve the public transparency of the panel's discussions and decisions. Now I would like to turn the meeting over to Dr. Meredith Williams. Thank you, Carrie. Welcome all, welcome panelists. It's good to see all of you again. And um, again, we're excited for the panel meeting and panel discussion today. We have a smaller group than we have. Um, sadly, we've lost yet another panel member. So Meg Schwartzman has stepped down. Um, and um, obviously, we all know what a loss that is. Um, and um, we can't thank her enough for all the insights she provided, the steady hand, the ability to pull out and just provide a, a very unique perspective. So, and I think most of you know that we did do a, a round of recruitments for additional panel members. We have a very strong field. So next time we have a meeting, we'll have a full house. Um, we're very confident about that, so. Uh, this is another meaty meeting. I think your packets may have been some of the thicker packets you've ever received. And I think that's because we've been doing deep thinking <laughs> about where the program is and where we want it to go and how to just continue to strengthen the program and go back to the, the three concepts that um, Debbie Raffel always, her mantra was practical, meaningful, legally defensible. But especially the meaningful, um, uh, which is that we want to have a big impact and we want to make sure that we're using our energy as efficiently as we can to the maximum degree of protection that we can. And so the discussion over the next day or two will really be focused on what are some tools that we can put in place, some procedures and processes we can use to really strengthen the impact of the program and to continue to accelerate the work. The, the work is accelerating on its own, I will say. Um, and you're going to hear from Andre, who's done a tremendous job leading our chemical product evaluation team and putting a, a lot of processes in place to um, make sure that legally defensible, scientifically sound work is done to uh, prioritize our products. But now we're also in that alternatives analysis phase, starting to look ahead to regulatory responses. And we'll explore basically all phases of the program. For the first time, I think we'll touch on almost all of them. Uh, and that's, that's, a, that's a different place. So I don't want to take up too much time because the uh, agenda is so packed, but thank you all for making your way here. I appreciate it. I know how your schedules are, and we are incredibly grateful for the attention and focus you all always bring, the wisdom and advice. So thank you very much. And with that, I will turn it over to... Kelly. All right. Thank you, okay. Kelly. I, I want to join Meredith in welcoming everyone and uh, thanking the panelists uh, for your preparatory work, which was pretty extensive this time. Um, as Meredith <coughs> noted, there it's a smaller group. Uh, we have some pretty meaty subjects, so we'll have the opportunity for a little more meaningful conversation, and Helen's always saying we need to do more of that, so I'm kind of psyched about the ability to do that, because we have a really good mix of folks, even though it's a small group, I think it's the right group for this conversation. 
So I'm looking forward to that. And um, as always, I want to thank the staff and remind everybody that the importance of what we do here is really helping them strengthen the program. A lot of what I've been hearing back over the last few meetings is that the staff are really talented folks. The DTSC has hired true leaders in this area, and it's just extremely exciting to have the privilege to be able to advise this team of folks. Um, so some of what we're doing is validating stuff that they've heard before. That's okay. So if somebody says, you know, this or that, that's okay. Um, but we also give them a lot to think about, and so I encourage you to continue to challenge the staff. Uh, really say what would make this a truly excellent program, what, what would take it to the next level as we proceed, and how can we help them get there? Um, good morning and welcome. I actually want to touch on one other thing about, you know, um, well, first of all, in terms of the packet of, um, uh, 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 for, you know, preparation for this meeting, uh, it's one of those, you know, be careful what you ask for, because we've been asking for more background information. Uh, I think we got it this time. <laughs> Um, the second thing is that for this meeting, uh, you would not believe the amount of work that the staff put in in terms of organizing, in terms of setting up the questions so our meeting would be, you know, productive. I mean, the staff members just did an amazing job. And all along the whole process, so we've been, you know, uh, preparing for this meeting for quite some time, and all along the process was one person that was always asking the right questions and making sure that the staff were asking questions that would lead to a amazing work product, and that's my co-chair, uh, Kelly. Every single teleconference, while I'm just trying to figure out what's going on, she would go, did you think about this? If I were doing this, I would, I would do it this way. So just amazing job, as always. Um, so let's start off the meeting by... Um, I'm going to have the members introduce themselves uh, for the record. Um, let's start at, with Tim Malloy. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Tim Malloy. I'm from UCLA. I'm Helen Holder from HP. Uh, Elaine Cohen Hubble, US EPA. Ann Blake, Environmental and Public Health Consulting. Mike Carangelo with SC Johnson. Rebecca Sutton with San Francisco Estuary Institute. Um, Art Fong with Apple. Kelly Moran, TDC Environmental. Okay, um, so let me just uh, go over what we are trying to accomplish um, for this meeting. Um, today we'll start the meeting by getting a program update from Carl Palmer, followed by any clarifying questions that the panel members may have. We will then hold our public comment period, uh, and after the break, Andre Agassi will provide a retrospective on SCP uh, prioritization, which will introduce some ideas that the, uh, will propel SCP forward into the next decade. We'll pick up the theme of moving forward in the afternoon with an introduction from Carl, followed by a presentation from Dr. Rob Boucher, Boucher uh, who is the SCP research scientists about their um, priority product profile. After that, we will have a discussion on strategies for priority, priority product selection. And after the break, Carl will introduce the discussion on the work plan. Um, so at this point, I'm going to ask Carl to uh, provide a short update on the work that the SCP program has been doing. Carl. Thank you, Art. Uh, good morning, panel members and staff and members of the public and everyone online. Um, this morning, I'm going to give a brief update of what we've been doing. We've been doing a lot. Um, I think, um, as we usually do, I'll kind of walk through the process briefly, and then we'll have the opportunity if you have any clarifying questions. So just a quick reminder that our regulations are structured that there's basically four parts of the regulations. We identify specific chemicals of concern that we call candidate chemicals. Uh, we then evaluate uh, products that contain one or more of those chemicals, and we spend a lot of time researching those and having a dialogue with the public about selecting what we call priority products. Once we adopt those in regulation, then manufacturers who sell those into California um, proceed to go through our alternatives analysis process. Um, 
And once they come out of that process, we look at that and say, great, go do good things, or you know, we need to impose some additional requirements that we call regulatory responses. Again, there's a lot of detail in each of those, and we'll be diving into various parts of that as the, the day goes on, the meeting goes on. Um, but briefly, uh, I usually give an update. We do monitor the candidate chemicals list. There's 23 different lists, and they're living, breathing lists for the most part, uh, with a couple of exceptions. And we monitor that list, and every quarter we update our candidate chemical list. So there were no updates in the second quarter, but in the third quarter, there are three new chemicals that were added to the candidate chemical list. You'll see those at the top of this slide. Uh, two of them were added by the European Commission and their endocrine disruptors, and one of them is, uh, was added by our colleagues at OEHA uh, in, via Prop 65. I'm not going to try to pronounce any of those chemicals, but you can look them up on our CalSAFER candidate chemical list if you want more information. The other six chemicals that are on, on the list were added. They were already in one of the other lists, so they were already in our candidate chemical list, but because we have multiple lists, some lists added them, and these were all Prop 65 additions, so you can look at those if you're interested. Again, just a brief reminder that our, our Priority Products Work Plan identifies seven categories of consumer products from which we can select a specific product, um, and then um, move through the process. We have broad categories, personal care and beauty, uh, household products and furnishings, the built environment, cleaning products, food packaging is our newest category, um, and a couple other categories. So just a reminder, that's how we uh, frame that. We're going to be talking a lot about the work plan and how we go work through that. And just a reminder that as we do that in the work plan, we identify specific policy priorities um, that tell people where some of our focus is going to be as we look at all the various factors we can consider in selecting priority products. So again, we've prioritized looking at impacts to children and workers, as well as impacts on the aquatic environment and things that come in the indoor environment because we spend so much time there, and also looking at food packaging. So briefly, uh, to date we've adopted, as you know, three priority products. Um, the first ones were a, a series of children's products that contain a couple of flame retardants. Manufacturers moved away from those flame retardants and the foams that they use. Um, we subsequently um, did some sampling and analysis of those products and found that, in fact, they, they were moving away from those, so that was good news. The other two products we'll talk about in more detail, but uh, paint strippers containing methylene chloride, uh, we're happy to say are now fully in the alternatives analysis process phase. Um, and so uh, that's a group of manufacturers that are working together with us to, to move through the preliminary alternatives analysis process. And we've um, given them some feedback, and we're, we're, I'll talk more about that in a minute. And the same thing with the spray polyurethane foam systems with MDI. Uh, those manufacturers are utilizing what we call the abridged AA process, which is a short, shortened process that moves more quickly to regulatory response with the assumption that there is not a viable alternative um, currently in the market. Um, in the coming year, we're going to be going through rulemaking for four um, potential priority products. And you've heard about these before, laundry de detergents with nonethanol ethoxylates, carpets and rugs with PFAS chemicals, nail products with toluene, and uh, paint strippers and graffiti removers with NMP. These will each have their own rulemaking package, and we'll put those out for public comment. Uh, we'll put up all the documents we've been de developing over the past few years on these, uh, and everyone will have an opportunity to give us input on that as we move forward through the process. So that's, that's going to be a lot going on in rulemaking in the coming year. We also are in, still in the process of evaluating two um, potential priority products. One, we received a petition for z uh, motor vehicles with tires containing zinc, um, and that uh, was stimulated by uh, the interest of people to meet TMDLs, particularly in Southern California. Um, and we've been reviewing that petition, and we'll be putting that through our, our management process soon. And similarly, uh, we've been looking for the last couple of years on lead-acid batteries, uh, which is a large um, lift in some sense, but um, we'll be preparing to make recommendations on whether we approve that uh, as a potential priority product or not. Other things in the pipeline, um, we've been holding a series of workshops uh, on 1,4-Dioxane in cleaning products and personal care products. 1,4-Dioxane um, is a contaminant. You're going to hear much more detail about this uh, tomorrow when we talk about um, the alternatives analysis threshold process that we need to go through if we pursue this, this product. Um, and we've had um, 
posted some background documents and gotten a lot of input. Similarly, we just initiated work on the food packaging category. We had a webinar um, last month where we outlined that we're looking at four different classes of chemicals in a wide array of food packaging type products. And we're going to be rolling out workshops on each and individual uh, focus there. So actually next week we have a, a workshop on orthophthalates and BPA and their alternatives in food packaging. That will initiate a, a process of collecting information on, on those products. And then in January, we scheduled a meeting to look at food packaging with PFAS chemicals and their alternatives. Um, styrene and polystyrene will be looking at, but we haven't scheduled a workshop yet. And, and again, this is part of the, the process we've been developing, we're going to talk about, uh, where we put out a background document saying our, this is what our thinking is. We get a lot of input from all the stakeholders, and we move through the process. Um, additionally, I wanted to um, highlight that we just recently uh, put out a, a draft profile for, um, and this is sort of a mouthful, it's uh, treatment products uh, that for use on converted textiles or leathers. And converted textiles is an industry term, which essentially means that this, these are products which are sprayed on aftermarket. It's not something that's made in when you buy the couch or the chair um, that's already in the fabric. You buy it, and then perhaps the retailer offers to say, hey, for X amount of money, we'll, we'll spray this with this magic stuff. Um, and, um, or you can purchase it at retail um, over the counter. Uh, so we, we have used the, the vast amount of work we did on PFAS in looking at carpets and rugs, uh, and we've um, built on that particularly on the hazard side of the equation, to look at these products. And so we're proposing to look at that. There's a public comment period, and we're going to uh, keep going through that process um, moving forward. And additionally, we have other products in the pipeline um, that we are not ready for prime time yet, but are part of our um, ongoing process. And again, in the nail category, in, the, in personal care products, we've been looking at nail products for a long time. Uh, I wanted to highlight that we are blessed to have uh, staff at our environmental chemistry lab who can actually do sampling analysis of products. So we've been looking at a vast array of nail products. Um, that's going to inform us as we move forward and hopefully utilize our, our information call authority to focus on, on some data gaps that we would like information on. Similarly, we are in the process of looking at personal care and cleaning products and looking at how we can go ahead and analyze those products to look at 1,4-dioxane, which is a contaminant. It's not intentionally added to products. Um, it's a different technical challenge, but that will inform us about the concentrations of 1,4-D in those types of products as we move forward um, in that space. My most excitement right now is that we are doing alternatives analysis. We, the greater we, the manufacturers for both spray polyurethane foam and for methylene chloride uh, paint strippers are in the process and it's happening. Uh, we spent a lot of time over the last few years developing guidance, talking about this process, people wondering if, how it will work. Well, it's working now. So the paint stripper um, manufacturers submitted uh, a preliminary alternatives analysis. We issued a notice of deficiency. They've responded to that. Uh, we've had a lot of dialogue with them. We are reviewing their responses and um, we're hoping that um, by early next month we'll have a decision about approval of that preliminary AA at which point, if we approve those, they will move forward into the final AA process, which is they have up to a year to finalize the AA. Um, for the, sp the spray foam manufacturers, they submitted abridged AAs, and as I mentioned earlier, this is a process which um, is a little different in that, one, there's a public comment period that just closed this week. Uh, we posted that uh, the preliminary AAs. Um, we are going to, in the process now of evaluating those public comments, and we will determine if the manufacturers are required to, re to respond to those comments. Additionally, we'll give our comments and go through the same approval process. And if we need to, we'll issue a notice of deficiency or we'll approve it. At that point, we go into a fast track towards regulatory response. So we'll be dealing with that sometime next year, hopefully. Um, and that, uh, we'll talk about that some t tomorrow afternoon. But it's exciting because we have a lot of engagement with the manufacturers. We're um, testing our process and we're getting things on the street. You can look at them, CalSafer, at all of these documents, uh, with the exception of the, anything that's redacted. It's all very public. So looking at a snapshot of what we're doing holistically, this, this graphic really shows that we sort of feed the process by doing the research uh, in our CPEC team. And we put these out in, in a public forum and get input. 
Uh, we then identify proposed product, priority products, uh, which we get additional input, and then we move into rulemaking to adopt them as uh, formal priority products. Once they're listed, they get into the alternatives analysis process. Um, and ultimately, what you don't see on this graphic is the regulatory response process. But this is a snapshot of just what's in the pipeline right now, and doesn't even include some of the things I mentioned, like um, um, that are feeding into the, the early stages. Um, so we've got a lot going on. Um, back to Merida's highlighting that we want to be meaningful, uh, is that um, this is a, a challenge for us, is that we're really excited that we're in the AA process, but we um, are looking at feeding this process and that we um, are going to keep doing this. So as things move through the process, we'll keep feeding this, and, and we're, we're, we're backing up against our, our limitations in terms of resources, but things are going well, and um, as we learn and get your input on this process and make it even better, uh, we'll be doing more and more as best we can. So it's an exciting time. Um, I wanted to highlight... Um, one aspect of the program, you've heard Meredith and I talk about Meredith's pillars of uh, building capacity, executing, and leading. And one thing that I'm very excited about is that um, Andre and I were just talking about how uh, every day we're just amazed by our staff and they come up with new approaches, new questions, new tools. Um, and I just wanted to highlight one example of that. So as we were looking at the 1-4-D challenges, uh, the team looked at how do we make this, this, meet this criteria of saying, is there a, the potential for significant and, and or widespread um, harm or contribution to that? And so how do we get the data? How do we analyze that? So one of the things they did early on was they took some new tools we had and some new staff who've got some perspectives, and they said, okay, we'll look at California's population, and let's overlay the US EPA, UCMR drinking water data and see what that looks like. And so the, the, the red... Um, uh, they're kind of red, rusty red, show that, that when you compare population and, and those levels, it looks like there's more of a concern in Southern California. Well, as we pull, kept pulling that screen and looking at the data, we used Cal Virus Screen data to further look more closely. And Cal Virus Screen is a tool that takes a lot of data from everyone in this building and, so, and identifies where there are areas of concern uh, where communities are, are disproportionately impacted. And so when you start looking at that, you can see there are areas of the state where there are concerns, EJ concerns, um, because of the, the sort of total load on those communities. So then when you look even a little bit closer, um, important updates. No, I don't need that. Remind me later. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, that would, that would be a faux pas. So um, when you look a little closer, at the data, and then you say, well, when you take that, the EPA data, and you take the Envirus, Cal Envirus Store data, and you look specifically at where there are, are challenges with 1,4-D, and you look at where those are, what this slide does, it helps us to say, yes, this is significant. It's not just because there's higher levels of 1,4-D, but these are in areas where there are a lot of other factors. And so our broad... Um, efforts to make sure that not only are we meeting the basic criteria, but that we're being meaningful, that we're being um, efficient, that we're taking, uh, working on things that are important. This gives us a greater ability to focus in and to do that evaluation, as well as to tell our story to all the external stakeholders of, well, why are you picking 1,4-D? This is part of the reason. So this is relatively new, that we have some of these tools and abilities to, to mine the data from different sources and put them together uh, and make decisions. So I'm very excited about that in general. Uh, I just wanted to continue a little bit on building the capacity issue is that um, we're also looking, and you'll hear a lot about the program things we are doing. Uh, we've had it added a couple of new scientific interns. Uh, you may have met one of them this morning, Sally, at the, at the check-in, yes, and, and Giselle here. Uh, we're excited to have them. Uh, and they're, they're working pr predominantly with CPET on specific projects and uh, finding data for us and doing a great job. And it's part of our commitment, not only to getting the work done, but to trying to work with young scientists who are trying to look at where they can use their resources and skills in the future. And so uh, it's a great win-win for us, and we're going to continue to build on that process. Um, additionally, as time goes on, you know, we are hiring more people, and we're losing some people, too. Um, uh, we're hiring a senior environmental scientist because Daphne Molin, who'd been with us from day one, um, was 
promoted justifiably, uh, but unfortunately to our colleagues at Calvary Cycle. Um, we are still working with her, uh, uh, and it's a, it's a great benefit as we look at food packaging and some of the nexus with Calvary Cycle. Uh, but kudos to her, but we're going to be back filling her position. We're also, we've promoted some of our scientists into senior positions, so we have some entry-level positions, and so we're going to be uh, coming out uh, with a notice on that very soon. And we're also getting uh, an additional staff toxicologist. So as time goes on, we're building um, our, our team, and we're losing a few, but we're very excited about the great staff we have. I also want just a couple of highlights. Um, we try to stay uh, current and get uh, and improve ourselves in terms of training. We, uh, Tony Luan and the AA team have, have um, been all in on getting appropriate training on hazard assessment, and we have a couple of staff who are getting the advanced green screen training, and several other staff are doing the, whatever the second level is. Um, so we're, we're trying to stay on top of that. And we're also procuring additional databases and, and tools to get more market and, and product information. So that's sort of the whirlwind tour of uh, the high level of what we're doing. Um, and um, I'm really excited that we're going to be diving into some of these things uh, as the day goes on and tomorrow. And um, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, at, this, at this time, are there any clarifying questions for Carl? Um, just a couple of reminders. Uh, we will continue to use the name tent method if you want to ask a question. And when you're asking questions and speaking, uh, please be sure to speak to um, one of the mics uh, to make sure that our web participants can hear your um, qu questions and responses. Uh, are there any questions for Carl? Clarifying questions. Mike? And again, first I just want to say how impressed I am with, with all of the work that staff has been doing here. And, and, and doing the pre-read just reminded me of, of all the, the, the ways you're doing work. You're not just getting things done, but you're looking at it in so many different ways. It's very impressive. Um, question for you, and it, it goes even a little bit later in, in the program. So now we've got, you've got AAs coming in, and you've got the foam padding that no AAs came in, and, and, and you verified it's not out there. What's the, the feedback loop going to be to make sure that a, a new uh, industry doesn't come in, a, a new manufacturer of, say, bed padding, mm -hmm. come in that's got those and they're just unaware of the program? How, how are you monitoring that? Is there a program to do that? That's a great question, Mike. Um, part of, um, with our limited resources, we, you know, when we are implementing a law, we take it seriously that not only should we try to implement it and look, work with people, but that we should make sure that people are doing it. So there's a compliance aspect and ultimately an enforcement aspect. We did that snapshot on the children's products because we thought it was important to get that. But it was just that as a snapshot. Um, there's no question that in the long term, we're going to need to have adequate resources to maintain an adequate and appropriate level of compliance monitoring and when necessary enforcement. We're doing that in-house with what we've got and um, the way we typically do that is we have initiatives, we be thoughtful about well, how can we leverage to make sure that we send messages that we're paying attention uh, and then we respond also to when we get complaints or if someone identifies where they think there's a compliance issue. That's sort of the mode we're in. It's our hope that over time we'll be able to build our capability. Because we have such great resources, we have a, um, with ECL's ability to do uh, sampling and analysis and um, the great staff we have in terms of working with uh, manufacturers in terms of um, first and foremost achieving compliance. So it is going to be an ongoing need when you look at that chart of all the things we're doing. It doesn't include some of those infrastructure and other things. Compliance enforcement is a significant one. Just on staff development and some of the large amounts of fairly innovative, interesting you know, um, analyses that you do. So for example, the 1,4 dioxane spatial mapping. Right. Uh, do they publish? Are you publishing that? Are they going to? Um, well, that's interesting. Uh, we're we're publishing that, uh, in, not in the traditional sense. What we're doing is we're putting this all this information right. in our background documents and our profiles. So, so yeah. So I guess that's my question: is you yeah. you do a huge amount of work on these background documents and profiles? Right. I mean, that, and and there's pieces of that that are absolutely publishable in the peer review, um, review literature. Right. And on top of Staff development, it's, it right. also is um, building your scientific basis. 
Um, right. And I know it's a bandwidth thing, but um, really, it's a good point. Really awesome work. Yes. Well, thank you. And and, and we, we we are aware of that, and we're working on that. We have recently, I think Xiaoying was on a, a paper uh, that was published recently, and the the paper that the AA team developed. Um, uh, for the AA symposium last year, when we went out and looked at all these different other AAs out there, um, we we're in the process. We've submitted that. Where's Kelly? Uh, we're, we're working on on trying to get that published, and and we recognize that that is a valuable tool to both recognize the good work we're doing and to sort of stimulate the dialogue. It is a bandwidth issue, and so it, we're kind of doing it as we can now. But uh, the staff is doing a lot of great work. Um, and we do get our, our profiles are essentially peer reviewed uh, through our process. It's not the, the same uh, process that you're talking about, but I appreciate that. And we will hopefully be able to continue to do that, both for staff development as well, um, but for the program. Kelly? Yeah, I just want to build on that in the uh, one of the ways that scientific papers are valuable for regulatory agencies is that having something in the peer reviewed journal uh, provides greater weights, let's say, with the courts. So a part of why Department of Pesticide Regulation funds its scientists for time to take things that are important basis for their regulatory programs into scientific journal papers is that the courts give them deference in that area. So it, it helps strengthen it. So it's a little different approach, um, and it's something to be thinking about. It's not just professional development. It's also that it provides, it's a different way of providing strength for the basis of the regulatory decisions that DTSC is making. So I, it's, it's something I, I've been thinking about a lot as being really important to get things out there. And the quality of the work that I'm seeing from the teams here is really very high caliber. There are different kinds of papers. I, we tend to focus in on the shorter ones because we those who don't see that many papers look at environmental science and technology, environmental toxicology and chemistry. But there are also journals that publish these longer review type things that are similar to the profiles, you know, some of the archives of this and that and so forth. We'll do that kind of thing. And it is something that I really want to join Elaine, and I, we've talked about this before, but to continue to have the department consider that as you, as you all move forward in this program and bringing it to maturity. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, we appreciate that support and perspective, and I know the staff would appreciate it, too. They would, are all there. Yeah. I guess I just wanted to add another plug for that, because I know you've mentioned several times the amount of work that went into particularly the PFAS profile. And I know that in, in my world, in the alternatives assessment uh, consulting world, that we use that because of the references and we know how excellent it is. Um, and it's just an incredibly useful document. So I'd echo what, what uh, Kelly said, that if you publish it in a journal that uh, takes these longer reviews, I think that would be enormously helpful to the field. Yes, thank you. And, and just to, to highlight as well that something that's not as obvious is that uh, as you highlight the PFAS profile, um, as you all know, people in every media, a lot of people working on PFAS these days. Yes. And so our colleagues at the Water Board and Air Board and Cal Recycle have all looked at our profile, and it's been useful because uh, a lot of the work we did translates particularly on just the fundamental science and hazard assessment work, uh, along with OEO's work. Uh, has been very valuable in their domains as well. So we're trying, you know, again, it's a bandwidth issue, but there's a lot of common ground. We can certainly improve on that in terms of uh, publication, but also for just functionally speaking, the work we're doing is valuable within Cali PA uh, and other agencies as well. Also to local agencies and NGOs that work with. Right, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Carl, uh, you mentioned in your presentation, uh, I missed part of it, uh, I think it was related to um, priority product selection, and you said something about not ready for prime time. Could you just sure. expand on that? And well, Andre's going to talk a little more about how our, our overall process, but um, you know, part of the question, and we're going to address this, is how do we get from a work plan of categories to actually a proposed priority product when these categories are quite large. There are thousands of products, and our candidate chemical list has thousands of chemicals. And so how do we sift through that? And we've talked about this in previous meetings in a general way. Today, we're, I'm excited. We're going to talk about a little more specifically about not like what we do, but how we do it. Um, and so what that process is iterative, and as the staff they know my favorite word in this process is discernment. 
because we don't know from the get-go what exactly we're going to target. We have to go out and start evaluating data, collecting information, having discussions so that we can learn. And as we learn, that points us in different directions. Um, and so each step of the way. So what the not ready for prime time stuff is the stuff that we're still learning on. We're not ready to come out and say, oh, we think this is a direction we're going. But we're, we're still looking through those categories and the work plan actively as we have time to feed the process. And those will be trickling up as we go through it. Thank you. Are there any more clarifying questions for Carl? Uh, seeing none. Um, so at this point, thank you. Uh, before we go into the panel discussion, uh, we'll pick. We'll take public comments. Okay. Before today's panel discussion, we will take public comment. If there are any webinar participants who are wishing to comment at today's meeting, please email your comments to saferconsumerproducts at dtsc.ca.gov, and it will be read aloud. Comments submitted remotely will be read to the panel after we hear from the commenters in the room. The public is reminded that today's comments are directed to the Green Ribbon Science Panel and the agenda topics, that is, the materials that were presented to the panel. Public comments directed to DTSC are not appropriate at this meeting. Please note that the panel is not able to respond to comments or answer any questions as it is a working meeting. Has anyone signed up to comment here in the room? Not at this time. Baku, do we have any from online? Okay. So that concludes our public comment for today. We will again do this tomorrow. So if anyone would like to submit them, we will ask for them again. Thank you. Okay, Carrie, thank you very much. Um, actually, we're scheduled for a break at 9.55. Um, given the fact that we have so much time, uh, I just want to ask, want to ask Carl one more clarifying uh, question. Uh, it was related to paint strippers, and you said that there was, uh, after the initial AA, and there was back and forth with the uh, uh, manufacturers. Mm -hmm. Was that, in terms of the back and forth, was that productive, or, and, and did the process go kind of what you were expecting? Uh, yes, I think so. Um, what we did was... Um, a, a couple of things. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time developing the gu AA guide. We did a variety of trainings. We had some webinars, which we're all trying to tee up. But once you get to the specifics, uh, what we did was we reached out to uh, the manufacturers and said, well, we want to work with you if you have questions. And so we assigned individual staff to each man. Each manufacturer had an individual staff member assigned so that we, they would have an advocate to make sure they got their questions answered. We also had conference calls with their consultant to make sure that we could explain when they had questions. Um, and I think... Can I interject? Yeah, sure, go ahead. So just, just so you understand, they did take the consortium approach. Oh, right. So I don't, I don't think you mentioned I didn't that. mention that. Wanna... Yeah, so our regulations allow that manufacturers that are, are subject to the regulation don't have to do it alone. They can collaborate with other manufacturers who are also regulated. So in this case, uh, for methylene chloride, the halogenated, halogenated Solvents Industry Alliance coordinated with the manufacturers to hire a consultant that could work on behalf of all of them, and they could submit a baseline AA, and then they each individual company could submit uh, additional information that was specific to their company so that um, they would have the efficiency of, of, one, it costs less money, and two, they had sort of learning across each company uh, and consistently and the ability to coordinate better with us. That's worked, I think, very well. I think for them, uh, we got good feedback from HSIA and the manufacturers that it worked well for them and they appreciated it. And that, coupled with our sort of commitment to, to answer their questions, 
uh, worked quite well. Then they submitted their initial uh, preliminary AA. There were a variety of issues that we identified that they needed to do additional work, so we, we issued a notice of deficiency. We didn't just issue it and walk away and say, we'll see you in a month or when you're done. We said, if you have questions, let us know. And so we did have an active dialogue with them to help them get through that and understand what our concerns were, and then we could give them feedback. So I think that's been very productive. Um, kudos to our AA team who have been all in on this um, and um, to the manufacturers themselves uh, who have been very proactive. So um, I think the other benefit that we're having is that um, with the SPF AA is sort of going on concurrently, although it's um, an abridged AA approach, a lot of the similar issues are coming up. And the SPF folks hired the same consultants that the methylene chloride folks did to be their primary um, person for collaboration because they're collaborating as well. And so the learnings that are happening are, are, are being shared across all the people that are regulated and as well with us. Oh, wow, that's been, thank you very much. Um, so let's take a break and come back at five after. Just getting warmed up. Ten, ten o'clock. Oh, yes. ten o'clock. Oops. Yeah. All right. And and I, I'll encourage everyone to turn off the mic in front of you um, during the break, um, and just let folks know that um, there is a we are being webcast via the camera behind me, so you are not particularly visible on this. Uh, particularly when there's a presentation up there, it's really focused on that. But you are on video, so I'm sure that the viewers are enjoying the back of my head tremendously. <laughs> so so with that, we're on break. As you know, um, our regulations were adopted in fall of 2013, so we've been spending about six years on um, implementation. Um, and throughout that process, as we've developed and built this process, we've come to the grasp to share with you our perspective on how we're doing what we're doing. And we really appreciate the continuous feedback we've had on, on that. Um, today, I'm happy to say that we're taking a little more comprehensive look at these fundamental processes that we uh, do, particularly in terms of how we select priority products um, and how we communicate that. So, um, Andre Algazi, who leads our clinical product evaluation team, is going to talk about uh, uh, our look back or retrospective on this process. And then we're going to follow uh, Andre with a few speakers uh, talking about both how, how we develop our priority product profiles, how we work through the priority product selection process, and then I'm going to talk briefly about the work plan process. So holistically, what you see is this, this whole um, feeding of the process and how we do it. And what we're doing today and the documents we provided are, are a more detailed look at some of the tools we've used, some of the tools we've developed. Um, as you know, we have a wide variety of factors to consider in our decision making. And it's much like an alternatives analysis. It's really about what are the trade-offs? What are the values that we're um, using? And where do we want to go? So um, a year ago, uh, Gina Solomon was here and presented information that, that ultimately came out in PHI's uh, kind of look at the green chemistry laws and implementation. And one of the recommendations in their report was that we work with the Green Ribbon Science Panel to evaluate the scientific and procedural foundation of our prioritization process to ensure it's as efficient as possible. So what we're doing today is opening up some of that information, and we're really looking forward to you hearing this and giving us feedback um, as how we're doing and, and suggestions for how we might do better and some thoughts on those trade-offs that we uh, are making and how we can, can do that as best as possible. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Andre. Okay, thank you, Carl. Good morning, everybody. Um, see here. Are you clicking the space bar? So um, I may have gotten ahead by one. Here we go. So uh, as Carl mentioned, uh, today is largely kind of dedicated to the process by which we go from our work plan to um, a priority product. And uh, I'm going to be focusing on looking back over the last six years. We're already in our seventh year now. And um, so um, 
after lunch, uh, Carl kind of already went through, we're going to be talking about how we, uh, you know, some of the considerations for selecting products. I'm going to touch on that as well, and, and then the work plan. So uh, you've seen this diagram before in various contexts. We've put it in some of our previous profiles and other public documents and presentations, um, or you've seen something like it. And this is just sort of to illustrate uh, some, some of the evolution of the way we've done things in uh, the chemical and product evaluation team in SCP and how it's uh, evolved. They don't look drastically different, but you'll notice um, that there is an additional step um, of, uh, that, uh, called scoping uh, and revising scope before we actually uh, begin to develop a pro product chemical profile. And then secondly, there's a, that blue oval which uh, says expanded input. So uh, I wanted to kind of zoom in on the blue oval and talk about what what we mean by expanded input, and this uh, I'll be touching on a lot of these things uh, later in this talk. So uh, one is that we've expanded the the, the pool of people and um, ways to, that we get to a specific product chemical uh, combinations. And, um, in the past, as I'll talk about, we had reached out to some specific stakeholders and. Um, we're, we're given some suggestions for product chemical combinations. Uh, now we have a work plan, now we go through sort of a more iterative process. We also have products that we've looked at in the past that were promising, but for one reason or another we didn't pursue, and so we also kind of have a long list of potential um, products that we could pick up, and we've done some work on already. We get some ideas from, through, from our collaborators, um, and then uh, we've also augmented our toolkit. I'll talk a bit about that um, uh, later on, and um, both in sort of data sets that are useful for uh, answering the questions we need to answer to get to a priority product and to explain our rationale, and um, some data analysis tools, which Carl sort of talked on, uh, touched on uh, when he was um, showing the, the slides um, visualizing the 1,4-dioxane and the um, vulnerable communities. And we've also built our expertise within the program through um, um, both hiring uh, and um, training. So this is sort of the, the general themes I'm going to touch on, are the, the kinds of data inf and information that we need uh, to do our work, um, some of the non-regulatory considerations that go into our decisions, and um, as illustrated in the Background, there are a number of documents in your packet, as you know, it's pretty thick, but the one that's called prioritization retrospective, there are some appendices, and um, so there's a table in there in Appendix C, I think, that sort of lays out the type of information that we uh, uh, need and how readily available it is. Um, some of the challenges we've encountered and how we've tried to address them. Uh, some sort of overarching lessons that we've learned over the several iterations we've done of product research and scoping. Uh, how our process has been uh, evolving and um, some new um, work initiatives that we're doing uh, going forward to continue to improve. So um, pretty maybe obviously um, in order to develop the, to make our prioritization decisions and develop our technical documents, we need to know some things about the chemicals that we're looking at and as well uh, about the products. So um, things like um, physical chemical properties and toxicological properties of the chemical, um, exposure from the chemical to the product, uh, in the product, uh, the market presence of the product, and sort of the larger context. So uh, a lot of the tools and templates that we've developed over the, the, the last few years have uh, centered on how to identify what data we need to collect uh, and how to collect it and analyze it and interpret it. Some of this data is more challenging to, to get uh, and, uh, and analyze than other, as I'll, I'll touch on uh, later in the presentation. Did I jump slides inadvertently? Yeah. So in addition to information on the chemical and the product, we also want to kind of think about the regulatory landscape that's already um, out there, and are we able to make uh, a meaningful enhancement to the protection of public health and the environment? So um, just as a couple of examples, um, the recent EPA action on paint strippers with methylene chloride applies to retail products. I had it... Um, 
had it applied more broadly, or if it did in the future, we might have maybe made different decisions about that product. Um, but of course, that that hadn't happened yet. Uh, another one in uh, the packet in the uh, one of the appendices uh, showing some of the products that we looked at and didn't pursue. Uh, we had um, we had evaluated um, hair straighteners with. Um, with uh, formaldehyde as a potential priority product, but just at that time there was uh, litigation pending based on Proposition 65, and we didn't know how the dust would settle with that, so we made the decision not to pursue it at that time. So um, the other regulatory programs is a regulatory factor, but there are a lot of things that are non-regulatory considerations that we, we have to think about. Um, and Carl and Meredith talked a bit about, um, or Meredith mentioned uh, Debbie Raphael's um, um, practical, meaningful, and legally defensible um, sort of framework. And so when it gets to the meaningful, uh, how well, you know, we want to be able to, uh, to support what we're doing and tell a good story that's compelling to our stakeholders. Um, so some of the things that we have to think about are how well, well characterized is the science behind this chemical? Some, sometimes we have to do additional work to really make a strong case. Um, um, how, um, what are the important exposure pathways and how does the product we're looking at come into, uh, you know, pl play into that? And um, how significant and widespread uh, are the um, potential adverse impacts? Because our, our, our regulatory framework is, uh, has a relatively... Um, low threshold for, for us to meet regulatorily as far as listing a product. Um, so we really need to uh, think uh, beyond the minimum to, to be able to make the case why this and not something else and, and allocate our resource res or limited resources and effectively. So, um, you know, just some other kind of policy considerations that, that come into play. <clears throat> So next I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we've uh, faced over time as we've been, and sort of recurring challenges we faced in addressing some of those questions that I've just talked about. So uh, one of the big ones has been um, getting product ingredient data and uh, market data. And uh, we're supposed to rely on to the extent we can readily available information that's in the public domain. Uh, and so, so it's uh, what we did initially is developed a curated list of useful data sources that we've shared within the team for people that are trying to find out, you know, which chemicals are in products within this category, what's the, you know, what's the, how big a piece of the pie is this product chemical combination relative to the product more broadly, things like that. So we, we found some useful um, data sources. Um, some of them are reliant on uh, safety data sheets, compendiums of, of sa safety data sheets. Um, but those, those have their limitations as well, and sometimes these compendiums have uh, older and newer data kind of commingled together, and, and so it's, it's somewhat of a challenge to figure out what's actually in the market now. So um, we have um, purchased some other uh, access to some additional data sets that have been very helpful to us. Um, the Minto Global New Products Database is compiled by uh, the Mintel by actually purchasing products. They have shoppers around the world. They purchase products, photograph the labels, put them in a database. And so we're able to um, actually see what products are introduced in the market year by year and what sorts of chemicals are in them. So that's been a hugely useful tool for us. Um, Dunn and Bradstreet Hoovers have been useful just for understanding um, the, who the players are and the markets uh, for products. And then we've recently got this... Um, data set called Veris 3E. It's, a, it's an SDS data sheet, uh, data, database that we're able to filter in useful ways. Um, and so uh, we're also finding that to be quite more useful than other SDS databases that we've had in the past. Other ways for, for us to try to obtain information on um, product ingredients and market data are things like using our lab, as Carl talked about. So we have a couple of, of pending lab projects related to nail products and um, 1,4-dioxane as well. And then um, we have uh, the information call-in authority in our regulations, and we're all also, as we announced at our Toluene public workshop for the um, 
initiating the um, pre-rulemaking process, we intend to, to use that as well. So as uh, Carl has mentioned, you know, he and I have been continuously impressed, you know, over time with the, the talent of our staff and, um, and their sort of initiative and um, hard work and um, subject matter expertise, but we did have some gaps that we identified uh, in our expertise and we have taken some steps to address them. Um, so three of them that kind of jump out to me are um, data science, sort of just working with big data sets and trying to sort of ask research questions using big data sets and mashing them together and things like that. Uh, another one was exposure science and another one was economics and both understanding uh, product markets and market shares and things like that and also in the regulatory uh, realm where we have to identify the, the economic impact of whatever our action is. So um, we've addressed that through um, a, a number of, uh, of approaches. One, as I mentioned, is, is in recruiting and hiring. So we've, uh, we have um, Xing Yu Meng, who is our um, resident uh, um, exposure science expert, and he has been just a huge uh, boon to our program, really helpful and just very smart, thoughtful uh, guy. Um, we have, um, uh, and now we have a, uh, an economist, a PhD economist in our program, uh, Kyle Harris. And uh, we also um, have in just recruiting for um, sci environmental scientists and engineers, look for people that have some background in uh, data science that have worked with uh, data sets in the past. And we've also had people within the program going through uh, training programs and things like that. We also uh, have uh, leveraged the fact that we're in an agency with people with a lot of subject matter expertise. So we work regularly with, for example, um, OEHA, the State Water Board, Air Resources Board, various people in the building with expertise. So uh, we've also procured some software. These are some of the, the, um, the tools that we've been using in the program to sort of work with uh, big data sets, the data analytic tools that have been helpful to us, and we're building our expertise using these. So um, those are some of the things, some of the challenges and some of the things we've done to at least in part address them. Um, you know, they're, they're never completely solved, but uh, we definitely made a lot of progress and we're really um, reaping the benefits of, of the efforts we've made already. Uh, I wanted to talk about sort of now, some of the, the lessons that we've learned, uh, and then I'll talk about how, the, how we've sort of adapted or evolved our program to sort of take to use them. Um, so part of some of the uh, observations that have been made about our program is that, the, you know, it took us quite, quite a, a lengthy period of time between announcing our first priority products in March of 2014 and initiating rulemaking in 2017, something Around, around there. So um, part of that was um, a um, kind of a gap in, in project planning. Uh, we, we, we were, you know, kind of probably adequate, but um, there was a lot of uh, unforeseen um, challenges and extra steps and that we hadn't anticipated and um, resources being pulled in different directions. Uh, so that was one uh, area where we learned that we could definitely benefit from making some changes. Um, another was sort of uh, more formally kind of spelling out what we do when we do um, our research and our scoping work on products and chemicals. And one of the documents that was emailed to the panel, uh, and I think it's also on the website for the public website, is uh, one of our um, scoping tools. I'll talk about that later when I talk about our solutions. Um, and then the, the, the idea of that there's always room for improvement, so we've tried to embrace sort of continuous uh, improvement in our processes, and um, you know we've we've made what we think are really good tools, templates, and processes, and then we've continued to sort of kind of improve them over time as we've continued to learn. <clears throat> Another um, learning that um, was pretty early on in the in the uh, history of our program was the value of stakeholder communication during our work and not just putting our product chemical profile out as sort of a uh, finished product and then sort of um, hearing about all the things we had done wrong and all the things we should have considered and all the misconceptions we had and things like that. 
So um, this picture is actually of, uh, at our um, most recent 1,4 dioxane public workshop where we actually had a sort of table-led uh, dis facilitated discussion to try to engage all our stakeholders and not just sort of have them um, stepping up and making their statements and sitting down or just kind of hovering in the back. Uh, so uh, we, we learned at the, at the outset when we were naming priority products that we didn't understand the way that the manufacturers that we were talking about defined their products um, or how, what chemicals were and weren't used in products, things like that. We also learned that um, the way we communicate externally um, can save a lot of time by preventing miscommunication. One of the things that we learned early on was that our profile was being used for sort of marketing purposes as a determination that the product we were identifying as uh, having potential adverse impacts was bad and that some other product was good. And we weren't trying to say that with it. We were, uh, so we've tried to sort of set the record straight by adding some disclaimer language and things to our templates, um, things like that. So I, I mentioned that our initial process took a while. Um, so Simona Balan, who's sitting up here at the table, was uh, the, the led a project, uh, Lean Six Sigma project, a couple of years ago um, with the governor's, uh, the Go Biz, whatever that stands for, Governor's Office of Business and something, um, which uh, encourages state agencies to to um, to send um, people to the, their uh, training program to earn their green belt in Lean Six Sigma and, and sort of work on process improvement. So the, the problem statement, the initial baseline, and I'm not using Lean Six Sigma terminology, but um, except for critical X's, but the baseline was three and a half years from initial scoping to finalizing the product chemical profile. And Simona and her team had sort of limited data, but because um, we didn't really like make a, a, a a deliberate effort to sort of track how much time things were taking. As I mentioned, our project management processes weren't all that well defined, but um, nevertheless, the elapsed time was pretty long. And so um, she and her team identified uh, what are called the critical X's, which are factors that are, that are um, I'm trying to move my cursor here, but they're the factors that are likely to affect the, pro the, the quality of, of the product. And, um, they were things like uh, decision making, unclear process, um, uh, the tools and templates. I have them on the part that I'm not able to scroll on. But um, so uh, we we implemented some solutions based on that um, on that work, and um, we're hoping that that would cut the, um, the the elapsed time from three and a half to one and a half years. So that's where we think we're going to be. So um, in a nutshell. We've eliminated one of our scoping phases, that separatory funnel diagram that I had up earlier uh, used to have an additional separatory funnel, um, fifth one, and we've combined product and chemical scoping. Um, we've developed a compendium of information for staff called the Quick Start Guide. Um, we've implemented a decision log in our project planning template so we can kind of keep track of who makes what decisions when so we don't forget or have to kind of uh, re-decide things that have already been decided. And um, we've screen streamlined our scoping template. And that was what I wanted to show you a moment ago. And I remembered, uh, no, that, it's not time yet. So this should have been emailed out to you. And what I think is really nice about the scoping uh, template is that it has the guidance uh, for the staff and the teams that are doing the research embedded in it. The types of, of information that we're looking for, the type of um, um, some questions to be thinking about when you write. So this has been a, um, an approach that we've taken with several of our templates, uh, as well with our profile template. We take all that out before we, we publish it, but uh, it, it has been, um, I think, made our doc documents um, sort of raise the bar on, on the quality of the documents and also um, made them more consistent between uh, each other. So as far as the project management um, challenges, what we, what we did internally is uh, we brought in a, a trainer and we sat down for two days as a group and kind of got a, kind of a project management boot camp, basics of project management, defining your scope, schedule, and budget, and having a project charter and things like that. It may seem like fairly basic stuff, and those of you in industry, probably that's pretty SOP for what you do. Um, but um, there were a lot of benefits, both from the information uh, that we 
gleaned from this training, but also just sort of doing it all together and, uh, you know, staff and management. And so we've really tried to build a culture and an expectation around doing project management. Uh, now, now when people in my team are working on a um, research or scoping project and something changes that's going to cause a delay or some whatever it might be, I get a, actually a change request and look at it and it goes into a change log and things like that. So we're much more sort of closer handle on what's going on with our projects. We're better able to plan and predict and allocate our resources. So we developed uh, from the training materials some templates uh, that we use for um, laying out the plan of we call it the project, um, let's see, the roadmap and the toolkit. So um, people will prepare the roadmap document for their project. It includes the change log, who's on the team, what's the schedule, what are the deliverables, what, you know, things like that. We aren't, you know, too rigid about it. We give people some flexibility, uh, but, the, but we do expect, um, you know, scope, schedule, and resources to be defined before we start the project. So I mentioned already the scoping template, the scoping report template, which was sent out to you. We had intended also to share this one, but it's, um, this is the, actual, the profile template. I just did a screenshot of page five because the first few pages are just sort of cover and background. But we're following a similar approach here. The yellow highlighted text are um, guidance to staff who are filling it in. Um, so it's just sort of what to, you know, product definition and scope, and include a definition of the products and other identifying information such as GPC brick codes. So um, the thing is 20-some pages, and we've got pretty detailed instructions throughout. Um, we've recently, after being through um, a round of profile writing for the carpets and rugs and the laundry detergents had a small group taking what was, you know, not quite perfect and what was frustrating about the previous template and uh, revising it. So one of the challenges is that there are in the framework regulations dozens of factors to consider and some of them are pretty similar, um, you know, market presence uh, versus... Um, I don't know. So we, we've basically taken a lot of those and tried to consolidate them, remove some of the headings, and just sort of uh, work towards improving the flow while still kind of citing, uh, re re referencing the regulatory sections that we're talking about. Uh, this is the scoping report template I already talked about. So, so um, we've we've learned a number of lessons. We've implemented some process improvements, we've acquired some tools, some expertise, and we continue to sort of think about how we can do our work better. So um, here are some things that are in sort of various stages. Some, some of these are still kind of in the, in the early discussion stage, stages, but um, some of the next uh, things that we're um, pursuing are some collaborations with um, other folks. Um, we are, um, we've had some presentations on uh, systematic review from Patrice Sutton from, UCS, uh, from UCSF and Chris Thayer from EPA came out and visited us as well. And uh, we are, um, it's been a bit of um, fallen by the wayside, but we are intending to pursue that and try to uh, make use of that uh, methodology to try to sort of make our, our research more, more effective and expedient, things like that. We've also been talking um, with Elaine and RD preliminarily about um, some exposure analysis workflows that they're working on. So we've been providing some scenarios and we're hoping that we can um, leverage their tool and help to help us do our work as well. We've also been talking a lot with FDA because a lot of our products, the current categories in our work plan uh, overlap with things that they regulate. They've been um, uh, involved in our uh, work with nail products on one for dioxane and our current food packaging work as well. We also have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, developed really good working relationships with uh, sister agencies, both within California EPA and uh, outside the agency. We has been, um, we've consulted with them really from the, from the outset of our program, and um, they're also one of the reviewers of our profiles before they go public. Um, we've had a lot of conversations with the State Water Board yeah, recently with several of our projects, including the nonophenol and nonophenol thoxalates and detergents project, zinc and tires petition, and uh, one for dioxane. We've also been talking with the SWAMP program, which is uh, looking at uh, 
collecting data on chemicals of emerging concern uh, and, and suggesting analytes that might be included in that effort. Uh, we also have uh, some collaborations with other states. We have an MOU for sharing uh, data between California, Oregon, and Washington. We've been talking with um, states of New York and Vermont recently. A lot of those are sort of informal, but um, we you know, building the, the relationship. And a lot of times they, they have programs uh, in Washington State, for example, they have their uh, new consumer products program. And so um, we're hopeful that going forward, we can help each other out and leverage each other's uh, work to our mutual benefit. And then uh, I kind of had a previous slide showing some of the, the data analysis tools that we've acquired. Uh, another data set that we're working on procuring is the uh, Nielsen scan track data, which has sales data for 34 broad categories of consumer products, including units sold, and you can break it down geographically. So we can look at just sales within California and even sub-regions within California. So this has the potential to be really helpful for us in sort of understanding maybe potential exposure or whether a particular product might be sort of disproportionately sold in um, disadvantaged or environmental justice communities, things like that. So this has a lot of promise as well. We're also looking forward to the uh, 2020 effective date of the cleaning product ingredients disclosure law. Uh, and we're hopeful that maybe there will be some useful information we can glean from that as well. So um, that's what I had to say. There's a lot of information in your packets, including um, sort of uh, the, a list of products that we uh, chose not to pursue, uh, sort of to illustrate how those both regulatory and non-regulatory considerations have come into play. There's a table summarizing the types of data that we need and how readily we've been able to obtain it. Um, there's a, a brief summary of the Lean Six Sigma project and um, what the critical access and the solutions were, things like that. So you have um, the questions in your packets. I won't uh, read them. But, um, these are paraphrases of the questions and um, I think that's, that's what I have to say. Andre, thank you. At this point, are there any clarifying questions for Andre? And just as a reminder, if your question is a question that's more suited for the panel discussion, please wait until then. Uh, why are you looking at Tim? <laughs> um, I see Mike. I've got I've got two questions, but if someone else puts up their card, I'll 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 stop at one and then ask ask again. I um, mean they're they're relatively simple, I think. On, on on a couple of the slides, you talked about collaboration with other agencies and making sure you're doing meaningful work. Yeah. Are are you are you collaborating with New York State at all? It, it seems like the, that a lot of their initiatives are are coming along and around the same. Like one four dioxane are are. are kind of in lockstep with you, and I was just curious if, if you are collaborating with that. Yes, we, we are on 1,4-Dioxane and as well um, on the um, the cleaning products. They were also having, they had a, a regulation or a quasi-regulation for cleaning products ingredient disclosure that I guess was... Um, it, it is currently not going to take Not effect. going to take effect, but we definitely are, and I, I was trying to remember to mention New York State, but yes, we are as well. Okay, I was, I was just curious. Um, and my other question then is uh, about with the stakeholder communications. I was I was curious on, on the facilitated roundtable discussions that you had. Are those available to the public? Are they like the the Bagley Keens like us? Are those publicly broadcast? Or I'm just curious if if, if being extremely public, if would make those people hold back in the discussion, you wouldn't get as much out of it. Well, we didn't have like a simulcast of all the table discussions. So essentially we had a report out at the end of the, um, of that period. So that part I believe was public, but Ann Cooper, um, kind I don't of, have a microphone. Um, but, I No. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, I was going to say that we um, actually were asked on the webcast if we would be in, um, 
you know, making those part of the webcast, and we said no. And we actually heard a lot of feedback that it allowed stakeholders to be a lot more, you know, um, open with their feedback um, than they would be if we had them recorded and you know, webcast. So we actually found a lot of success with that. A little harder to go back and mine exactly what was said, but we got a lot better feedback. And, and this is Carl. Can I just add to that is that this is one of the tensions that we have in terms of um, being very transparent and giving people opportunity is that sometimes we ask questions uh, and we don't get responses. Um, and so we put a lot of effort into having these webinars and workshops and making this opportunity. So one of the questions is, is there a different way to do it? Or um, what's the value when, when sometimes we don't get input? Even people that were sort of industry reps were, were engaged, you know, uh, a lot of times they might just be there to listen or just to make a, sort of a statement on behalf of their members or something, but we really uh, had pretty good engagement from everybody, I thought. And? <coughs> Maybe this is more It's like my dishwasher. If you push the button too long, it doesn't go on. Right. Uh, maybe, maybe. <laughs> I want to talk to the engineer who did that. Um, uh, so maybe this is more appropriate for the discussion. But could we go a little deeper into what kinds of what kind kinds of questions did you ask that you don't get responses for? Then, then what does the small group facilitation work better for? I think at our carpets and rugs workshop, we had a number of questions uh, about. Um, sort of PFAS as a class, uh, their use in carpets and rugs. And so we projected the questions on the screen and uh, we asked, would anybody like to chime in, you know, on, on these questions? And it was, it was essentially crickets. We, we didn't get uh, really any, any response in that, in that forum. And a lot of times we do find that people will, um, we might meet with somebody offline, not at a public meeting, and they might be more forthcoming, but... Um, that kind of thing. Simona could elaborate. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so I think the the small group discussion uh, worked better because um, this was a case where it was helpful for industry to also learn from one another from the challenges that they were having trying to deal with the one for D problem. So that's why um, this seemed to be like a good approach to to help people connect and try to brainstorm on how to solve this problem. And it was okay that that wasn't all broadcasted because part of the desired outcome is to give people this venue and this opportunity to have those discussions. Um, as opposed to in the um, carpets and rugs um, pre-regulatory workshop when we made the announcement that we want to list this as a priority product, we posed those questions because we needed that information to improve our listing and um, we didn't get any answers to all our questions. We just got silence, um, which was OK. I mean, we still continued forward. Like we said, we did not necessarily, um, we had enough information to move forward, but those um, data would have been helpful. Um, so we'll see what happens. We have a similar workshop um, coming up on December 9th. We'll see if we're more successful then. We cut down the number of questions that we're asking, so hopefully simplifying will help. We'll see. I'm Kelly. Yeah, I, I'm curious what kinds of reactions you've gotten from the non-industry stakeholders. And, and I'm asking this question because I've um, experienced that non-industry folks will have, bring other kinds of issues and concerns, so not the immediate scientific or product content information, but they have other kinds of information to share with the department and they tend to want to use these forums. So how did they react to this particular arrangement? Well, we had pretty good participation at one for dioxane uh, workshop from uh, NGOs. We had a woman that flew from New York to participate from the, um, what was the name of her organization? Her Citizens Campaign for the Environment. Citizens Campaign for the Environment. And uh, she was one of the speakers, and she was very engaged in the panel. And um, I think she, she, was, she was not... Um, shy about sharing her perspectives, and I think she felt heard. So I think the format worked for her. And, uh, were there other NGOs at that meeting? Uh, yeah. I'm trying to remember. Oops, head on. Um, 
There were, and I think one of the benefits that we heard from a lot of stakeholders was that at each table, we said it was like a wedding uh, dinner that we were planning because we kind of tried to mix everyone up. And so there were actually a lot of perspectives at each table. And so NGO gave their input, industry gave their input. We had um, other consultants and people like that. So I think it actually helped that each of them could kind of hear other people's perspective and provide theirs as well. So I think a lot of the NGOs even and the government folks were saying they learned a lot from the industry, and the industry said the same thing, that they learned a lot from their other colleagues who were there. A bit like a world cafe type. Yeah. I, this is Carl. I want to add that, um, particularly for 14D, it was a, a broad mix. We had invited academics and people who didn't have a vested interest per se. Uh, um, they weren't representing a product that might be regulated or an advocacy group that had an issue, but were more technical experts, and that was very valuable as well. So some of this depends on where we are in the process. Clearly, if we're in a pre-regulatory forum, there are interests that don't want us to regulate them. So we need to take respect that and be take that into consideration in the process. Um, and, and to Kelly's question, um, I think uh, advocacy groups often are good at asking questions that they don't have the answers to or the data for, but they're good questions. And so that's helpful for us as well, because ultimately we're trying to get as much good information. And part of the time, it's really important that we're asking the right question as it is to get the right data. Oh, thank you. And, uh, and Cooper, thank you also. I have Tim, then Helen. Tim? Um, thank you, Andre. That was really helpful to understand. So I had a question about, um, so the retrospective document that you gave us was really informative about the process, and those templates, when combined with it, seem to really paint a, a good picture of your process. I'm wondering, I had two questions about one. I'm wondering is, are those documents um, kind of like uh, essentially your guidance for how the prioritization process works? Or is there, are there, is there other kind of written guidance document that kind of lays out the whole process? So that's, you want me to ask the other question? Let me try that one first. Okay. Uh, so we had a, we have this document called the Instructions for Teams, um, which is currently under revision. Uh, and it's um, in addition to the guidance you see in there, which is sort of about how do you fill in this template, what types of information to include, uh, what some questions to think about as you're, you're doing your work. Um, we also, the, the instructions were more sort of like, at this point, you know, you're going to prepare a briefing document, there'll be a briefing, there'll be a decision. It was that more administrative type guidance. Um, as I mentioned, um, I have I, my strategic team, um, which is working on uh, updating that um, guidance currently. Um, I don't remember if Simone is on that team, but Christine is for sure. They both are, so um, so we'll be revising that. But yeah, there is some additional guidance, but essentially, um, that's the the guidance we're giving for the actual filling in of those templates. And I think I mentioned this one is really mm -hmm. our internal repository. The the Scoping document, um, it's not, it's like a pre-decisional thing that we would use in kind of preparing to brief and get a decision. So we, I, we thought it would be helpful for, for you all to see what kind of goes on behind the scenes as we're getting ready to sort of prepare something to announce. Can I ask my second yes, follow-up? Yes, please do, Tim. So um, that was really helpful. So um, um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, so is there... Um, is there, a, like, when you get beyond the point of, like, staff brief, so all the templates and these guidances, and then you kind of make the, there's macro decisions about we're not going to move forward with this one, but we are going to move forward with that one. Right. And that takes into account all those um, issues that you talk about. You have, you have to consider this, consider that. Yeah. Is that, you've got a lot of experience now with doing that. Is that... Uh, kind of tacit knowledge about how it's done, or is that written down somewhere? Are there guidance for making that ultimate decision, or is that more of a, like a, you know, institutional knowledge kind of thing? There, there are a couple of tiers of decision making, and so uh, I have a monthly briefing with Carl and um, and formerly with Meredith, um, where I would sort of bring the information to them, and I'll often bring people from who are working on a particular project to do that. And um, if uh, so, sometimes uh, we'll have some ongoing progress reports, and then we'll be ready for a decision. Um, uh, we might have a special briefing for that purpose. 
and then something might um, not be ready in Carl or Meredith's opinion to take up to, well, Meredith now being the director, um, or to the agency. So typically before you know we would announce something, we would go through um, uh, deputy director, director, agency, sometimes governor's office um, briefings before we would actually release something. I think that maybe it's skeletally. I'm trying to remember if it's in the instructions for teams. Um, Christine. Sure, I can address that. Um, it is actually in the instructions for teams. Um, and we also have examples of briefing rec recommendation documents. So prior to management meeting to make a decision, the team actually drafts a briefing document which summarizes our findings and our team recommendation. And even maybe options, depending on what the decision phase is. It may be the decision phase is um, we've already recommended a certain product chemical combination and we recommend doing a public workshop. We might provide management options of the format of the workshop or which products to include in the workshop or rather to do several workshops like the food packaging team did. Thank you. Sure. And sometimes risks, like if we were to do this, what might, you know, there's pending litigation, this it might become a moot point if, if this goes through, or, um, or the trend is that this is already on its way out, so maybe that would be a reason not to uh, name this product, say, for mm -hmm. example. Can Thank I you. just chime in for Tim's benefit is that the staff do a great job of looking at the criteria and the regulations. Uh, and ensuring that any recommendation that they bring to me or Meredith is, is sound and meets the criteria and the regulations. At that point, there are a variety of factors that Andre's highlighted that have to do with bandwidth, meaningfulness, timing, what else is going on within the agency. And so because we have a, a, a great amount of discretion, it, it really depends on the specific product and, and um, all the other factors. So we don't have a specific... Um, decision criteria document that guides that decision. We're taking this broad array of factors within the regulations and the actual pragmatic and meaningful ones and then making those management decisions about how we move forward. Thank you. Carl, oh, thank you. Helen? Um, as a longtime advocate for forms and templates, I heartily approve. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they counterintuitively end up speeding everything quite along. Um, you wouldn't think that, but that's true. So glad to see that. Um, so I wanted to circle back to the, um, the workshop format and um, ask, do you think that there might be a difference in sort of the acceptance when the chemical is sort of an unintentional contaminant where everybody kind of um, is not invested in having that substance be present versus a functional substance where there's um, quite a bit of investment in, in it from a functional perspective? I think yes. Um, I think thinking back to the uh, spray polyurethane foam systems workshops in 2014, uh, the people that are in that business, that, that is their business and um, it is, um, there's less sort of maybe interest in figuring out a way to eliminate that chemical uh, versus um, whether you, you're using uh, an ethoxylated surfactant and you could use some other surfactant or you could strip the 1,4-dioxane out. I mean, people are more, I think it's less uh, threatening to their sort of business and maybe they're more engaged for that reason. Although we, we try to be clear, we're not, we're not saying that our identification of priority product is, is um, a dis is a predetermination that we intend to restrict it or ban it. We're just asking the question, is it necessary? But nevertheless, um, there is a difference, yes, I would say. That just might be a, a guideline for when the, that format might be yeah. useful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I add something? So we, we try to walk this fine line of you know, giving guidance, but also having flexibility. So all our templates take that into consideration because ultimately every product chemical combination we're going to be looking at is going to be different. And um, with the workshops as well, like we, we consider different workshop formats in each scenario and try to figure out what would make most sense. Um, so it's the same with the scoping template. We're trying to build in that flexibility into everything that we do. 
I'm Kelly. I have another question um, a little different line. The, one of the things that um, the Public Health Institute report mentioned was the idea of listing more than one chemical in a product all at once or more than one product with the same chemical all at once. And I, I'm just wondering, I haven't seen you moving towards that. That's not in the work plan or anything else. And I'm just wondering if you have any remarks you can make about that. I think we've chewed on it, um, and especially in the context of, uh, I don't know if Carl was going to say. But well, what I was going to say is that uh, Chris is going to talk um, uh, shortly about our priority product selection strategies, and mm -hmm. we uh, address that kind of choice. And I'll so that's that a, question. That might be a good time to okay. address that I question, because we, we do highlight some different strategies and positives and negatives on that. Carl, oh, thank you. Um, at this point, um, we're going to close the clarifying questions. Um, Andre, thank you very much. Simona and Christine, thank you. Uh, now we're going to move into a discussion of the priority product profile uh, informed by Andre's presentation. Uh, to begin, uh, we would like to ask each panel member for their initial reactions and their preliminary thoughts on the questions identified in the background document. Um, and major themes that are brought up in this initial discussion will inform the rest of the discussion. Uh, so Tim, let's start with you. What I, I'd like to hear about your initial reactions and your preliminary, preliminary thoughts on the questions identified. Well, if I may point out, you started with me for the well, I'm sorry. introductions. <laughs> so I didn't know if you... <laughs> If you, what you wanted to do was like switch that around just so that the folks at this end don't feel that they're being slighted. Um, I think everybody wants to hear from you first, Tim. <laughs> That's always been my experience. Sure. All right. All right. So uh, initial reaction, I'm not going to walk through all six questions at once, so I'll just give you kind of my general reaction overall to it. Uh, I find myself in agreement with Helen, and I like the use of forms for a lot of different reasons, consistency across, also kind of getting people in individual situations to focus on the things that you want so it's aligned with the kind of your general program goals and whatnot. So I really think that's a terrific move. So I'm very positive about that. The thing that, um, I, to me, it seems like one of the big, from a decision-making standpoint, for the agency has always been how flexible and much discretion to have, but then how much constraint and direction should there be, given that you're a regulatory agency. And um, you made the decision early on to keep it as a uh, kind of a, uh, uh, not necessarily iterative, but kind of not constrained by formal numeric approaches, that sort of thing. And I think in retrospect that turned out to be a good idea because it allowed for a lot of learning, what I saw in this. Um, so now I think you're kind of faced with this decision about, okay, so we've had a number of years to learn, and you've started to move towards a more formalized process in the creation of these templates. But then there's this remaining question about for the big questions, which was what my clarifying question was about. And, um, you know, just based on what I've heard today and what I've read in the documents, it feels to me like you've found a good balance uh, between those two things. I would, it's kind of funny, the last document that you're revising, which I think was, uh, uh, would have been, this isn't a criticism, it's just like, I think that would complete the picture about like, how are you striking the balance in these documents on that? But the documents that I did look at, um, I thought that they really, um, uh, go a long way towards uh, building in kind of cautious and deliberative thought into what could be kind of an ad hoc process. So I thought they were really, I'd love to see eventually what the other one looks like. And I guess the one question I have for it is um, whether the directions that are in the different templates where they say, okay, think about what data sources you would use or describe how this uh, external circumstances affect it, those kinds of things. Uh, I guess the only question I would have about that is, um, to what extent is there kind of additional training or guidance about how to think about those things and what is important? Like, do you see what I'm getting? I think it's still a question of trying to walk that line between giving people room to think and be creative and at the other time kind of giving them direction and making sure there's consistency in how different people are doing it. 
Um, having said that, I think, to me, I'm very impressed with ha where you are and where the program's gone in terms of those things. So I think it's a very positive uh, in terms of transparency and, and uh, decision making and those sort of things. And uh, I mean, some people think about me as somebody who's really into having these kind of formalized numerical type things, and I'm actually not. Um, I think this process is really working well, and I would be hesitant to kind of try to formalize it too much more beyond where it is at this point, because I think there's still probably a fair amount of learning to go on. And I think you guys have uh, been very deft in terms of remaining iterative, but then at different stages, capturing what you learned and then trying to institutionalize that in a way that you know, it can be applied moving forward in a more formal way. So those are my kind of general reactions at this point. Tim, but I reserve Tim. the right to make further statements, <laughs> given that I had to go first. <laughs> right, as chairs, I think we, can, we reserve the right to stop you at any time. <laughs> um, Helen? Um, actually, I think that um, yeah, so I, I actually wanted to um, touch on the Internal versus external, I think it's like the last question about sort of how, how early do you start sharing things. And I, I think that it's, it's actually fine to have internal only deliberations. And so I, I don't know, um, it wasn't really a big topic that we had taken up before about that, but I just, uh, I think that there is some benefit to giving you that freedom that you're talking about to um, cast the net wide before you have to actually like lock everything down with a million footnotes on it. And so um, that being said, you probably will benefit from some light documentation internally of what you're not doing because you may decide to go back to something, something may pop up later in some other context. And it, I, I wouldn't say, again, not to put a heavy burden on it, but just capture it um, as someone who's, who often goes through the attic um, of, of previous projects to solve problems um, is really helpful to have some level of sort of capturing it. But um, yeah, I would, I would say that it's fair to you to give yourself a little bit of space to, to deliberate without having to get it immediately public. That is, that is my only comment. Helen, thank you. Um, Elaine, um, could we make sure that there's a mic in front of Elaine? Green. Okay. Um, all right. So thank you. That um, yeah. What an amazing packet of information. <laughs> so it was um, really instructive to go through. You know, read through the retrospective. Um, I um, and I do think the templates are wonderful, and um, that you've learned so much and are, are moving in a really good direction. It's kind of funny though. I interpreted. The um, DTSC should evaluate the scientific and procedural foundation um, of its prioritization process. I, I interpret that a little bit differently um, than just the process process, because I guess I come from somewhere with people who um, are really excited to do process to the point where they forget about the point of the process. So I do like that your process does support the, the goal of your process. Um, but in terms of what is really meant by appropriate transparency and how that's kind of built into your, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if there's still room to look at where in your templates there'd be points that you do want to um, you're not going to want to put out those those templates publicly. Obviously, they're for you, right? But you know, what's the information that you would be transferring to a public, um, publicly access, you know, accessible resource, you know, and um, how would you do that? You know, so um, I keep thinking there was another kind, and, and I'm afraid I'm afraid I might be jump. I'm, if I start jumping ahead to things we're going to talk about later that, you know, just let me know. But one of the things in terms of capturing what it is you've done and, and how you're weighting decisions and things is this idea that there's so many, there's so many factors that there isn't an objective way to just sort of communicate that. And I, I would just say that there, um, there may not be a, a way to communicate your 
um, uh, you know, in a quantitative numbers way. But I, I'm still really a big advocate of using, m moving more and more towards these kind of visual displays of the weights of the different factors, right? And just, just to put it out there so people can see, you know, we looked at all these different factors, and in one of these, you know, we saw somebody uh, present to us on a spider plot, um, one of the um, presentations a couple meetings ago. I'm a real fan of sort of that tox pie kind of a thing, and it, it's just being able to visually, some people just, I find the most difficult thing with regulatory um, decision context and the way that reports are put out and stuff is it's very hard to see, so... This is big, this is small, this is medium, and there's, we looked at these, you know, 20 different factors. And um, it would just, it would just be, um, so to me, when I think about transparency of what you're working on and what gets, tra you know, what gets displayed and presented for other people, uh, you might still want to do a little bit more on that. Um, the other thing that you asked about was um, were there aspects of the prioritization process that you know you could do more leveraging, and um, so I have some thoughts on that. And again, I don't know if that's for later too, but I, I'm interested in learning more about your. Um, you mentioned uh, voluntary kinds of programs, and and I'm interested in understanding more about what uh, opportunities you have there and how you might be able to actually. Um, so the voluntary programs might be a way to both address your workload and uh, and engage more stakeholders in a more effective way and even achieve a, a large part of your mission without it all being on you. I mean, what strikes me when I read the materials that you sent at this meeting, which is not something that I wasn't aware of before, but now it just is so concrete, is that you are carrying the weight of a, a very broad um, program in a tiny, um, no matter how much they let you expand, it's not enough, right? And so I'm just curious about what are the opportunities to really think about um, voluntary programs that would both help you um, in doing, you know, nominating, prioritizing, getting the information you need, and even... Um, on the last point about how early, you know, how is, how is what you're doing early on impacting the market? You know, do you even have the ability to use voluntary programs where there are um, people who are already innovating and want to a priori submit some kind of alternatives assessment to you for a little stamp that says, um, given what we know now, uh, this is the, you know, safer consumer product seal of approval for now, that yes, you're, you're making a, a, a safer um, alternative, you know, you're presenting a potentially safer alternative, and just stimulating, you know, so, I, so in terms of can, is there ways that you can leverage, um, I think you're doing an amazing job leveraging sort of on the regulatory side of the world, and, and potentially on the scientific side of the world, but in terms of really your, your goals for this program in terms of stimulating that innovation. Maybe there's, maybe there's other opportunities. Um, so, but thank you for just a really incredible package of information. And just everything you're doing it's scientifically and from a decision perspective and moving this field forward has just really been inspiring. Thank you, um, Anne. Um, thank you, and I'd like to echo, you know, what all three of my colleagues said, particularly Tim, because it's it's really refreshing to have Tim go first. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I've missed that structure. <laughs> um, I think it's fascinating too, particularly with a smaller group. It stands out more that um, each of us had a slightly different uh, response to the six questions that came up. Uh, so I'm going to be emphasizing a slightly different piece, which is the stakeholder engagement. But overall, I wanted to really strongly. Uh, support what my colleagues on the panel have already said, that this, this emerging structure is, is, is striking the appropriate balance for the stage of development of this program. I think that's absolutely key. And I think as this program develops, the fact that you've got those templates and you've recorded how you made those decisions is going to be, make your future decisions so much easier because you will have a, you know, more of a database of... We, we've seen this type of situation before. I mean, you don't have that right now because you don't have a big N yet, 
Um, but the fact that you, this, the, that's the real power, I think, of putting this kind of structure and slightly flexible structure uh, in a program that has so much discretionary room. Um, so I, I think in, I th one of your questions was uh, whether you should keep it non-formulaic, and I would agree. I think you've hit the right balance and the tension, and I think you're going to have this ongoing tension in this program. It's sort of in inherently built into the way, we, way the, the regulations are structured. So the way you're holding it is, is appropriate to where, where we are. So well done with that. Um, I'm really very impressed with the stakeholder engagement piece, and I think along with the templates that you're using for decision making and priority, priority, you're getting more experience about, um, you know, what kinds of stakeholder scenarios are likely to come up. When are people going to respond? I think Helen's point was was really insightful about what's the chemical, how critical is it to the process and to the to the product that you're addressing. But as with these other templates and decision making, you're getting more and more ideas, and you're going to have fewer surprises going forward. So I'm, I'm really impressed that you've tried these different kinds of stakeholder engagement to get um, answers when you get crickets in a room. Um, frankly, every time I bring up the word PFAS, I get crickets in the room. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I think where you are is it's really amazing uh, what you've done and, and the structure that you've put in and is totally appropriate for where we are in the program. Um, I'd like to flag for, for Kelly and Art, I think there's uh, deeper discussions that I want to have with questions five and six. Um, so I'm not going to touch on those right now, but um, I'd, I'd be particularly want to answer uh, from staff. Um, I'd like a better sense of what you mean by when you say, should, for question number six, you've got, should SCP publicize our projects earlier in the scoping phase, even though we may or may not have sufficient information to understand whether the product's going to be a good candidate? I want to unpack that a bit more before we have a, a deeper discussion. So those are my initial thoughts. Thank you. And thank you. Mike? Yeah, and, and again, I want to echo what, what everyone has, has been saying, uh, including who got to go first. I, I think that was brilliant <laughs> art. You know, well done. Um, but um, a couple things. So on the forums, I, I think you know, that's something we've discussed a, a long time. And I, I really, looking at the template that you guys have, have created, um, give you a lot of credit for that. Because what you did, what, what, in my opinion, at this point in time, you're not ready to have a checklist type form. Um, it's going to be too restrictive. And you really created something that is providing guidance to staff and say, here are the things you need to think about and inform out. Um, and you gave them a lot of latitude as they're doing it, but still created the, the, the context for all the pieces to be there. So I, I thought that was extremely well done, and it, and it should contribute both to transparency and speed. Um, but with, with the transparency versus speed, I, I think there is a lot of balancing to be done, um, and I think that, that's a struggle that you've had. Um, and part of me would like to, to suggest that maybe there's a reframe needed on, on the whole speed part. Um, you know, we're looking, you're looking at, okay, it takes, it takes us on average 3.5 years to get from starting to look at a priority product to actually having a priority product. Um, you know, first, you know, with data that you have coming up now as, as this next round is going on, is it still at that 3.5? Is it already reduced as you've learned what you're doing? But second, that three, I, I, I challenge that that 3.5 years to get to a priority product isn't necessarily the, the end point that should be measured. I'd rather look at it from start of the process to when do we have AAs that we've evaluated and safer products out there? Because I think that number, as the program goes on, is going to decrease because the work that you're putting in up front, being transparent and creating the documents we're looking at now, um, you're almost creating a foundation for people to create their AAs. You're saying, we've looked at this information already. You don't need to relook at that. Don't convince us that. Here's, here's all the knowns. If you've given that, then the AAs that come in should hopefully be easier to evaluate, and maybe you cut time off of the end part of the cycle um, by doing the pre-work yourselves, um, and you're getting more consistent documents in. And I don't know... That, that that's true or not, but I, I, I think that's, it's a useful way to evaluate, um, and, it, and it improves then both transparency and long-term the speed of the process. Um, and I think, you know, to me that, you know, PHI, when they did their study, they're looking at what's already happened, but if I look at what you're doing now and at the rate of priority products that you're looking to propose at this point, you know, wow, that, that's an, an amazing uh, order of magnitude leap over what you were capable of doing before because you've built the program up. So, so I don't want to look and say, oh, we, just, we can only look at those three that we're starting with. 
Um, we need to look at it, the whole picture. But that would be my, my overall comment. Right, thank you. Becky? Hey, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, yeah, just going to, again, echo my colleagues here. Uh, I thought the retrospective document was a great response to the Public in Health Institute report and very informative. I, I love the templates. I especially wish that I had been using a decision log on a recent project that I was working on. <laughs> I think it would have gone uh, a little bit more efficiently if we had a nice decision log to keep referring to and reminding ourselves of our rationales for our decisions. I also like the non-formulaic approach. I really want to register strong support of that approach. I think it allows you to be nimble and opportunistic and follow the science and information because this is not a straightforward regulatory process or it, it's, it's a very different and unique program so you need that ability to be flexible. Uh, and the last comment I had is just about the publicizing projects earlier which I guess we're going to get into a little more deeply uh, but I, I wanted to uh, register agreement with Helen. I thought that was great how you mentioned this other idea of daylighting products you've decided not to pursue for the moment because that also provides some great information to industry, you know, perhaps not to introduce a product that to the California market that might merit, you know, uh, an addressment address with this program, other, other um, signals like that. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kelly? Okay. I'm going to take advantage of being almost last and next to Art and I uh, do sympathize with Tim's complaint about going first, so I'm expecting he'll come back in. Um, but I just I have four kind of more general points. Um, I, I'll agree with the other panelists that I really think that the management systems are awesome. I actually see these as role models for other government agencies doing some of these things. I, I'm super excited that you shared them. I am actually wanting to share them with a bunch of other people. <laughs> and, you know, having worked in government and with government for 25 years, I, I do see these as pretty strong examples of how government can bring the kinds of systems that are often used. I, I work in consulting, so it's always scope, budget, schedule, you know, laying everything out. Uh, but doing that in the government context where things are not quite so defined because there's new decision-making elements that come in. So that's, I, I really was excited about that. Uh, I, just a couple thoughts on those systems. One is, I, I see as an example, the role of scientific papers being important. So for example, if you're considering doing multiple products with the same group of pollutants, so the PFAS, you know, having a scientific paper that's a review of a bunch of the basic information would then simplify further profiles because you can cite that paper instead of redoing all of those things. And then you might you might need to update a couple of things, but it just simplifies it because you've already created the documentation. It's already been peer reviewed because it's in a published journal that makes it faster to go ahead. Um, and I want to strongly agree that the formulaic approach would not be appropriate. And so that's something that I, I think you've heard from the science panel since the panel's inception when we were talking about the development of the regulations. There was a very strong pushback from this panel about the formulaic approach. There were a number of folks who were really concerned about having a lack of predictability. And I, I think personally I'm probably to blame for the idea of the work plan as a potential solution for that. Um, and it, this, this whole discussion and getting me to look back at, at that idea and how you've implemented it, um, I, there's some strengths, but there are also some weaknesses. I think we didn't get the work plan concept quite right. Um, so that's something I really want to um, consider, ask the department to consider thinking about. I'll mention a couple of big picture issues now, and I know we'll be talking about the work plan uh, this afternoon. Um, one of them is that I think that the definition of what we want to get at is not very specific. So because the work plan, we were trying to signal what product chemi chemical ca um, combinations might be regulated, that was the goal of dealing with this responding to the formulaic request um, from other outside entities. Um, I don't think it, it became sort of generic and didn't really link so much to what kind of environmental problems or health problems they were trying to tackle. So as an example, uh, the department's pursuing a line of things around um, nail salons. 
So, and, and it seems that one of the policy priorities in place for the department is not just to protect general worker safety, but specifically there's a lot of examples of health issues around nail salon workers and solvable problems around the products that they're exposed to. So being more specific might actually be more insightful and facilitate some of this discussion of grouping that we might have this afternoon. Another example of that is um, drinking water supplies. So one of the motivations for 1,4-Dioxane as a priority product is that we're looking at the fact that in California in the next couple decades, we're going to be drinking pretty directly wastewater effluent and urban runoff. And we need to think about what those chemicals are and solve that problem so that by the time we really need to use those as major water supplies in California, they are safe. So that's a more specific problem than just a product chemical combination. So that's not what the regulations say about work plans, but something I want to challenge the thoughts on. And, and then finally, another thing that's not in the work plans that I think is important for the department to consider is a little longer lens on what chemicals it might be interested in. So the PFAS stuff didn't come out of nowhere. You all have known for a while that you're interested in PFAS. It's, come, it's become very front and center politically for a variety of reasons, but it's something you all have been aware of for many years. And you've hired and developed expertise in this area. There are other chemicals and chemical groups where I think that you're seeing these are going to rise to the surface um, for various reasons, like this drinking water supply issue that I mentioned. Um, I think if the department was able to sync signal with a longer lens um, towards the future than the short work plan cycle um, on other chemicals, it would leverage data creation to help inform decision making about those product about that products with that chemical. So I'm particularly thinking of the example of um, what, what we call emerging contaminants monitoring, being everything that's not regulated under the Clean Water Act. Um, there's there's a real gap in looking through the windshield. Everybody's looking through the rear mirror at the same group of chemicals and calling them emerging contaminants. And I think the department is well positioned to help outside entities think more about the windshield and change that distribution of monitoring where 80 or 90 percent of the monitoring is on the same small few dozen chemicals. And we need to really change our monitoring programs to be looking at a much more diverse set of chemicals, which is hard. There's a lot of reasons for that. But also to help direct towards new groups of chemicals as being really important for the future. Having those data sets are most important among all the chemicals that are out there that are in commerce. So like the management systems, constraints of the work plan, think a little bit more about more specific problems. Um, and thinking about making a longer lens signal about chemicals the department's interested in considering tackling. So the stuff over the next five to ten years and not just the next three. Um, Kelly, thank you very much. I um, just want to cut touch on a couple of points. Uh, one, it's related to uh, the PHI recommendations. I think, in fact, you have uh, managed uh, to, you know, come up and... Um, uh, with a prioritization strategy that's you know both uh, clearly articulated and appropriately transparent, so good job there. Um, one thing about the templates and the process is one of my main concerns when uh, we were when you were doing this was that I've seen you know in my uh, work uh, situation a lot of times when you have these um, templates and processes SOPs in place, it it can stifle creativity. Um, but I didn't. I actually did not see that here. So when uh, we have, you know, uh, met previously, or when we were preparing for this meeting, um, just excellent job finding the right balance, which my colleagues have indicated. A um, couple of other things, uh, probably not directly related to the priority product profile, but uh, something that Andre uh, shown in his presentation was, you know. Uh, being able to recruit uh, talent and subject matter experts in data science, uh, exposure science, and economics. Um, just was really glad to see that. The question that I have is not just bringing talent in, but talent retention. Given the fact how competitive, you know, uh, for talent it is in um, California and, you know, in Northern California, especially with um, uh, the high-tech industry, I was wondering if that's something that you guys are also thinking about. And 
Uh, the, uh, the last thing, again, it's just don't want to go over what my colleagues have said, was related to um, uh, Elaine's uh, point about uh, visual display and, you know, uh, data visualization. So really glad to see that, again, you guys are, you know, um, getting training and getting the kind of software tools that allows for the kind of data visualization that will help you key in on key factors that will make the program better. So things such as Tableau, so excellent. Um, at this point, I'm going to go back to Tim to see if he has anything else he wants to add. Well, in fact, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Anything you want to add before we go into the general discussion? Oh, I see. So this is like a, a special um, opportunity to speak. <laughs> That's very gracious of you. Um, well, I did. I just want to reflect on some of the things that other folks said, which was really, I thought, um, thought-provoking and insightful. Um, I wanted, like, Elaine, your point... Um, I think is a really good one, the notion of, yeah, don't use formulas or numbers, but let's think about ways to, um, I think the way you framed it was showing what was important in the decision and whatnot. Um, I'd, I'd actually go a little bit further than that, which would be, I mean, in order to show those kinds of things, you would have had to think about them in that way, which really gets to how did you structure your decision making. And I would, uh, so back to your point, Carl, when I asked that question about the decisions and all, and you said, well, you know, when we get to the management team, there's lots of stuff we're balancing and we're thinking science, we're thinking policy, resources, all those things. Um, so one thing I would say is um, I would encourage you guys when you're doing those things to think explicitly about the structure of your decision making uh, because, uh, you know, it's often the case that when we make decisions like that, we're not actually aware of like how other factors are affecting our decision or how much weight we're putting on something and those sorts of things. So having kind of a structured, and maybe you do, but I'm just saying we don't know because we haven't talked about this, but having a structured decision-making process that maybe could then result in being able to identify the kinds of things that Elaine is talking about uh, would be helpful. Um, Having said that, though, I think it's important to kind of distinguish kinds of decisions you're making, if, if I'm getting this right, which is there's this regulatory decision of listing something, and we call it prioritization. Um, and it is prioritization, meaning now you're going to do something to this, but it's not prioritization, the regulatory part of it doesn't appear to be prioritization in terms of like ranking things, like this is more important than that. You're not... You are making that decision about let's not, we're not going to pay attention to this one, or we're going to move this one to the top of the heap. So you are making kind of a, either a binary or a ranking kind of decision, and that was great that you showed the things that you decided not to find. So there's that kind of decision, and I think that should also be structured, but I'm not sure that's one where uh, you necessarily need to, uh, it would be useful for the public to know about those things, but um, I think it's important to um, kind of differentiate uh, how you discuss and what you say about the regulatory decision about listing something versus those macro kind of program decisions about prioritization. And I think they should be, they're basically subject to two different kinds of decision making, right? Because under the regs, it's not necessarily the case that you would necessarily take into account strategic issues or other kinds of issues. It's not, you don't have to, and it's not necessarily relevant. So I guess I'm just, I don't really have a specific point other than to say um, I'd encourage you to have kind of structured processes for even these management level decisions and decisions along the way, even if they're not written out in numbers or whatever, uh, as a kind of a check to make sure that your decision making is kind of robust and is, you know, taken into account and you're kind of being self-reflective about the weights you're putting on things, uh, that sort of stuff. Okay. So I had something else, too. I don't, I don't want to, like, overstay my welcome in the sense, but I did have something else I wanted to ask about. Why don't I? I'll, why, I'll, I'll, I'll do that later. Yes, why All right, we okay. open up uh, to the general panel discussion? I'm sorry, Carl? Yeah, thanks, um, Art. I just wanted to, to give some feedback to Tim because I think it's important, as, as you highlight, there are different decision points. Um, by the time we get to uh, the rulemaking point, 
you know, that is really, we, a lot of decisions have already been made. And so, back to Kelly's point on the work plan, is that there are decisions made very early on that, that sort of, in some sense, prioritize our efforts, whether that's looking at a class of chemicals or a specific sector. And so, I appreciate your input on the importance of communicating that, because we work very hard to try to, at every stage, to say, for example, that when we're in the work, talking about the work plan, or even pre-rulemaking, that we haven't decided what the ultimate outcome is going to be. That's rely on the AA process in large part. But it is important that <clears throat> the decisions we make with our limited resources and our discretion are significant very early on. And so how we communicate that is, I appreciate your insightfulness and Elaine's point too about, you know, we can't b do everything. So what is it that we are choosing to do that's most important and why? So any insights you have on how we might do that in these processes would be really appreciated because um, there's a lot of factors. So thank you. Um, let's open up to general discussion. Uh, keeping in mind the six questions uh, that the staff put together for the camera. Uh, first I wanted to uh, talk about this thing about the uh, the workshops, which sound like they're terrific vehicles from the description that you've given. And um, I, I agree with, I think Mike made the point about, um, wouldn't, if I'm paraphrasing a bit, wouldn't worry so much about trying to speed the process up. It, it seems like it's very effective. And somebody else made the point, I can't remember, maybe it was you, Helen, about, maybe it was Ann, I can't remember who, Everybody's making such great points, but there was this point that, hey, you're putting more time in at the front end and it's going to speed up things. Was that you? Yeah. So it'll speed things up at the back end. And I agree with that. I think um, I wouldn't worry so much about the time being spent on those. I think it's very valuable. Um, and I think you're, there's lots of good reasons for being cautious at the front and learning as much as you can. Uh, so I'd encourage that. But I wanted to ask this question about, um, like, there's discussion about should things be webcast, should things be open, and, you know, we get more information from people, you know, when they're not kind of exposed to the public in very public ways. And I guess it's a fine line. But uh, my understanding is, like, all along the way in these workshops, if you hear some, somebody tells you something, none of that is in confidence, am I? I mean, are you thinking? In a sense, if it's underlying your regulatory judgment, when people talk to you, do they understand that you know essentially that's part of an administrative record? It could ultimately be part of an administrative record that, say, for example, prioritization rulemaking got challenged, and you generate an administrative record for that. You would have to put in the administrative record everything you relied upon, and that would include, I'm um, thinking, public communications from the public to you. So is that the case? Do you keep records of, like if somebody calls you on the phone and says, hey, I saw you doing, I just want to tell you, and then they tell you something very important, and they say, keep that quiet. Something you can't great. really do that, keep that quiet, if it well, then is part of your decision making. Am well, I right? I think Andre and I can tag team the okay. response. Is, is my counsel in the room? <laughs> so, uh, um, it's a good point, and I think there's there's a key um, element is where we are in the process and what that dialogue is about. So, when we're in the rulemaking process, um, we produce an administrative record that supports that specific rulemaking. Everything in that is very public. There are formal comments. We respond to those. Um, but there are a lot of things we do that are not regulatory in nature. They're just discussion. When we have a public forum... Um, all those comments are public record. When we have a meeting with someone, that's a public record. People can give us information they want to protect um, due to trade secret, but generally speaking, we're very transparent. Um, so we do have discussions with folks sometimes who are sensitive to, they don't want to necessarily tell us something because they have a vested business interest or they don't want to impugn some other someone else. Uh, and they typically do that in a cautious way and, and, and don't give us information that they don't want to be public. And we're usually very transparent about that. But I'm not sure, if Andre, if you want to add something to that. But there's different points in the process. We don't need to, when we go to OAL and we put in that record, 
document every conversation we had with every st stakeholder. We need to put out the documents that we're relying on, the, the information we received formally on those comments, and our responses. So it's a very prescriptive process you're, that you're familiar with. But outside of that, um, yeah, pretty much it's all public. On occasion, we've cited personal communication when we've had a conversation with somebody that informs our decision making. But a lot of a lot of it is, you know, little decisions that don't lead to something or weren't key, you know, decisions into whether to proceed or not proceed on something. So, but I, I, what Carl said was what, basically what I was going to say. But in practice, you do you would like if you were at a workshop. So I, I'm just interested in this, and I think it's also important this question about do you webcast or not? Because it seems to me, webcast don't webcast. That seems like a purely discretionary decision, and mm -hmm. it's it seems like it's the the part like anybody in the world could be watching what you're saying that could make people feel more constrained. Whereas if then they're in a small room, they're comfortable, they talk, right? So it's right. not right. It's not like they think at these workshops that nobody hears what, like, the cone of silence is down and nobody can hear what they say. They realize people hear it, right? We often have a transcript that we publish of what yeah, happens. Right. So. so what I'm curious about, though, is when you have kind of uh, non-planned interactions with people, would those interactions, is it the practice to uh, memorialize those in a, in a document somewhere so that they are available. We, we keep meeting notes internally for... Right. We people. do, as that part of the CPEP process, when we formally meet with someone, an interested stakeholder from wherever, we document that information. That information is part of the deliberative process that we use in making decisions. So if that was relevant to formal rulemaking, that specific interaction, then it would be in the record. But typically it's not. It's not typically either. this is a deliberative process where we're collecting a bunch of information from everyone. And then we're at the point where we're going to make a regulatory decision or a formal decision. It's a very public process. We put out the profile and we say, this is the document we relied on, and then we cite appropriately in that. A lot of the conversations we have lead us to information that we would ultimately rely on. And in the regs, we have a definition of reliable information and things like that. So, Christine, you want to add? Um, yeah, and to follow up on Tim's question about the non-planned interactions, because they do happen. We'll have a workshop. Somebody will approach us. They'll ask us a question. We don't necessarily document that, but we'll have a follow-up meeting. And then the follow-up meeting, we do document. Thank you. So, I have Anne and Elaine, but before I'm going uh, to Anne, let me just ask a follow-up question to Carl and to Andre. So, in terms of the speeding up the, you know, uh, the process for listing of priority products, you know, going from 3.5 to projected 1.5 years. Is that a self-imposed kind of a pressure, or, or is that pressure coming externally? There was a general uh, desire that we move more quickly, and uh, Simona did a very rigorous analysis of decision points. The data that we had, as I mentioned, the data was not perfect. Um, and original goal was a year, but we just decided that all the things we had to squeeze in, maybe a year wasn't uh, realistic. So. And that was the Lean Six Sigma project. So we were trying to improve and streamline our process. So I participated in this Lean Six Sigma training. And basically what the trainer says is that if you don't make like a really significant improvement, it's not a Lean Six Sigma project. So we had to have really, really aggressive goals. We couldn't say that our goal is to go from 3.5 to 3 or 2 years. That was not aggressive enough. So it's, it's something to aspire to. So, so, but I guess it was, the number was something we decided, yeah, for sure. I think, too, are, importantly, um, there are internal and external drivers, um, and I want to give the staff a lot of credit. The staff work really hard uh, when they do these analysis, and if they have an analysis and a recommendation, they want us to make decisions to move on because we're also telling them they've got three other projects to work on. So there's internally... Um, uh, I can speak for Andre, Nancy, Tony, and myself, and for Meredith, that we feel a, a strong commitment to our staff to recognize their work and make decisions. So that's part of it. Um, uh, and But it's back to a point I think Helen made when she testified in front of the legislature about the challenges of balancing resources, uh, quality, and speed, is that all of those are important. And so this, what you've seen is sort of the growth of our program where we've really invested in improving quality, but also we want to do it more efficiently. 
because of our limited resources, we, we want to be meaningful, get stuff done, and move on and get more stuff done. It's the nature of our great staff is that they want to be productive and they want their work to be um, meaningful and have an effect. So, uh, and, and just while I have my soapbox for a second to respond to your other question, it's related, I think, to staff art about the sustainability of uh, and development of our staff is that um, we are very fortunate to have a great mission uh, in our program and we're also um, new and interesting and a lot of scientific and programmatic um, interest in what we're doing. And because of that, uh, we've been able to attract outstanding staff who are mission-driven uh, and believe in that um, and have really high standards. And so it's almost, a, from my perspective, it's, it, it's, a, it's a dangerous place to be because um, the sustainability um, challenge is still there. We still have challenges and we're competing in the marketplace for good scientists and engineers and as well as our support staff and toxicologists and legal staff. Um, that's an ongoing challenge. We have pay parity issues in the scientific classification. We have um, challenges where the, the new staff we're hiring now don't have the same level of benefits that we had back way back when, when some of us were hired. So, but we are trying to uh, develop them, get them training, give them uh, empower them to be project leaders and make the recommendations and take these things over the line. But um, we're very aware that um, we're small and we have those challenges, but um, I just wanted to take this moment to acknowledge our amazing staff and that we're very grateful for all of them and the work that they do. Um, and we every day talk about how we're going to try to support them and, 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 and make our program sustainable. That's excellent to hear. So I have Ann next. Thanks. So I, I think I have a small cluster of questions that's sort of leading me back to question six, which I flagged earlier. <laughs> um, so I may have missed this, Andre, in your presentation. You mentioned, you know, the, the list of, of uh, products that were eliminated for factors, one of the more factors that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it would be helpful to document what those factors are. Perhaps you already have and, you know, what the other things that you take into consideration. And so I'm leading us into the question of scoping, because when you scope a new, uh, an, a new set of products and chemicals, do you, did you mention that you go back to this and, and revisit some of the ones that you've done some work on? We do. We have a, we have a, a kind of a, a, a list of project of, um, sometimes it's um, product chemical combinations, sometimes it's um, maybe a group of products or a chemical, that, and so we've kind of tabulated those and tiered them as mm -hmm. far as uh, when we have the opportunity to initiate a new project. Uh, it, uh, we've also got some new things that have been kind of suggested to us. We also have a process by which um, members of the program can nominate, they can sort of come up with a, with a concept that they think would be an interesting scoping topic. And so... Um, they're in the mix of, of topics, but we don't separately prioritize them, and they may end up moving up or down right. depending on other things that may be um, put into the uh, into the, the matrix. But as you go through this, the scoping process, one of the things you look at is just systematically you go back to the things you've already looked at to, yes. to see if some of the factors have changed. I'm thinking, for example, of the the hair straighteners with formaldehyde, that that situation is now settled. Right. Mm -hmm. So that one might be more, more timely now, potentially. Potentially. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that clarification. And then I think what I was looking for was more um, clarification on what you mean by earlier in the scoping phase in order to have this discussion. So can you, can you unpack a little bit perhaps what your question is in, in question six for, for the panel? Well, um, I guess we, we, we have a public engagement around the work plan, so we will... Um, We'll put a draft out and put some uh, policy priorities, some product categories, and um, ask, ask people to weigh in. And then we kind of go back and deliberate and churn and end up with a um, somewhat vague topic like 1,4-dioxane and cleaning and personal care products, and we'll put that out. So uh, there's a lot of sort of the internal deliberations prior to getting to that point where we could maybe have some kind of a public engagement point earlier on. Here's some things we're looking at, thinking about, not really sure yet, what do you think, kind of a, kind of an, of, of a forum maybe. So we, we do 
engage earlier than we did with the first round. Um, we don't we don't go public with a profile or specific product chemical combination without having had some public engagement prior to deciding. Um, so I guess the question is, should we you know do more of that earlier on, less fully baked um, uh, findings uh, to help us? in our discernment and our decision making. Okay, so I, I, that's what I thought you meant, and I think my response to that would be that it's a different kind of stakeholder engagement, and so as, as mm. Tim was talking about um, different kinds of decision making, that it's a different kind of engagement, and you sort of have to bound it a little bit differently. It, it's really much more like an information call-in at that stage. Mm -hmm. So that's, that, that's an interesting way to think about it. Yeah, yeah. so that, that was my response to that question, if that's what I understood. Thank you. And we've been doing that. And we have been doing that. I mean, throughout yes. the scoping process, yeah. we do reach out to people for information. But yeah, I think yeah. I'm not clear on how much earlier you could go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, I have Elaine next. So on the on the on the engagement, uh, stakeholder engagement. Um, just throw out that. Um, Health, Health Canada for their chemical management program. You know, do you know how their panel committees work? So they have a science committee, right. and they bring particular things to them. But they also have a separate uh, stakeholders committee. Um, mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about that, and I don't know, you know, you would have probably have to talk to them to see what they think about this. And I'm not sure if it's, you know, how how that was established or or what their goals for it were. But they bring to them very different kinds of questions. Um, and the makeup is, you know, so, and, and I know it because sometimes those uh, participants from that committee will sit in and listen, you know, as part of the public to the first part of the science uh, committee. Um, but anyway, there's, I guess, I guess then what I, my, my point is that if you wanted some other kind, I mean, just what you need is another panel to convene, right? But um, <laughs> if you wanted, uh, it, depending on what kind of, whether if you wanted some kind of input that was um, where you would have a standing committee that you could bring things to without having to um, hold large, you know, the workshops are, are designed to really get at specific questions. And if you had more general um, engagement issues, that you wanted to address, it's it's one way of doing things, or it's one I'm familiar with. Um, and then just back on on this question number six, because it is such a compelling one. Um, um, I I just think there's so much in there about what again what what um, your the intended kinds of um, impacts of their program that you know that you that you want. And and you've got your process, and you're and you're you're having an impact just by really trying to focus on particular product chemical combinations that making decisions on those will make a difference. But as you've pointed out over and over, um, since I joined the panel, there are all these un not unintended but uh, broader uh, impacts of your program, right? So um, I just feel like that maybe the question shouldn't just be should you publicize earlier? Um, because I agree, given the context, you know, given the specific things that you're looking at, I don't know how much earlier you could go, but the question is, could you earlier take advantage, you know, data call-ins, take advantage of things that other industries, industries where there are, is little information, but there are significant drivers. So I keep thinking about these building products or clothing or these other products where there are industries that are putting out lists of restricted chemicals for their uh, communities. And so you know already that their, their members are doing something. <laughs> so I just feel like that that question, um, to me, they're just somehow there, there might be low burden ways for you to take advantage of all these other things going on um, that would allow this so-called, you know, sort of earlier transparency and engagement, but where it's, mo it's more about you taking advantage of things that are already going on and rather than 
being worried that you're influencing the, the markets, how are things that are already going on in the markets, uh, how can that contribute to your program? Um, Elaine, let me just ask a quick follow-up question. So in terms of Health Canada and their stakeholders' engagement, what's the objective or purpose of, of that? So I, I, I don't know exactly because I, I, you know, I'm not involved directly with it, but it does include, so their chemical management program is the program that does their, um, did their prioritization of long lists of chemicals and then they've gone in and done actual risk assessment. So it's chemical risk assessment. And so they have industries and they have um, NGOs and communities and things that are very interested in uh, what what chemicals they're doing assessments on, what those assessments, you know, how information is being collected for those assessments. So I, I guess I probably should know more about it before I threw it out here as something to think about. <laughs> but um, it's it's made up of a it's made up of the advocacy. Uh, so it's, I don't know what the scientific background is of the individual participants. It tends to be pretty, it, it, you know, non, you know, they, they have good scientific background, but their roles are more on the advocacy side and, and not as much on the sort of expertise, deep expertise. Okay, yeah, actually, what, what I was thinking about is that given the level of, um, when we do have public comments yeah. during the, uh, our uh, working sessions, at least the experience that I've had is that there's been very limited participation, and I was just wondering having if that would carry over if we were to have, you know, some type of more uh, public uh, engage. Uh, I'm sorry, stakeholder engagement. So, but thank you. Um, so I have Mike next. Okay, and I guess I'm kind of jumping around here. Um, so the the first question on, on speeding up the the prioritization process, I guess I'm, I'm asking a question back, um, but is the point of speeding up the process to have more priority products in the end, or is it to eventually free up the staff from working on creating the documents to determine if there's a priority product involved to get to the decision um, so that they can work on the later parts? Because I, I think we're seeing now a greater number of priority products being introduced that's going to take up more staff time to do evaluate alternative analysis and then, and then regulatory decisions. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just curious is, is if you start having more priority products, then you have less staff to determine the next level of priority products, and, and it's a catch-22. So, so what's the intent of speeding it up? Um, is it, is it, because if, if it's to free staff up and keep the... Not the original pace, which I know people were like, you know, you started the program here, that was part of the background, and you only had the first three, which was a learning phase. But now if I look at the number, you're kind of meeting what, what you originally said. So it, what is the intent of speeding up the prioritization process? Because what I don't want necessarily to have happen is you've got staff working on these faster, they're getting them done, and then they go to Carl for a decision, and Carl says, oh, wow, that's really great work. Too bad we don't have people to work on it. My decision is you can't do it, and it, be, it gets part of that tier, and you're just creating a larger and larger backlog. Um, so that it's just something to think about, and, and I'm wondering what, what your, your view on that is. Um, thanks, Mike. I think... Um, Sort of all of the above. I mean, we, as Meredith pointed out, we really want to be have a program that's meaningful, that, that gets to places where we're encouraging the development of safer products and that, that protect people in the environment. And it's that balancing of do we do that in one sector or, or do we do that across a broad array of sectors or do we go deep on you know one chemical class? You know, and We're going to talk a little bit about that when we have presentations about how we um, develop profiles and select priority products. But... Um, we're, that scenario that you highlighted is happening now. I mean, staff are, are chomping at the bit and moving forward, and um, we have limited resources. So um, it's a question that we struggle with, um, and uh, we would like to grow. As, uh, but I, I would point out that um, there's a broader question. You know, unlike my colleagues in the cleanup program and permitting where they have a fixed universe of sites they have to address, there's a legitimate question is what should our program look like to be effective? 
And so what we've invested in is making sure that our processes are sound, that we're being as efficient as possible. The ultimate question of how big we can be and how is, is going to be beyond what we can control. But um, we're trying to balance that out so that we're effective and there's ways that even with the resources that we have, we might make decisions that that, that help with that. But they're trade-offs. So I don't know if Andre wants to add to that. I just thought I would chime in, chime in that yeah, we want to optimize our use of, of what resources we have. So we need to look at kind of both. And we want to um, we are uh, the management team within the our program. We've started having uh, sort of project portfolio meetings, kind of looking across product uh, scoping and research, rulemaking, alternatives analyses, and looking, uh, uh, there's a chart in the, um, in the folder showing kind of uh, a timeline for the various things that we have going on. So we do have meetings where we sort of talk about um, balancing resources and what's coming down the, the pike. What kind of, it's kind of an unknown when we, when we adopt the regulation, what the alternatives analysis will look like? Will it be a consortium? Will it be two? Will it be more than two? Could, it, could, it, it makes it hard to, to sort of plan as far as um, it's possible that the, that the initial project could mushroom into many projects. And so um, there is a point at which it may not make sense to try to go faster until we've addressed the downstream uh, resource constraints that we have. Simona, did you want to follow up on that? Yeah, can I? Um, so from the Lean Sistema project perspective as well, and as a staff person, I think um, one of the main benefits that we can get from this is freeing up staff time. Um, because if, if we streamline our process such that it doesn't take us three years, but it takes us one year, then, um, you know, let's say we start research three years ago. By the time we are ready to publish something, our research is going to be out of date. And then we have to go back and do more literature research, more QAQC to finally finish that and publish it. So we're trying to eliminate those steps so that we have more time because we are, like you said, we're very few <laughs> and we can only do so much. So if we can eliminate any unnecessary steps, consolidate um, our work and get things out faster, then we can have time for the rest. Thank you. I have Kelly and Becky. Kelly? And I'm taking a look at the clock here, so I'll try to make this fairly quick. I want to follow up on question six, but first I do want to just make sure that, um, that the panel's firmly on record um, that staff retention is a really important issue. And I, I know that the staff here in the department um, can't really go into any details on the pay parity issue, but I observe from my personal experience and conversations with scientists throughout the agency that they call it pay parity, but basically the parity um, that jobs outside of, of state government uh, for scientists pay as much as double as to what our scientists were paying our scientists here. I'm frankly embarrassed about that. And it makes me all the more grateful to the folks who have chosen to dedicate their lives to the service of our state at the salaries that the state is able to pay. And I just really think it's important for the success of this program to address that because it's an important piece of retention. It's certainly not all of it, uh, but I just want to be on record as saying that because I can say that as a panelist. <laughs> um, but going back to question six, um, I am not convinced that the current timing um, avoids the concerns about um, an uninformed substitution and market repercussions because there's enough time between the release of the profile and the adoption of a regulation for changes to be made. And so I just want to throw that out there. Um, I think there's a number of ways of getting at it short of it, it this is a balance, and I think it's something that the panel will probably want to weigh in on. I see Mike already raising his card. Um, but there are ways to more generally signal some things, and I think that this is an issue with the work plan that we'll probably want to talk a little bit more about this afternoon. And what would the ideal work plan look like now is a question I want to ask you all this afternoon when we're having that discussion. Um, if we weren't constrained by the regulations or could things be added in addition to what's the minimum required by regulation in that area. Uh, but I think that, that a 
we could leverage um, data creation, as I mentioned earlier, but also leadership through voluntary programs and other means. So if, if it's not obvious what's out there um, by indicating where the department might be heading in a little different way than it has, um, voluntary programs may help create the basis for um, more facile substitution. Um, I, I think that the department right now, because of the way the work plan process is going, um, isn't asking questions about which products are the main sources of a particular endpoint problem we're interested in, whether it's PFAS in drinking water or um, harm to um, folks who get breast cancer or nail salon workers. And so the department is doing all that work itself. And um, again, I'm kind of wondering if there's some sort of increased transparency or earlier signal that might allow information to be created that would make the department's decisions more straightforward and help the department solve problems. Uh, I, I think personally in the forums that I work in all around the state, I'm seeing a lot of need for the department to step forward and say things like, we're going to help solve the PFAS problem. And the department doesn't do that right now. So that's a challenge or a thought I'd like to give the department. Um, and then specifically to the public engagement, one of the, I, I really want to build on what Elaine talked about, about the stakeholder committee. I'm not sure that's the right solution, but it, the missing thing for a department, like this is a department that's headed by an executive, and that creates two problems. One is that, um, that boards force decisions. So I, I'm actually thrilled to see the department do, creating processes and making a lot more decisions. That it's change in culture of the department here as well as the, the pressures and excitement of the staff and all the other things that are out here. But making decisions is absolutely crucial. But it also doesn't have any kind of regular forum for any kind of discussion more broadly of, of product issues and priorities and where the department's going and getting folks to bring information but also getting folks to say, here are some really important public policy priorities for the next two, three, five, ten years. There's no place for that. And boards provide a place to that if for no other re way through the public comment process that there's a, always an open time in the meeting. A stakeholder group could provide that, but there's no regular or known process. The only times there are meetings is when the department schedules them and that's irregular. And the only time any bigger questions are talked about are once every three years at that cycle, and then you're asking specific questions about product chemical combinations and not some of the broader things about where are we going, what is the need for consumer product regulation to fit into the overall environmental and health protection programs in our state. Done. Kelly, thank you. Becky? I just had a quick follow-up comment about the stakeholder engagement and kind of more discreetly thinking about getting those voices in the room and sometimes members of impacted communities or workers have a hard time attending workshops or meetings, so if there's a way for DTSC to address that, uh, even practically with things like child care or travel stipends for folks who really need to be in the room and are having a hard time getting to meetings. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll finish up with Mike. Okay, and I'll, I'll try and be quick. So, and it's back on question six, and I'm kind of following up on what, what Kelly said, though I had written some stuff out to, to mention earlier. Um, again, I, you know, we're talking a lot about, you know, is it is it really bad to influence the market? I, I would say not always. I, I look at, at the children's mattress pads as a good example of, of the market was influenced. You didn't have any AAs, but you did a, a good thing. Um, sometimes it's good, um, and and people if they're exiting early and it's just they're they're removing that that chemical of concern and they're not replacing with anything. Again, you know, great story. So I, I'm just kind of wondering if in order to get maybe a, a bit around the unintentional, uninformed, you know, not really good decisions on replacements. It, and I know you can't really require something. But maybe if in the, in the early communication state, if you're reviewing this, we're having a discussion about this priority product, let us know what you replaced it with. Let's have the discussion because if, you, if you're showing us you made an informed decision and you replaced it with something good, that answers our question on the priority product. You have the information on what they replaced it with. It's kind of, it's a win without as much effort at the end, but it, it might be you know, it's kind of an optional route because you, uh, you can't change the regulation easily at this point, but but maybe it's a way to, to get just some collaboration um, going forward and 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 take some of that angst out of it. 
Uh, Elaine? Yeah, I just want to say that was sort of my earlier point about, um, you know, some kind of voluntary certification yeah. thing is just, you know, take advantage of the fact that you can and will be moving the market and, you know, I don't know exactly how it works, yeah. but y you do want to have consequences and, you you know, you are. Um, so it's just a matter of somehow somehow putting some level of, of, of um, surveillance or review around that. Um, good. So uh, thank you very much, panel members. We're going to break for lunch and we convene at 1 o'clock. And it's a reminder, in order to comply with the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act, uh, we ask the panel members to refrain from discussing the agenda topics outside of the meeting. Um, we'll, we convene at 1 o'clock. Thank you. Okay, welcome to the Green Ribbon Science Panel Meeting. We're reconvening after lunch. Uh, apologies for the delay. Uh, we are going to tackle um, some more details following up on this morning. Before we go to Carl, I just want to check with the panel members. We finished up probably driven by time as much as anything else. Um, are there, if, should we be putting in our parking lot to potentially come back to if we have future time, um, additional discussion of any of the items from this morning? And I could ask you all that again at the end of the afternoon. I think we're going to delve into more detail on some of the same topics so we would have the ability to do that. But I just want to check and see a, a yes or no real quick. I guess I would turn that question back to the staff and see if we gave them adequate answers to what they posed. Um, and you can answer that later if, you yep. have, if you'd like us to come back at the end. And Yeah, I think some of those the issues that were brought up are going to come up in the next few uh, uh, sessions as well. So I think we'll hopefully have plenty of time. Okay. So you can just stay right up there, Carl. Okay. Um, thank you all, and thank you, Carl. Um, Carl's going to be giving an introduction regarding how the Safer Consumer Products Program is moving forward with its prioritization efforts specifically. This is part of the springboard into the future. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, thank you, panel, and uh, people listening at home. Um, yeah, so the, we're going to, this afternoon, have uh, a few presentations that are going to go down in a little more specific in the processes. We've had this discussion that was really helpful earlier today. Thank you. Um, based on our kind of look back and our sort of ongoing processes of uh, trying to improve those pro processes of decision making and documentation uh, and communication. Um, but I want to just at a, a higher level saying that we're going to go in reverse order. Dr. Rob Bruch is going to talk about um, the actual priority product profile document, which has evolved from our first draft one with the first products we came out and where we are today. And there's some interesting insights into that. Uh, and then following him, Dr. Chris Leonetti is going to talk about our priority product selection process. Um, again, focusing on some of the things we talked about earlier, a little bit about the trade-offs and the different strategies that we have, and we, we want to get feedback on those processes. And then I'll end up uh, a little later talking about the work plan, and we'll build off of that earlier discussion that uh, Kelly highlighted some of those issues with the work plan and how we use it, what it is, and where we can go. The focus that we'd like this afternoon is looking at how we can look at these processes we've done, and strategically, are there things that we can do to improve it, um, give us some feedback on how we've done it, um, and we're looking forward to your wisdom and innovation. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rob. Thank you, Carl. Good afternoon. So I get the uh, privilege of kicking off the afternoon discussion sessions with uh, my presentation, and I'm going to raise for your consideration some discussion topics that really all revolve around this one central theme of how much information we should be putting into our product chemical profiles. So, just Rob, remind I just you. just state before Rob gets started that Rob is, is here. He uh, inju was injured in uh, dealing with a tree that fell on his house, and he's... He's toughing it out, so through my back that. out. You know, the, the tree didn't cause a lot of damage to my house, thankfully. I was really lucky. I should count my blessings, I guess, but it did do considerable damage to my back. In dealing with it, my wife says I should stop doing that kind of stuff because I'm not that young anymore. So anyways, I might start listening to her. 
All right. So um, anyway, it's just to, just to sort of reorient you and remind you, our product chemical profiles serve a uh, number of functions. Um, first, they record key information that supports DTSC's determination that a product chemical combination meets the, prior, the uh, prioritization criteria that are specified in our safer consumer product regulations. Second, they convey that information to stakeholders and to the public to provide a foundation for stakeholder engagement. And the information that they convey may include, uh, in addition to the, to the basis for our uh, decision to list a priority product, may include um, other information that may inform the alternatives analysis process and that also may be useful to others, uh, including other regulatory agencies. And finally, the product chemical profile is a document that DTSC relies upon to support its rulemaking process in, uh, in listing a priority product. Here, make sure I do that right. Okay. <clears throat> so, the Safer Consumer Product Regulations really set forth two key uh, criteria that must be met, um, and they're shown here. In order for any product chemical combination to be identified and listed as a priority product by DTSC, we must determine that that product chemical combination meets these two criteria. And in making that determination, the, the regulations also list a variety of adverse impact and exposure factors that uh, we may consider in making our determination. <clears throat> but it's important to note that we have an awful lot of discretion when it comes to evaluating those criteria. For example, we do not have to show that a product chemical combination meets all of the criteria that are set forth in the regulation. Um, rather, we decide when the available information is sufficient to support a priority product listing. And in fact, that, that's really what the key theme is that we're asking you about today, is how much information is enough information? Okay, DTSC's goal is to prepare a clear, compelling, legally defensible, and scientifically sound uh, product chemical profiles. But what does scientifically sound mean? And how much inf information do we really need to make sure that the, that the profile is compelling? For different product chemical co combinations, there are clearly going to be different amounts of reliable information available. Some chemicals have been really well characterized, whereas for others, there may not be as much information available. Um, in preparing our, our product chemical profiles, we want to move forward in a timely manner, and we are mindful of the time that we take in developing the profiles, but a key, key question that we want you to consider is, when should we include information beyond that which is strictly required to support a priority product listing? For example, when should we include information that potentially may support these other uh, things that I, that I uh, mentioned previously, such as the alternatives analysis process or use of the profile by other entities. <clears throat> okay, so to date we've actually released eight profiles um, and we have many more in development. And as part of our vetting process, we, re we typically release our draft profiles for public comment, stakeholder input, and then ultimately we, we subject them to a rigorous um, external scientific review process. And all in all, we have not really received that much criticism specifically regarding the scientific content of our profiles. <clears throat> but as the program has evolved, we've been tackling more and more complex questions. And we've been adding more and more information to our profiles to address this increased complexity. Profiles have shifted from documenting the minimum requirements set forth in the Safer Consumer Product Regulations to more comprehensive scientific assessments. And the next couple of slides kind of highlight this a little bit. Um, this page just shows you that the, the, the top three are the very first prior to product profiles that we produce. And you see, moving down this, this uh, list, you get to more and more recent profiles. And you see that the page count's been increasing pretty dramatically in some cases. And of course, the more information you include in a profile, the longer they take to prepare. Um, this next slide also shows that as the 
page count's been increasing, the number of references we've cited has also been increasing. Again, we get up to the carpets and rugs with PFASs, and we're approaching 600 uh, references cited. That's a pretty considerable amount of references. So it's, it's clear that the trade-off in doing this is that while the profile may be more scientifically sound, this extra information can take much more, can, can, the extra information that's included means that it takes us much longer to prepare the profile. Okay, and so that brings us to our discussion topics. <clears throat> the first one relates to the overall content and balance of the profile. Given that we want the priority product document to be clear, compelling, scientifically sound, and legally defensible, where do you think the balance lies between thoroughness and the time we take to prepare the profile? <clears throat> to streamline our efforts in the past, we have sometimes focused only on the most relevant hazard traits. That was especially uh, true with the first few profiles that we prepared. And th but this has been a concern for some stakeholders. And so that brings us to this next discussion topic is, how far should we carry our discussion in the profile? Should we discuss concerns outside of what we consider the most relevant to the basis for a priority product listing? For example, if our primary concern is aquatic toxicity for a given product chemical combination, should we also be discussing you know, human health considerations? And should we consider the benefits or adverse consequences of including or not including certain information for those who might use our profiles beyond our own rulemaking process? In some instances, chemical hazards have been well documented and recognized by other authoritative organizations. Excuse me. In fact, that has often been the basis for actually placing chemicals on our candidate chemical list in the first place. So for, for discussion topic three, what we are asking is, to what extent should DTSC rely on assessments that have been done by external authoritative bodies versus conducting our own thorough review and evaluation of the actual primary scientific literature? And does that change? Does whether or not we rely on an external assessment change based on the type of authority that's providing the assessment? Another topic that we ask you to consider is, what are the potential problems with relying on a few papers rather than documenting a more comprehensive review of scientific publications? And then lastly, as I think you all know, once a priority product is listed in regulation, responsible entities must conduct an alternatives assessment. And as I mentioned earlier, one purpose of the profile is that it might help frame the assessment by including discussions of relevant factors and the, cons uh, the conceptual uh, model for exposure. So our last topic for discussion relates to whether limiting the scope of the profile would possibly complicate the alternatives analysis pro uh, process. That's it. So I'd be happy to answer, if I can, any clarifying questions, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Andre and Christine to open the discussion. Thank you, Rob, for focusing our uh, discussion, and I would be happy to um, focus on, it. so remember the, the usual cautions here, introductory and I was clarifying and informational questions, and if it's really something that's leading to a discussion, which we succeeded in doing this morning, despite our its caveat, <laughs> hang on to that. Um, after we go through the informational and clarifying questions, um, I'll be coming back around and um, starting off with kind of big picture thoughts um, on the topic, you know, see if there's anything that we want to pull out for discussion. Um, and then um, we'll take a look at those questions. And I'll be starting with Art and going this way around the room so that Tim can have the pleasure of um, going last and having Art go first. <laughs> so, so with that, I saw Mike and then Anne with clarifying informational questions. Okay, we're great. Um, thank you, Rob. That that was helpful. Just um, to clarify, when when you're talking about limiting the scope in the profile, are you talking about having the people preparing the prof profile not digging as deep and spending the time doing that, or just referencing, spending the time documenting all the research they did? 
So I probably didn't say that, but but I, I can see it two ways. I can see okay, we're we're looking at all this information to develop the 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 perspective profile, and either you don't dig as deep and say do six hundred you know references, or you, are you just saving the time by not referring to the six hundred references and you say oh here are the five key ones, and these are the ones we're going to list, but yeah, we still looked at all the other 595. There's actually two answers to your question. In one case, yes, you're correct. What we're, ta what we're asking is, would it be suitable in some cases to look to the assessments that have already done by other authoritative bodies rather than redoing the assessments, basically? And when, that might change based on you know, what authoritative body we're looking at. The other thing is, is the part that I was referring to where if our primary concern is aquatic toxicity, do we really need to delve deeply into the human toxicity aspect of it, for example? Or can we just focus on that one aspect? Um, so there's those two parts of it. Yeah, Anne, go ahead. Oh. You're off. I saw, I saw Dishwasher thing. There it is. Yeah. Okay. I got it. Um, so I thought I was going to ask a related question to that, but I'm not sure I do. So in question five, you, you, you posed the question, would limiting the scope of the profile complicate the AA process? And I think I'm not clear how you see that playing out. Why would, why would limiting the scope of the profile complicate the process? Does anyone else want uh, well, to weigh I on think that part, part of, of the, that, Anne, is, is that we put a, an extensive amount of information into our profile. Mm. Um, when it goes to the AA stage, the responsible entity is still required to evaluate all of those factors in the regulation. Mm -hmm. And so if we've done a lot of the work already, that say on hazard assessment, I see. then they can point to that and use that. It'll expedite their, their work, as opposed to if we don't address it at all, then they're going to have to go and... So you meant the AA process for the responsible entity. Correct. That was the part I... Yeah, not on okay. our review, but on, on actually what they have to do, which is more extensive than just a threshold, if you will, of us saying, here's enough information to list it. Got it. Um, and then as my second question, I think, is another one sort of trying to unpack. You had something about uh, stakeholder, stakeholders were concerned about the amount of content in a profile? Y well, Can in you the past... talk more about the like, nature of those concerns? In, in the past, lim okay, our first three profiles, what we really did was we focused on getting enough information to support our listing. Right. <clears throat> we used our discretion to a great extent, and we relied on that on the on the what we deemed the uh, the amount of information that was ne needed, rather than perhaps in some cases possibly doing a more extensive in depth assessment of all the literature out there and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so some stakeholders have expressed that as a concern, where we just did the minimum that we were required to do, rather than digging deeper, which we could have done. So the trade-off is that we it takes us much longer, potentially, but maybe a more thorough process. So, so the, Thank you. the example yeah. I think is most readily available is how many exposure routes do we speak to, mm. for instance? And so if our primary concern is about the use phase or the manufacturing phase, do we need to discuss end of life, right? And so if you look, for instance, at the PFAS, document that that conceptual diagram is very extensive mm. and that's an extreme example but there are cases where you know a simplified conceptual diagram could accelerate how much work we do i think you get it right yeah thank you okay tim was i on clarifying questions right right yeah. informational um, or clarifying can you help um, i may have missed this so tim do you have a mic over yeah. sorry uh, I may have missed this, so can you um, can you uh, clarify for me like where the profile comes in like the overall process? So, like, uh, I need to go back to the picture. <laughs> like I, I see like kind of I got the picture here with the like I don't know what these are. Um, the secretary funnels. The funnels, yes, <laughs> they go down. He's the lawyer. <laughs> <in> the <room. laughs> and it looks like profile writing is. That profile development is way down there in phase three where you're basically doing technical support for rulemaking. Well, but I'm wondering, like, where are the decisions you're asking us about, like the scope and all that? Mm -hmm. Where do they come in? Um, 
Did you? I, I can answer partly if you'd like to say something as well, Andre. Basically, um, what the diagram I think you're looking at, where it talks about scoping and so forth, that what that is is our process for getting to the profile of writing. It's basically our initial research looking at products and chemicals and scoping what's out there. And we have a process that we go through that's a fairly extensive process where teams get together and they divide up work and they scope exposure factors and hazard factors and things for chemicals, trying to identify product chemical combinations um, that fall within our work, current work plan that then deserve further consideration as we move forward. Ultimately, we get to a point through that process where we've selected certain product chem chemical combinations and, th and then we write the profile. What the profile is, it's really our first public document that's published as first a stakeholder engagement tool. We seek feedback on it and then we refine it in some cases. Um, we then finalize it and then we move forward into rulemaking. That document is essentially the scientific document that supports rulemaking and says, this is our evidence that this product chemical combination meets all of these prioritization criteria that are, where we'll, meets these cri prioritization uh, criteria that are listed in the Safer Consumer Product Regulations. Not necessarily all of them again, but this is the data that we have or the information that we have that supports that it meets these certain criteria. Therefore, we're moving forward with rulemaking. And then that document goes out for external scientific peer review as part of the rulemaking process and is actually incorporated into the rulemaking file and as a technical document that supports the actual adoption of the rule to list the priority product. So would it be fair to say, what was um, I, what I need clarification was with like in question two, it says, you know, uh, to what extent should you evaluate and document concerns outside those most relevant for the basis of the product? And what I was trying to figure out is like a chicken and the egg problem, which is, okay, so how do you know what's most relevant if you ha aren't looking at a broad swath of things? And it sounds like what you're saying is, during the scoping process, you would generally look broadly at potential exposure routes and potential hazard traits, then you'd focus those down, and that's what you mean when you say primary concern of a chemical is aquatic toxicity. That's because during the scoping process, you started broad, got down to that, and now you're asking, when we do the profile, which is the in-depth dive, should we go back and look at all those things again? That's what you're asking? Exactly. Should we relay information on all those things in the profile? Should we discuss them all in the profile? Or should we discuss the one that came out as the, as the one where, for example, there is the most information available, it's the one where we have the most concern about? Mm -hmm. Should we focus just on that? Or should we go back and, and also talk about some of these other things that we, that we saw exactly? So just to kind of like bring that all around and tie it up. So like during the scoping process, is that documented somewhere and available for people to look at to see how it is you got to this concern versus, you know, the ones that you didn't think should be focused on? I'm going to let Andre actually. Well, yeah, I think in that scoping report, you would uh, p potentially identify those things. So the, the profile is we've decided to pursue this product right. chemical combination. So that's, we do have some other... Uh, we may have um, identified in this example aquatic impacts is really the the driver, the reason why we chose to pursue it, and we, it actually has come up from in colleagues who have you know reviewed draft documents that hey you didn't talk about human, you mm -hmm. know, and um, we the our rationale was well yeah it's just not it's not really the reason why we're doing this and it doesn't in and of itself probably wouldn't have persuaded us to do this. Okay. And is that you. the background document that you're talking about when you say that? Well, so it, there's, a, there's a public background <laughs> document, which is a short thing. There's an example in the packet here um, for 1,4-dioxane. And then, but the internal scoping report, the one that you've seen the blank template for, can actually be lengthy, like 100 pages, but it's an internal document. So, um, but, it, but that really depends on what the research question is that the team is working on, uh, what kind of information might be in that, in that um, public background document. It yeah, may be about all the, the various a, uh, adverse impact or hazard traits of, of a single chemical, or it could be something else. It just depends what the question was. Yeah, to give you an example, I mean, our, our, our initial profiles <clears throat> were not that lengthy, the first few that we did. More recently, the scoping documents I've been working on are much longer than those profiles ever were um, because we're dealing with things that are much more complex and things like chemical classes, whole classes of chemicals rather than just a single chemical uh, as, a, as an example of what increases that complexity. 
But let's hold on for a minute and let Meredith. It's just, uh, just to be clear, you said so people understand or so people know what you, your basis was. I think that was part of the language you used when you asked me a clarifying question. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> people wouldn't necessarily, again, this is an internal document, and one of the things we learned early on was how people interpret the documents that we publish. And so we do have need to have that ability to think things through without prematurely um, signaling things. So that's one reason why the, there's no intent to make the scoping documents public. <coughs> Other informational or clarifying questions? All right, hearing no, none, um, I'd like to move on and uh, really start with kind of initial reactions or main, main issues. And um, then I want to make sure that we have some opportunity to engage on anything that's significant that comes up that isn't kind of covered through the, the once around. Um, and I want to make sure we also try to cover the questions that are here. But we can do that after this initial, initial round of kind of the high level things. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Fong. Um, the first comment that I have regarding the uh, <coughs> excuse me uh, product chemical profiles in terms of uh, if it's comprehensive enough, um, at, at least for the current or existing priority products, I found them to be actually a um, little too much information, especially on the hazard part of the um, uh, document or report. Given the fact that uh, these are already known hazards, um, the extent to which you document or actually justify uh, inclusion of information, I found that to be uh, probably more than you need to. And actually, for me, it was kind of, I skipped through a, a lot of that. So I think limiting um, the length or information on the hazard and actually, uh, actually spending more time on the exposure part to really key in on what, how that might affect consumers or public in the city of California. I think that's more of an important thing to do. And also, in terms of the hazard part of it, again, so for the existing priority products, these are already known hazards. So I think limited documentation is fine, but I think that equation would change if it gets into emerging or uh, you know emerging type hazards. Uh, so for a good example would be uh, the nanomaterials or EDCs. Um, I think in that case you would I would want to see you know very comprehensive or thorough uh, documentation or explanation on why these ha are uh, chemicals are hazards of concern for this particular program. Thank you very much, Dr. Fong. Um, Dr. Sutton. Uh, is this preliminary questions or should I? Answer. Um, anything you think is really big or important would be really good to bring out now. Um, but if you want to run through all your thoughts, go ahead. Uh, probably not necessary. But uh, I guess uh, I would say that in general, for communication, shorter is usually better. Uh, even for what Art was just saying about skipping over stuff. Like if, if a reader, a uh, regulated entity or a consultant is skipping over stuff, then it's not good communication. Uh, I did notice, though, that the two documents that got extra long were the PFAS and the nonophenols and detergents, and both of those are, are actually chemical classes, although nonophenols is a smaller class than PFAS, and also both involve chemical degradation and exposure outside the use phase. So for me, those do merit additional work, and so it makes sense that those ones were the longer documents. Uh, in terms of how many references or how extensively to document the rationale, for me, it is very useful to rely on a few key citations, but to acknowledge when there's disagreement or controversy about some of these, uh, you know, outside authoritative bodies' decisions and, and maybe just directly address them. Um, of course, that's just documentation. Internally, the staff would need to understand the, the decision-making, even if it weren't laid out in the, in the product profile. Uh, so yeah, those are my comments. Mike? 
Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of validity to, to keeping to a shorter document and sticking to the minimum requirements. But I think if, if you do it, you have to internally make sure that, that staff isn't still doing a deep dive and then not being transparent in some fashion. And maybe you could disclose it in a, a, like just a few key documents saying, this is what we know. Um, because you know, we talked a lot about transparency. Um, but also you want to make sure that once those AAs start coming in and maybe different staff members are looking at them, that you are consistent across the board. And you don't want to make it seem like, okay, yeah, we are focusing on, on the aquatic issue, but there's a human health potential issue if you swap it out. You, you don't want to set, set someone up to make an unfortunate substitution when you knew better up front. So, so there's, there's potentially, instead of having as long a document, maybe there's a shorthand version to say, you know, here is, you know, there is publicly information, available information that we w will reference um, somewhere just to make sure everyone's on the same page. Can you explain that a little more? Sure. So if so if if staff is looking at at, at, a, at a material, they're saying, yeah, the, our concern is aquatic tox, mm -hmm. and we know all this other information exists. And if if staff is doing a real deep dive and they see some concerns, but not enough to raise it to to being a priority product. Mm -hmm. um, but then someone comes in with an alternative analysis, and they don't deeply consider that. But staff has an idea about it, and they're saying what you're proposing doesn't meet our criteria, not because of aquatic, but because it's an unfortunate substitution. Because, yeah, you've improved the aquatic somewhat, but, mm -hmm. wow, this is really different with, with this human health hazard or something else. If, if you're not transparent that you've discovered these other endpoints, um, it doesn't serve industry as they put together their AAs for you to have knowledge and withhold it. So just following up on that, how would you do that? Would it be um, something short, just sort of saying here are other issues? Would it be um, having a reference list um, related to that? I mean, sort of what, what would you think Yeah, about you know, maybe so. Even if, if your data sources are, you know, we, we mined you know, our data through um, these, these databases. Please refer to them. Mm -hmm. And don't list out all the citations because that's going to take a while. But, but at least let, know people, let people know what you looked at so that they can go try and compile the same information. And if they come back and say, I don't have access to that, can you tell me what you found so that I'm not ignoring a potential consequence? Okay, thanks for letting me drill in on that. Yeah, Anne, you're up next. Um, I was actually going to pursue that a little more. Oh, look, I didn't have to play with it. Um, so yes, I think I agree. Um, what I'm hearing and from the, the clarifying questions I asked, you've got this tension between the, there was pushback that there was too little information on the first three profiles, um, and then there's the question of if you limit the profile, is it more work for the REs when they do, when they do the alternative assessment? Um, so I would just comment that perhaps that may depend on the population of the REs and how knowledgeable they are about their own chemistry. Um, and you've had that range of, of, of responses so far, um, so that's something that you might want to consider. And I agree with Mike. I think it's, it's, I'm fine with focusing on the key hazard that made DTSC choose to take this on uh, with an acknowledgement that then I think Becky referred to this as well, acknowledgement of other concerns that may come up. I mean, you're not going to be able to anticipate all the potential hazards of alternative chemistries. People may go on a completely different chemistry, or you have the issue of methylene chloride and MP, you know, switching the hazard endpoint. So... Within your ability to reasonably anticipate what the alternative chemistries might be, you might acknowledge, you know, what these other hazard concerns are. But I'm fine with limiting the profile. Um, I also agree with, with, with Becky that the length of the PFAS document was absolutely uh, appropriate. I, I'm hoping, for the sake of Simona and others, that it's an outlier. Uh, <laughs> uh, because it is an emerging issue. It's a complex chemistry. Um, we can only hope that there are not other classes of chemicals. And then, you know, we're also justifying this approach of a, a compound class, a, a class of chemicals. Um, the other things that came up... Um, I heard a reference of, you know, how much do we put into this in case somebody might use it for something other than our rulemaking. I wouldn't worry about that too much. I think people are going to use your documents. I know for sure your PFAS profile is being used for a whole, to justify a whole lot of other stuff because it is so comprehensive. Um, unless you have a, you know, a specific intent, like we know that, you know, the federal government can't necessarily prosecute some case and they'll leave pieces of the evidence out there for New York State to take on. Unless you have that really intentional plan, I wouldn't worry too much about your profile being guided by who else might use it. Um, 
And then a very specific question about your categor categorization of authoritative sources when you're using an assessment that was done by someone else. You may have already done this, but um, just uh, categorize how much you trust an authoritative body. Um, you know, the way green screen does, for example, you know, with tier one authoritative body versus not. Um, so if IARC has done a fairly recent assessment, then you could probably rely on that. But just be able to, I, you've probably got this in your head and in your process, but just document who you trust more than others. It's not going to be a hard and fast rule, but it'll be a good guideline. Oh, I, I think Blaine, I have my right. own special one. She has her own, oh, yes. Just a quick tap, yeah. Yeah. There we go. It was, it was too quick before. Um, so, so caveating this with, of course, I am not an industry representative, so I can't fully appreciate what will or will not be uh, an added burden. Um, it strikes me a couple things. Um, one, that in many ways... Kind of, uh, in many ways, the questions you're asking and the sort of uh, challenges that you're facing would really benefit from, I'm going to call it systematic review thinking, the same way you use life cycle thinking, right? So you, the systematic review per se may not apply directly for a lot of reasons, and many people picking up systematic review. So, you know, the way they're doing it in IRIS is not the way they did it in clinical, you know, medical interventions. But... But the reason that that might be really helpful here is you could do a, first the protocol stage, right, and get that broad thinking out there quickly to stakeholders, you know, for feedback. Um, and then uh, secondly, it, it really um, just adds so much transparency, right? If you're using the, the kinds of software tools that, again, Iris or you know, has um, been bringing into their program. If, as, the, as somebody doing these kinds of um, analyses and reviews, it's, it saves a lot of time, but all those references are there. How much you delve into them, how much you report out on them is based on one, your, you know, your protocol, your your identification of what you're going to focus on, but you've got that feedback early, so you're not doing a, a, one of your huge, very involved, very um, high labor protocols putting out and then, you know, having it slammed, which of course you're doing a whole lot of other scoping and interaction, but uh, it just, this just begs for that kind of a, um, I, in, in, in my mind, I just see that really clearly. And then, um, uh, the, uh, the other thing I would say, I'm looking at the wrong page, so kind of a two-tier thing just to think about. Um, and then um, uh, I keep going back to the fact that to me, so the, like sort of the real power of what you're doing here is in, in stimulating innovation. And, and if you do too much thinking on what are alternatives or if you put out, you know, if, even if you, if you spend too much time on some of that, are you – is that limit innovation? And I again, because I'm not somebody in industry, not everybody wants to, in industry wants to invest in innovation and stuff. But at the same time, isn't that one of the big exciting goals of your program? Is that everybody who's in manufacturing and product development and 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 selling products isn't that what we want? Is for them to just add this additional layer of thinking from the beginning, right? And so, if you're doing so much of that for them, um, I, it's just a thought. Um, and then the other things have, have pretty much been said, some kind of SOP about what authoritative sources you'd be using, and absolutely do not repeat that. And, I mean, that just seems not a good use of your time. Uh, so that's it. Helen, go ahead. I find myself laughing at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Because there's a part of me that's like, well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Oh, why? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. We've had how many conversations about how complete the re responsible entity has to be? <laughs> and the answer that keeps coming up is very, 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 very thorough, very, very comprehensive. So I have to say I'm, I'm more than a little amused at this. Um, but because we actually have talked about this point, quite a bit, I think I, I have some fairly 
well-formed ideas on this at this point of what I consider to be like a stand, the standard of what we're trying to do. And um, where my first instinct is, is from the point of fairness, it cannot be less than what you might ask a regulated entity to do. Right, so whatever level of fairness that you would be asking, or sorry, of completeness you would be asking of them, you have to be willing to do the same amount, same level of, of, of rigor. That, to me, only logically holds together. Meredith, you want to react to that before Helen continues? Well, I think, uh, just to clarify, Helen, I don't think we're asking should the level of rigor that we do be less than what we would expect. I think we're talking about the scope and the depth of the analysis, how far we go um, at this stage of the process. Because ultimately, and this is another thing we haven't discussed, but there is a benefit to us doing a lot of that work early because then when we get the AA back, we've done a lot of work and we can compare. If we don't do that work and we're relying on the responsible entity to do it, we're still going to have to evaluate that, so there's yes. a certain yes. amount of work. But Completely agree. I understand that. Yeah, so... It's, it, so it's not, it's not necessarily that I'm saying that we need to be to the extreme, but that just so that you understand that that's what I'm thinking in my mind about mm -hmm. um, wanting to make sure that there's a certain element of fairness. So it, it came in when we were talking about the minimum, right? So th that was one of the questions is, can we just do the minimum? I would say that's probably not the right answer because um, you're going to be asking the, respons uh, the regulated entities to, responsible entities to um, go and poke it and uh, look under everything because that's part of it. So I find myself thinking about the known knowns and the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. Um, because when we're defining a priority product, it's a known, right? It is a specific chemical and it's known. And the, the particular reason for concern is very known. When we get to the alternatives analysis, there are a lot of unknowns because of the nature of the alternatives. Um, you know, it's hard... That, that level of analysis of all the potential impacts of all these alternatives introduces a lot more complexity. So for the, I would certainly agree that for the known knowns of a priority product, which are the basis of, of the listing, we need to have that level of rigor and detail that fully supports it. But I think part of our question is, you, do yes. we and, but you, st you still actually do need those other things because, so um, as we've talked about many times, there's always going to be a trade-off resolution. Nothing ever goes down on everything, on every um, right. of, these, of these endpoints. It's just, if it's ever happened in the history of the world, I, ha I don't know about it. So I, you know, I've, I've not seen that. So assuming that something, like if you're looking at something with carcinogenicity and the replacement goes up in the aquatic toxicity and you're expecting the responsible entity to account for that, having a baseline from your original um, uh, chemical of concern is actually super helpful mm -hmm. because you don't know if it's material or not if you don't have a baseline. So even though you, the, the, the um, original listing might have been on carcinogenicity, if you don't also have your thoughts on the aquatic toxicity, when someone goes in to try to do an evaluation of an alternative that might have an increase or it might have a different... Um, it might be different in the aquatic toxicity. You don't know whether, it, should I care about it? And that has to be part of that um, alternatives assessment when it gets submitted. I, I want to probe a little bit on your concept of fairness, um, just because um, I'm, not, I'm a little uncomfortable with that word. I'm because, being a little facetious. Well, I, I understand, I, but I think that, that <laughs> just to acknowledge that by design and by the structure of our framework regulations, um, it was understood that we don't have all the information that a manufacturer could or should have uh, in, in, with respect to their product. And so if we were to say fairness, I would say, great, if you gave us all the information you had, that might be more fair, but we don't typically have that. And by design, we've pushed the alternative analysis onto the manufacturer because our assumption is that both from the functional needs of the product and the, your knowledge of the supply chain and all of those things that you have much more information than we do. So it's not fair. There's a greater burden on the, the manufacturer in the AA process than then there is on the department to say, does do we have enough information to 
put this into process and say it, it needs to have that thorough analysis and that needs to be done by the manufacturer. So I don't think it's fair. So, I think that's just the structure of the, the law and the regulations. So um, I'm going to ask our co-chairs. I see heads nodding and shaking and I, I see some energy around this point and um, I, I just want to put in it. a, I want to yeah. put a plea in that at the appropriate moment that the, we hear from more panel members on this topic. Okay. All right. So, we'll okay. so I have a bunch of, am I allowed to like okay. talk about a few different things that yeah. you're asking Why don't you do that? these different I'm questions? Come back to this topic. <laughs> yeah, so, I get, that's oh. the yeah, pleasure of going last. Going last. Yeah. Um, I, so I'll start with Helen's point. I knew you were good. As soon as I read this, I thought relevant factors. I'm sitting next to Helen. I can't wait. Uh, but um, I, I do, I like agreeing with you, but I'll say I, I disagree with you on the point of um, it should be the same kind of analysis. I, I think you were using that to make a point, not to like argue it should be exactly the same. Yeah. Yes. But it seems like there are two different decisions. One is ultimately does the product chemical combination meet the threshold for listing as a right which does not i don't think legally require you to have determined it for every hazard trade it's enough right which is a different question so but having said that i look at these and i'm having like it seems like there's a these questions raise both kind of uh policy good decision making issues and then kind of resource issues and kind of administrative issues so for example I feel like one principle that applies to a lot of these questions would be to show your work. So, for example, like, that's why I was asking the scoping question, because it sounds like there's a problem formulation part of this where you're doing a broad look at most of what's available. And so I agree with Elaine on this, this notion of uh, systematic review thinking, the notion that you do problem formulation and that's how you figure out what you should be worried about. Yes, it gets... They get on the candidate list because they're listed for some purpose, maybe carcinogen or something like that. But, you know, if it's a priority, I would think, especially if you're trying, you've got limited resources and you're trying to figure what to focus on, you'd want to know if there were things other than that that would be important. And it sounds like that's what you're doing. Like at the scoping phase, you're doing that. And then you're making a choice. So I would formalize that. I agree with Elaine, it should be to the extent you can build in these kind of systematic review concepts. That would be great. Um, but then I, I feel like you need to show that work when you get to the profile. So if, like, you're getting called out by people who say, hey, why didn't you focus on X or Y? And, in fact, you decided not to focus on X and Y because you did this scoping and here's that. Well, you ought to say that. You ought to, like, say we looked at a broad range of things. I mean, if you read risk assessments, essentially that's what they do in risk assessments. They say, here's why we focused on this and we excluded that. And so I think that would be really useful to do that. Um, so that's kind of an administrative thing. If I'm right, it sounds like you're already doing those and it's a matter of, you know, should, but then your que the question says, uh, to streamline our efforts, we've elected to focus on only the most relevant, which I'm not sure what that means, the streamlining. If, it, if streamlining means we're not including the discussion of the scoping in the profile document, that to me seems to be a false economy and that it would be useful. And if what you're worried about are shorter documents, longer documents, I view that as kind of a communication issue, not a substance issue. So you can write a short document and then have an appendix that says, here's how we formulated our problem, and then it's a nice readable thing, and then people who really care can dig deeper. So I think it, you know, I think it would be good to show your work and make that available, and that also ensures, kind of incentivizes people to actually kind of really give that attention, because I think we all have cognitive biases where once somebody focuses on one thing, we tend to focus on that, and maybe we would, would give shorter shrift to other things, not because we're not rigorous, but because we're human. So I think that could be, so that's one, that's one uh, point. Uh, I have this other question. Why do you guys call, when you call the scoping document an internal document, like put quotes around that, I don't know what that means. That means you don't release it to the public, but it seems to me that should be available to somebody, say, if they did a Public Records Act request. There's, be. there's nothing deliberative about that, right? I mean, it is. Well, yeah. it, it, it's, it's uh, a it depends on when in time. It is yeah. in part. Um, you know, if Andre's staff is, is actively deliberating on a certain subject and they, they put a scoping thing, there's no decisions been made about whether we, 
move forward at that point. After we've made a decision, then I think there may be an argument that that's uh, that it's. I mean, you're the attorney in the room, but um, well, I'm no expert on it. It just yeah. seems to me there's two questions. One is what do you have to do, and then the other is what should you do. And it seems to me like the scoping document is something. If it but, determines, well, it tells people, here's why we focus on this. Right? To me, it seems like that should be available to people or, and it should be referred to in Tim, the just document. Can I clarify? It seems like your point, which is a good one, which is that whatever okay. it is, whether it's in a scoping document or other, we should ex explain. I would. Yeah, yeah that what yeah. we're not looking at or why we didn't yeah. choose this. And, just, and then people um, can comment yeah, on that. Okay. Like, um, Meredith, like the known, unknown, blah, all that stuff, which <laughs> is. Um, I show that clip in a lot of my classes because as much as we laugh at it, it's true. I mean, there are all these kinds of uncertainties. Um, but I have to say, I, um, uh, my experience is even with known chemicals, there's unknowns. And that people, because it's, oh, that's a carcinogen, people tend not to think, oh, it's also a neurodevelopmental toxin. But we don't pay attention to that because that got all the attention. So I think the scoping thing helps avert that tendency that we all tend to have. Just a couple la last on. Um, so I think it's good to limit things. I wouldn't knock stuff out to streamline if it's going to affect the depth or rigor of your analysis. So that's like your thing about thoroughness versus time. I would put a thumb on the scale in favor of thoroughness. And um, I'd be careful about things, so just putting on my public health hat, like when Art said, you know, you can focus more on exposure, and then maybe you don't have to worry so much about hazard traits, because once you've determined that some exposure route isn't really that important, then, you know, that, which is perfectly legitimate thing to say, but it makes me a little nervous, because of historically, how many times people have been sure that this exposure doesn't happen, and then guess what, in the real world, we find out, yes, it does, and so I think we should... I would tend to encourage you to be cautious about not focusing on things, either hazard trade or exposures, um, early in, on in the process. Um, that, 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 oh, the, that, uh, no, everybody, I agree with everything else that was said as well. Well, amusingly, I, what I've heard here is kind of a spectrum from shorter is better to more thorough is good, and it kind of went around the table. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to come back to that a little bit. Um, my thoughts all kind of in the middle, and because I've been s struggling with this shorter is better and focusing um, meets more of the intent. My, having been around since the law was written and actually you know, followed the legislative process while that was going on, um, I have a very clear memory that one of the... Um, reasons that the law exists today is that the intent of the legislature was to put most of the burden on the industry and not on the government. And that, that's actually why it was passed as a zero cost item. So, which is hysterical given the amount of effort that it takes here. But it was, it was something that was sold to the legislature that there would be very little cost to government to run this program and that most of the cost would be on the industry to do all the scientific work. Now, that certainly isn't the case, but you know that's something I keep in mind when I'm taking a look at how much work the department is doing. Um, and I do agree with, with Helen's comments about the, uh, that our expectation that the government should provide high-quality information. But I do not think that the law says that the burden should be on government to do everything. In fact, I think the law and the legislative intent were the opposite. But we're working in a practical world, not in the theoretical view of legislators who are mostly not scientists, almost all of them. Um, we need some scientists there. <laughs> That's another topic. Um, and so I've been thinking a little bit about the um, idea of how could, could this be done in a way that doesn't create... Uh, the last profile that, that just came out this week, um, the Simona and the team, I, I, it read to me like something between a master's and a PhD thesis in terms of its thoroughness. And you know, having done those kinds of reviews myself, I, I realized how incredibly difficult that is and to um, select the literature and pick the quality of each paper. And I know you have systems for doing that and all that kind of stuff. It, that's incredibly burdensome. And I looked at that and I said, this is wonderful and it's too much. It's too much to expect the government to do. So then I start thinking about, well, what is reasonable to expect the government to do? And that's where I tend to fall more towards the camp of shorter and a little more focused is better. 
but how do we also meet the needs of the latter camp in terms of documentation? So the idea that I, I want to throw out there is that um, the department, in any case, is doing a literature review. You guys are actually doing a lot of sorting through as part of your scoping process. And so I actually think having a bibliography is an incredibly powerful element of this, whether or not the papers are thoroughly discussed. And there's a way of doing that where you just say, we looked at these other things, huge long list of citations, and they were less important. Um, and maybe even highlighting a few things that are interesting or controversial or whatever, but not spending pages and pages talking about the hazard, but really pulling out a few things and providing the citations that the department thought were of quite high enough quality to include as a way of, of getting past some of that. So the resources are there without having to spend all this time writing and editing and re-editing the long text. The second thought I have is, and you all laugh at me because I talk about conceptual models a lot, but I really strongly agree with Art that the exposure piece is, is very difficult for a lot of people, um, and it's really hard to get it right in terms of exposures, and like Tim says, people are always making this mistake. It's something, uh, another theme I keep telling everybody about. There, I think it's really important that the department do provide, at some point in the process, a conceptual model that is well thought out, um, not necessarily described in gory detail, but the citations behind that as well. So the, to me, the most important parts of the profile are the justification for the listing and that conceptual model, and then supplying all the, the references and highlighting other issues, but not at the gory level of detail that it has in some of the profiles. So, so that is one thought for how to do that. The other thought I have um, builds on what Elaine said about phasing. So I, I, I have to ask you guys, and this is something to ponder, I think, not an answer right now, but is it necessary to put it all in the first profile that you put on the street for discussion? Maybe putting some, just focus in on here would be the basis for the listing, getting that out on the street, mm -hmm. and then working in parallel. If it looks like this is a go, then working in parallel on pulling together the rest of that and sharing that later on might be helpful. So I just threw a whole bunch of stuff out there, and, and I would really much, very much like, as Meredith requested, that we come back to that question and get some answers. And I think I saw Anne, maybe Anne, Helen, Elaine, that order. So go for it. I'm being challenged by technology. Okay. Um, so my first thought when you started speaking, Kelly, was that uh, it's hard, it's often, the topics we take on, it's often hard to talk about in the abstract. Yeah. And right now we have eight profiles, which is helpful, but it's still a very small end. Um, uh, and my short might, mean, might meet Tim's requirements for thorough. So it's, you know, we're, we're using the same words and they may mean different things to each of us. So that's uh, may, may be partly why you're seeing the spectrum. Um, I really like this idea of an annotated bibliography. I think that's one way to convey you know, we looked at all of this, and this is our summary of that data. For me, that would be short. <laughs> There's a lot of background work that went into that. And I always feel like it comes down to context, and we've touched on this. I always feel like I'm the one that's saying it depends, right? This is the, what the scientist in the room always says. Um, it's the challenge of you can be short when the hazards are well known. Art, you've brought this up a couple of times already. And then we've, we've already said also that, you know, in the place of something like PFAS, we're taking on a complex topic a complex chemistry, a complex class of chemicals. So we're doing a whole bunch of stuff, and so it's appropriate to have a longer document. And so I think there's, you know, contextual pieces in there that we need to evaluate. All right. Do you have Helen more than deserves a stage at this point. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, I would like to make a, 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 a an argument for a more complete view. Um, I actually, though, would, would say that a literature review type approach, actually, I, there are definitely benefits to that. Um, so uh, something, something a little bit more than a literature review in places where it's unknown or where there's less existing, like in the exposure or conceptual model, I think. Uh, but um, a more complete profile, even if it comes later, is going to give you the strongest arguments and defense um, for any action that gets taken in any direction. So I think that there's, there is a, a very strong argument just from that perspective, both technically or scientifically and legally, that the more information you have there, that the stronger your arguments are going to be for whatever you decide to do. 
Um, it's also simultaneously most useful for the entities that are responding because then you have, you know whether ototoxicity really needs to be in your, um, in your AA that you submit. You know, it, because if it's, if it's mentioned, then you probably need to respond to it. It just clarifies things quite a bit, even though it kind of stinks because you end up making a, a bit more work that maybe they might have simplified otherwise. But it clarifies the fact that if the department has looked at a particular endpoint, that um, there might be an expectation that, that you would as well. So, Helen, let me follow up on that, though, because you're mentioning a specific thing for the chemical that would be listed in the product, but what if one of the alternatives had that hazard? I mean, I'm not really sure how much it, it saves. So talk to me about that. I, I'm not saying that it, well, um, what I'm saying is that let's just, let's just say that you had a, a substance that had a no ototoxicity data, mm -hmm. and you say in the department's profile we did not find any ototoxicity data. That says, as the entity, that probably says that I need to go and look at ototoxicity for my replacement as well. It sets that, it just clarifies that. It doesn't mean it's less work to, to go and look for that. It just says that if that was an endpoint that was looked at in the original profile, that might be something I need to look at. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I wanted to go back to, uh, sort of, again, for the completeness, the conflicting data point that Rebecca made. Super, super important. And I'm, on this one, I'm thinking phthalates and others, where there might be um, disagreements about different sources and what they mean and all these different things. And so the more comprehensive view will let you give a little... Um, a, a better view of why you're valuing certain sources over other sources. Um, it also, to Mike's point, shows that you're not cherry-picking sort of a, a, a related... Um, you know, uh, point where you're not just, you do 600 references, but you're only going to show these 10. Someone's always going to ask why these 10 and not these 10. So, um, and then uh, back to the point of uh, whether you should worry about um, what other people are going to do with it. I, d I agree that you, that shouldn't be a factor. As much as we do want people to reuse it, ultimately at the end of the day, you know, you have to serve the the, the regulation that you're supporting. So that was that. Thanks. Elaine? Okay, so, so actually what I wanted to do was just clarify um, for the record exactly what I mean by systematic review thinking, okay, because it doesn't mean systematic. I've, there's a term systematic literature review, not what I'm talking about. I am talking about systematic review methodologies, which is basically... Um, you have to start out with what is your, you know, what are the hypotheses, what's the questions that you're trying to answer, and how are you, it's, it's almost like a literature-based study where you have um, criteria that you're, so in this case you have two criteria for your uh, protocol, I'm not, I'm not, uh, not protocol, product um, uh, selection. Profile for your profile, and there's two two criteria that were put up at the beginning, and that would help you frame exactly what questions you're going to be asking, and then what would be your um, your strategy for looking at those questions, and then what would be your criteria for evaluating the evidence that you're collecting. So you're really looking to build a a very rigorous um, analysis where there are, of what the evidence is supporting your goals, your hypotheses, or, or whatever you want to call them, um, that you're going to make your decision off of, right? So the power of this is that you're being very rigorous and upfront, you're sort of broad in the first stage, and then you show why you're going to go deeper for the you know for the second stage so but in in you basically use that first stage to broadly say why you're going to focus you know what why your strategy is what your strategy is and what your criteria are going to be before you've even looked deeply at the papers at the studies at the information so up front you're saying here's how we're going to evaluate that information and then you go deeper and now you're so you're really being very rigorous and it's all transparent it's when if you look at um, 
in the literature or, or it's in, in, you know, the regulatory agencies that do require these kinds of analyses, they'll say, we, we searched on these criteria, we, we captured, you know, this many papers, then we, you know, modified it, or we focused it down based on this, and we selected these 10 studies, and the reason we selected, the, you know, these 10 studies is they met all these criteria, and that's the evidence we're using to inform our decision. So it's, I, I, so in, in many ways, now that I understand what Helen's saying, <laughs> the scope is different, right? I do, I, I, I do worry that it's not the agency's role to I, identify alternatives because I, I feel like that will limit innovation and, and in many ways undermine sort of the goals of the program. But, but in terms of identifying why you're looking at something and why you're asking the regulated entities to look into something. R rigor is incredibly important and transparency is incredibly important. And the reason, even more so in this program, I would sort of advocate for, for moving down this path is that I, I've heard over and over and over how important flexibility is. And that the flexibility has to do with the context, with the question, with the whatever. So if you can put your question up front, you can then say this, you can use that same level of rigor and come out feeling, you know, really uh, like you've scientifically supported what you're doing and maintain that ability to ask slightly different questions every time based on the chemicals and products and, and, and points and exposures that you're interested in, problem world, global problems you're trying to solve. So I know Meredith wants to follow up this and I want to apologize to Christina and Mr. Flags and we'll come to you after Meredith. Is yours on this point? Uh, well, it's on a few points. So, okay. okay. So um, I do, do want to say that the program got an update from Iris. Chris Thayer was out and really walked us through how they have adapted systematic review for their purposes. And we, have, we think this is an opportunity. I know you touched on it this morning, but probably not in as much depth of, as we've actually considered this. We do think there's a, a great possibility to try out the tools um, in terms of just efficiencies, transparency, and really a lot of what you're talking about in terms of how you frame the question that you're answering and um, how that does support providing transparency in our decision making. So I just wanted to reiterate that. I know you touched on it this morning, but I wasn't sure in how much depth. Um, but it's an ongoing conversation within the program, and I hope that we'll be able to give you more information about that in an upcoming meeting. I don't know about the next one, but perhaps, you know, just it's, it's an area we would love to get more perspective on and talk about the strengths and weaknesses of the approach. But it, you know, as you said, when it was first adept, first came along for the pharmaceutical industry, that's just, it's not one size fits all. And it, we would just implode under the burden of applying that. And so right-sizing it is going to be really, really important if we were to adapt it. Okay, so my comment had nothing to do with systematic review. Um, really, it has more to do with, um, as a scientist who works on, you know, the research and the profiles, we always struggle with what's enough and what's too much. Mm -hmm. um, I understand the comments about um, maybe making the profile shorter. However, when we go through rulemaking, and I've gone through rulemaking myself a couple of times, when it goes through external scientific peer review, um, reviewers always make suggestions of adding additional references, no matter how thorough we are. And so I've worked on two very thorough profiles, and, and they gave us positive comments, but they said, we think your profile would be stronger if you add these additional references, and several of them are on hazard traits. So while it's a lot of work up front, it is probably, to, I'm in favor of it being to our benefit to be more thorough, because I know when we go through external scientific peer review and rulemaking, pretty consistently they make recommendations that we add more. And that's at least been my experience. I can't speak for all the other scientists who have gone through rulemaking. And then the other additional comment had to do with going all the way back to a comment uh, Tim made about the information in the scoping report being in the profile. And typically it is. Because usually when we're doing this, we're writing a scoping report, that's what we consider screening research. So it's just the beginning. Is there enough information 
and is the story compelling enough that we should continue? And if it's decided that we continue and we actually do a profile, anything that was significant in the scoping report ends up in the profile. So it does become public. So the scoping reports are our internal way of doing preliminary research. And once we make this, you know, especially once management makes decisions that we move forward, it all becomes public. So I want to check in. We're, we're running out of time in this, in this topic, but I want to make sure we've given the department the answers they need. So we've talked a lot about several of the questions. Um, there's a couple we've hardly touched on. So one is um, where the chemical hazards have been well documented by other authoritative organizations, to what extent should DTSC um, rely on those? Um, and I believe it was Anne suggested some um, basically actually formal, maybe being a little more organized and formalized about ranking what DTSC thinks about those organizations. And um, you implicitly said in that the, um, how recent the review was, so recognizing that the literature can change. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, do other folks have thoughts on that? Is there any disagreement with this? those thoughts that Anne provided. Okay, so lots of head, head nodding. Mike's got something to say. Yeah, sure. Can I go green? Yes, okay. So so I, I absolutely agree with, with what, what Anne was saying. I, I do, if, if there are, is going to be reliance on other agencies or authoritative bodies, what their analysis was, I just think that DTSC then needs to be open to the responsible entity coming back and saying, yes, we know that's how they evaluated it, but here are our thoughts that are counter to that. If they're not going to do their own evaluation, then be open to a discussion on why someone might disagree with some of those points, um, because it's going to happen. Yeah. But mostly, so I saw a lot of head nodding on that one, so I don't think we need to beat that one anymore. And then the other one... Um, but the department asked what are the potential problems with relying on a few key papers rather than documenting a more comprehensive review. And I heard some arguments about a few key papers is better. I heard some arguments that not mentioning everything else is not good. Um, I'm not, I, that, so they, they were really asking us what's the problem with doing that. And I, so I just want to see if folks have thoughts to share on that topic. Back to the point of, of being able to, um, y y what you don't want is for something not accounted for to get used against you. It just makes more sense that you're always, even if you disagree or even if you think it's junk, you say, we disagree with X paper or we think Y paper is junk. It, it just, it's, it's, it proves that you know it exists. You have some argument why it's not persuasive to you. And it, it just is a protection against anyone else trying to use it against you in some argument. Does anybody else have anything to say? Yeah. I want to ask, what, is, what does it mean to re rely on a few key papers? Does that mean to discuss a few key papers, even though you've looked at many more? Or does it mean pick out a few key papers and substantively rely on them? Because if it's the first one, then I think that's fine as long as you show people you read the. If it's the second one, I think that's problematic. So I'm assuming it's the first. Um, well, again, this can be interpreted a few different ways. I know at least in one of the profiles they focused on some key authoritative body reports and didn't necessarily do a thorough literature review of primary literature. And I can chime in that um, and then in the... Um, Hazard trait regulations that we that are referenced in the safer consumer product regulations. There actually are <clears throat> groups of have hazard traits, and then they have evidence. Strong evidence uh, consists of X. Suggestive evidence consists of X. So we can actually meet the letter of the regulations by citing, um, you know, an ATSDR tox profile and be done. I mean, we, that that would be that would meet the regulatory criteria, and it just depends whether there is such report, but we typically don't just rely on that. And but it takes time not to just rely on that. So is the question here really, how much do we talk about the other papers? 
How much do we even dig into them? Yeah, well, I, I guess because it, it is the common strategy that when you're working on something scientifically, there wind up being a few seminal papers, and the other papers wind up not being as important. But I, I also saw in your systems where it, your, your um, tables for um, tracking the literature and evaluating the literature, I think you actually go through and figure that out and are pretty express about that in your internal documentation. True. And so I'm, I'm kind of wondering if the answer is not already kind of built into your process in that there are a few papers that are resources that are going to be the most important, and you have already reviewed a lot of other stuff, but you think it's less important for a real scientific reason. Is that, is that true? I think it does depend. Like... Uh with doing a review of PFAS and trying to make a case for an entire class, then there may not just be that key paper, those key papers. So we're constantly seeing what's coming out. Well, in that case, this question doesn't apply. So this yeah. question's really only about, you know, do we just grab the seminal paper and move on? And I, I think the answer is no, but we all know that there are a few seminal papers in most places and that the other papers are less important for real scientific reasons. And I think, I think I'm hearing the panelists saying, you probably need to explain at least a little bit of somehow do that transparency. But I didn't hear you have to write something about every other paper. In right. fact, you might be able to use your review process to simply disclose that. Um, to clarify what you're saying, Kelly, are you suggesting that we should point out what the key papers are in a profile? Well, I think you already do that because okay. you're citing them. Right. And, yeah, right. so the, the question you're asking us is here is what's the problem with just citing those and not the others? And right. we're kind of coming out and saying, well, people are going to complain to you about it and or you haven't shown your work. Is, okay. is that about right? Ann? Um, so, Christine, you said in some of the earlier profiles that you didn't cite the primary literature or you didn't actually, well, the staff didn't go through the primary literature? Um, I'm only referring to one specific profile that I'm aware of because... Just to say which one it is. Okay, it's methylene chloride. Okay. <laughs> so methylene chloride <laughs> is well studied. Um, yeah. they, re they referred mainly to authoritative body um, reports uh -huh. rather than digging into the primary literature because they felt like they didn't really need to. Okay. And, and yeah. I don't, I kind of agree with that. Yeah. But with most of our profiles, we're both looking into the authoritative body reports and doing a fairly thorough literature review. And we're not just including the key papers, we're including all of the minor papers as well. And maybe not all of them, but many. So I think that so, goes back to the comment that's come up before, is that if it's a, a well-known hazard like methylene chloride, it's been right. well documented, then that's totally appropriate. If it's a, you're, several things, it's a complex chemistry a, a class of compounds um, like PFAS, then it's appropriate to have the broader literature review. Is that? I think I, I think we're struggling with what this question means. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're sort of we, beating we, this we, one to death. I think you understand what the question means, yeah. and I think you've actually answered it. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I think it might be helpful. I mean, part of the the genesis of the question because we have heard from stakeholders very bluntly, why do you do all this work when all you just you know you could just like cite two papers and. Get on with it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so well that's, that's not a good right. enough reason. Yeah. Right? So, it really isn't. I mean, it's, it's helpful for, to hear your perspective to affirm the, the importance of this and to, to scale it as appropriately, I think. And, and that it's contextual, right? Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. All right. You don't um, need to replicate existing work. So I, I want to apologize to, to Chris and the rest of the team on the next topic that we went a little over on that one, and I appreciate folks' um, patience with that. Um, I, it's, we've got another hour before break, so if you, like me, need to move your body and stand up and sit back down, um, now is the time, and while that's happening, um, Dr. Chris Leonetti um, will be coming forward to talk to us about priority product selection strategies. <laughs> New parts of my feet. I mean, it's just like so unfair. All right. Okay. Are you guys ready? So I think this is the most exciting topic of the afternoon. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> no, no pressure. <laughs> so I like is it green? Is it flashing green? I think it is.
Oh, that's right. Okay. There you go. It's red, green, red, green. Um, there you go. Oh. Dead battery? All right, so thank you very much, and thank you for, for... Yeah, all right, on to the most exciting topic of the day. Um, my name is Chris Lanetti, I'm an environmental scientist with SCP. Uh, so far today, we've heard a retrospective overview of SCP's prioritization strategies, as well as just finished up a, a good discussion on how much information we should include in our priority product profiles. Now we will continue to look forward towards SCP's future efforts, specifically with a discussion on SCP strategies for priority product selection. So to date, SCP has employed a variety of approaches in selecting priority products. Initially, priority products were primarily chosen uh, as a single chemical product combination, such as methylene chloride and paint strippers. However, more recent priority products have utilized a class approach and listed multiple products in one class, such as listing PFASs in carpets and rugs, textile treatments, in food packaging. These two main contrasting approaches are highlighted here on this slide, with one end of the spectrum representing the one chemical across multiple products approach, and the other end representing the multiple chemicals within a single product or product category approach. These different strategies would each provide their own advantages and disadvantages in the priority product prioritization process. For example, the one chemical across multiple products approach would allow SCP to cultivate a deep knowledge of a specific chemical or chemical class and potentially en enhance our efficiency in publishing future priority products after the initial profile has been completed. We can then take advantage of that initial time and resource investment to list multiple future priority products using that first profile as a template. An example of this approach is SCP's research efforts on the chemical class of PFASs. SCP invested considerable resources into creating a thorough priority product profile for PFASs in carpets and rugs, with an initial investment of six staff members, members conducting 13 months of research and writing, as well as a lengthy review process. SCP was then able to apply this original foundation of research and the completed profile into writing a new priority product profile the textile treatments containing PFAS's profile, which is shown here. We were, able, we were able to complete this new priority product profile with a fraction of, time, of the time and resources, utilizing just four staff members and completing the profile in less than a month. This is a great example of how our program can use this strategy to increase our work output. Moving forward, uh, SCP will continue to leverage its internal expertise on PFAS and will be authoring a priority product profile um, for PFASs in food packaging sometime in early 2020, and potentially other future priority product profiles um, on this topic, all while continuing to take advantage of our initial investment and this streamlined process. So the other strategy, the other end of the spectrum, um, is kind of outlined here, where SCP could work on multiple candidate chemicals within a single product or product category. This also would facilitate a complete understanding of that product and might help manufacturers so that they only need to reformulate once without repeat requests from SCP to reformulate between listings. For example, SCP could identify um, laundry detergents as a priority product and we could list our concerns over all candidate chemicals uh, within the different functional use categories within laundry detergents, um, such as on those shown here. The objective of this strategy would, is that the product category would, meet, would be made holistically safer and that SCP would not have to regulate it more than once. Additionally, this approach uh, might be preferable to manufacturers as it would potentially um, decrease the cost associated with reformulating products. So we know that there are many options along the spectrum, but SCP would like to know how it can best identify when to use each strategy in order to have its greatest impact on protecting human and environmental health. So with these strategies in mind, we would now like to open the room to a discussion of the risks and benefits associated with these approaches and elicit some general feedback and suggestions related 
to the future of the SCP priority product prioritization process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there informational or clarifying questions for uh, Chris? We'll start with Elaine and then Tim. Oh, um, maybe I missed this, but I'd like on the uh, multiple chemicals in one product approach, mm -hmm. would that include looking at like greater, like additive effects or greater than additive effects of, of the chemicals in concert, or would it just be looking at each of the chemicals separately? Could, right? Yeah, I think we would want to take into account additive synergistic effects, mixture effects, things like that. Um, but really, the the strategy is just the general identification of more than one can of chemical within the product. But yeah. Elaine, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, so can you just clarify on the, your question number three, what you mean by external efficiencies? Uh, what's it? <laughs> I couldn't hear you. Like, were you uh, external efficiencies. On the third question, you have internal and external efficiencies. So I'm wondering, maybe you could just say more about what you're thinking. Yeah, I think in part, as Chris alluded to, is that, uh, and, and this is a question more than a yeah. knowledge, is that, and Mike might, um, or, or Helen might have a better perspective, is that if we were to say, look at this product and every candidate chemical that we thought was potentially a problem and that as opposed to just one, would that be more effective from the manufacturer's standpoint because they've just been doing, if you will, a holistic AA, uh, looking at how all of those things would be balanced uh, as opposed to just one chemical. Uh, to give you a concrete example, theoretically we could have, when we were looking at the spray polyurethane foam uh, products, we chose to just look at the isocyanates, the A side of, the, of that polymer. Uh, the B side of that polymer contains surfactants and blowing agents and flame retardants. Um, and we theoretically could have just taken all of those and said, look at the whole product. It would have been more rigorous, uh, both on our part and on their part, but it would be sort of one-stop shopping for that product. So that efficiency, because theoretically we might come back later and say, oh, well, we, we dealt with this chemical last year and two years from now we're going to go come back to you on the same product but a different chemical which doesn't seem very efficient, perhaps. So that's sort of the gist of it. Thank you. So I want to follow up and clarify, uh, ask another question related to that. Mm -hmm. um, aren't there some restrictions on substituting a one chemical that you've listed with another candidate chemical? Yes. Um, well, the devil's in the detail. So can you... Pull that string a little bit, and what's your scenario? Why, why do you think that's a problem? No, what I'm getting at is how, to what extent do you need to expressly list other candidate chemicals at the same time that are in the product? Um, because it, fundamentally we're asking, we're putting out a, uh, in a case of a single chemical, mm -hmm. we're making the, the problem statement, if you will, is that it's based on that chemical and exposure. Mm -hmm. Now, looking for the same functional use for a replacement for that, you have to consider that. But if there are other chemicals in that product that have different endpoints, different parts that we don't identify that are not and different, function. different functions, then arguably that's not subject to the AA. At that time. Right. So I think the laundry detergent list was a good one. There's multiple candidate and, chemicals. And, and part of the question, again, back to formula, is that recognizing that in products formulated and manufactured, that there uh, few things are independent of the rest of the things in that product, right? So, or they may be, but particularly in formulated products. So that holistic view might it be something they have to balance. Um, and I'll give you, uh, you, know, you know, well, back to spray foam, which I know a lot about, is that... Um, if you're looking at spray foam for roofing uh, on the B side, um, flame retardants, it matters the slope of that roof because to meet the California fire code, you have to have a certain flame resistance depending on the slope, which means that the formulation that you use on a steeper roof is different than the one on a flat roof. And so it gets very weedy very quickly and the more chemicals you add and the more factors that have to be considered, in the, in, particularly in terms of function and then the exposure side. So. 
Thank you for clarifying that. Simona has been very patient, and then Helen. Oh, just uh, in answer to your question, so even if um, the candy chemicals have the same function, um, if we don't list them together, uh, manufacturers might replace the candy chemical that we list before we get to the regulatory response. Right? Like, for instance, for PFAS, if, if there was something else in there that we were concerned um, and we didn't list it, manufacturers, have, some of them have already switched out. And we don't know to what. Right. <laughs> Helen, thank you. I had a question about um, process. Have you thought about how the process might run differently if you had to run multiple different, very different substances for the same product class at the same time? Would you be trying to hit like all the same timing benchmarks and then however many chemicals you chose, you'd have to run them in parallel? I mean, have you, have you kind of thought through what that might be like? Have we thought it through? It sounds, it could be this Uber AA that had many moving parts, potentially. I don't think we've th thought it through very deeply because it's a little <laughs> mind-blowing. Mind yeah, yeah uh, that's and, kind of what I'm asking. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, this is why we were looking for some insight. Is, <laughs> is that approach even one that um, would potentially be viable? So I, I'm hearing that turning into comment, and maybe we're moving into comments. So do you want to say something about that, Helen? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I can say something about it. Uh, but I actually had, had another question on that, um, which is also, had you have you kind of thought about on your own already formulated products versus um, uh, multiple homogenous material type products like a, a thing article. versus an article versus a formulated product. Have you already kind of thought through that in your own? Most of what we've done has been, well, we had both. I, th I think our thinking has generally been not um, through the lens of those categ categories, but on specific products. Most of the things that we look at come to us for some reason because I think there's a specific problem. We're not um, thinking through that lens of formulated versus manufactured at, at, at a very high level. Why don't you go ahead with comments since I think you've got one. <laughs> then we can move on to that with the rest of the um, yeah, so, so since we were talking about the, that particular point, um, I think it would be very difficult with um, articles. I mean, that's basically it, because the different materials in there are doing different functions, and so you'd ha you might have some pretty different factors. That's not to say that it, it can't be done. Ross clear, clear, clearly does that with six, you know, now however many it is, substances. So it's not it, impossible, but it's definitely harder to do it that way because you're, each one is almost its own, you know, um, its, its own activity. Um, yeah, and I just think that running five or six of these in parallel would just be challenging. That, that's all it is. I mean, not, again, not impossible, but is that the hill you want to? I was going to say die on, but that's not really <laughs> that's not really where I wanted to go with that. But is that is that really how you want to operate? I guess is really the question. It's like, do you really want to be taking this this one product class and or one product type and just safening it <laughs> and then go to the next one? So I'd like to ask other folks to comment on this because this is kind of one of the, at one end of the spectrum, and I'll I want to leap in with I, something just to balance what Helen just said because it's actually a, a very different experience but it's a formulated it's sort of a formulated product when brake pads everyone's gonna laugh I'm talking about brake pads mm -hmm. but they're the, the manufacturers when when I've spent 15 years working with the manufacturers one of their big concerns was avoiding the need to keep reformulating they had done sequential reformulation to take out different ingredients asbestos lead and copper they didn't want to keep going down that chain and that actually stimulated them to do a complete ingredient review, which was a new one for them as an industry, although they've been working within the auto industry structure for a while. So they pleaded that we converse around all the classes of ingredients that they were using because they wanted to do that all at once instead of going one at a time at a time. So it's kind of two, and it's the other example of formulated versus article. 
but I just wanted to throw that out there for people to, to think about, you know, what is the balance and what is practical and right in this situation? Um, I think so. I saw practically every flag go up <laughs> when I said that. I'm not sure who went first, but I'm going to defer to my co-chair because he's my co-chair. <laughs> um, well, we're actually just a very short comment about um, focusing on one chemical of concern versus um, all the possible chemicals of concern in a, a particular product. It's the safer consumer products regulation, not absolute safety. By taking out methylene chloride or taking out MDI, in fact, you are promoting the um, development of a safer product. So I just wanted to make that point. All right. So I think I saw Mike, Becky, Helen. And then Anne's probably going to be next. <laughs> Okay, so it's great. Um, so, so I agree, I agree with all the co the comments. I, I just I I struggle to conceptualize even someone, you guys writing a profile that says we're picking this laundry detergent with every single possible category, and then specifying here is why we're picking and and all the permutations that that profile based on our last conversation. That profile would 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 dwarf anything else that we've looked at, and then writing an AA that says, "Yeah, we we solved this this surfactant component, and so now it's it's less aquatic toxicity." Oh, and by the way, we solved the brightener, which is which is a, a carcinogen, um, and and I don't I don't see how it all meshes that you finally come to an endpoint where you get the right because there are so many different formulation permutations that that even doing that piece, but then with, with someone saying, okay, I'm gonna look at these permutations and see which one works. You know, you, you have to have a product that's functional. The, the point of the regulation isn't to just totally drive laundry detergents out of the state of California. Um, you know, I, 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 I mean, we, we could say, yeah, you're back to the river and you've got a, a rock that you're beating against, but now we found one for dioxane in the water, so the water's gotta be made safer. Um, you know, I, 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 I I love the concept of the approach to spur yeah. innovation. I just can't conceptualize how it would get done. All right. Thank you, <laughs> Becky, then um, Helen, and Elaine. Thanks. Uh, is that working? Oh, yeah. All right. It waits till you ask. I know. <laughs> uh, so w one bit of guidance I might suggest when considering whether to to throw in a couple chemicals would be to focus on products that are have a more maybe more discrete ingredient list and more uniformity. So I was trying to imagine how this would be applied, and the laundry detergent example would be really hard because you'd pretty much have every detergent be regulated because whether it's got the preservative or that particular solvent, you know, you're you're just really expanding your universe. Uh, the example that I've been thinking about a lot recently that could be of interest might be uh, the tires, the zinc in tires. You're already considering that, and I've been tracking research out of the Puget Sound area where they're trying to figure out there may be a tire-derived contaminant or contaminants that's causing some acute toxicity in fish, in particular coho salmon. So if in the next six months or a year, folks can zero in on this contaminant than if you were to decide to already uh, put zinc in tires for this process, it might make sense to put this particular chemical into the process as well. Assuming it's a candidate chemical, you know, a lot of ifs, right? Still very much in development. But uh, the tire manufacturers will often tell you there's only like 15 or 20 ingredients in tires. They're complex uh, items, but and, and that 15 or 20 ingredients at the, that line is a little bit misleading because a lot of these are ingredient mixtures and there's some uh, diversity around additives, things like that, to give the tires different function. But there is more uniformity than, say, laundry detergents. So, you know, just thinking about the, the type of product and the diversity of ingredients could be helpful. Thank you very much. Um, I've got Helen and... Delayed, and I'm at some point. So I wanted to go back to the the, set, to this, um, the point you were making about it being potentially easier for the um, entities. I think that that there is something to be said for that, 
And so I think it's harder on the department probably um, than on the entity because uh, there's just there's so many moving parts to being compliant with this regulation from their side that it starts to get tricky to do lots of different things at one time. That being said, um, I think in some ways it has to do with making a choice about um, regulating a type of product is really what it boils down to. So if you, so if you wanted to um, regulate, all, if you wanted to have this safening of a type of, of a product like laundry detergent, that's basically you making a decision that you're going to now regulate laundry detergent because you're taking it as a class, or as a, as a type of product, a class of product, and then you're gonna to try to take it apart and figure out how do we make that safer. And I don't actually know whether that's fully like, allowed under the, 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 the framework here, but that conceptually, I think that's what it is, right? So in the same way that Ross decided that they were gonna regulate the electronics, what, what materials were in electronics, that was, <coughs> That they had to define what that class of products was, what was in, what was out, you know, what were the materials that they were going to have of interest, and then what was the process for um, looking at new um, and uh, new new substances to be regulated, then also the alternatives. So it's like it kind of turns into a very specific product class or industry class of, of regulation. And I'm not weighing in for or against it. I'm just saying that that's kind of what it would be a decision. If you went in that way, you would be kind of picking classes of product that you would then be much more comprehensively looking at. And that then would, you know, of course, be choosing to not look at maybe other things because it takes a lot of, of focus and knowledge and energy, you know, as you're finding now, right, with your first products. That it's like you actually end up having to learn a whole lot about that industry and about that product. So that was, that was just sort of a thought um, on the, the conceptual change that you would be making in the program if you decided to do products. And this is what you and Art are kind of saying is the same thing, that that, that would be basically trying to say holistically make the product a lot safer. Mm -hmm. And that does seem like a, a, que a question at a number of different levels. Right. It, it, yes. And like I said, I'm, I'm not giving an answer on this. I, I apologize for not having a, a good cogent answer for that. But that, I just wanted to frame the question. It's not really how should we run the program. It's really almost conceptually are we going to be looking at, at whole product uh -huh. as opposed to looking at chemicals. Mm -hmm. because, you, because it changes the way you're going to engage with the industry. It's going to change the way you structure the program. That's a really important point. So I've got Anne, Elaine, and I might step in and say something before Tim so that Tim could be later. I, I love how this works. I was sort of confused about how I was going to do my comments, and then I'm realizing I'm building on both Mike and, uh, and Helen. So thank you for that. Um, so m when Mike was talking about struggling how this, to see how this would actually functionally work, um, and then building on what Helen said, you're, you're making a decision that you're going to take on a certain class of products. I think there's there's conceptually three ways you could go with this, and I'm not making an argument for, one of the, for any one of them. One is to pick on a product or a product class, a chemical class, which you've already proposed because you've put a lot of investment into one, uh, and there's a couple of ways you could expand on that, or one that I'd like to add, which is a functional use class. So colleagues of mine and I have been talking about this for a while, and I'm looking at my list of ideas, and they, they, they're all, you can, don't worry, Helen, they're all formulated chemistries. Um, <laughs> um, because I think conceptually that might be a little easier to do because there are, as, as Becky said, there are potentially fewer complexities and in ingredients. So I'm thinking industrial solvents, paints and coatings, adhesives, performance additives and plastics. We're getting a little more into the manufactured there. But functionally, we know that that's, that functional class tends to have a lot of hazardous chemistry. I think that would be another interesting approach that we could think about. And to Helen's point, it's, it changes the way the department engages with the industry, depending on which way you go, product, chemical class, or functional use. Um, so thinking about the, if you are safening, I like this. I think we have to put that in the regulations now as part of the definition. Uh, <laughs> along with hazardousness, hazardousness, which is actually is in uh, the regulation, which drives me crazy. Um, I, I would suggest something like the nail salon, hair salon product category focus, because you've already put a lot of effort in there, and what we're seeing are regrettable substitutions on function. Um, so I think it may be uh, the idea of like a tire. We have to reconsider, how, 
what what is the final product function and how do you redesign it so that it is non-toxic from the from the get-go. Um, whether or not DTSD wants to take that on, that's, I think, a discussion, you know, we might have in some other context. Um, one other thought about, so to Chris's point about how you can build on the work that you've put on in, in PFAS as a class, um, I wonder if there's some potential efficiency in that investment if you look at the various applications where PFAS, I mean, PFAS is applied in all these multiple places because of its, its core chemistry, right? Um, I wonder if there's a way of an potentially anticipating what the substitute chemistry is going to be for each of those applications um, and looking into what the hazards of those might be. Sorry, that's my most half-baked thought at the moment. So I haven't thought that one all the way through, but is there some chemistry that's going to be applied to achieve the same function as PFAS? And is that going to raise a whole series of questions like PFAS does because of the carbon-fluorine bond? multi-million dollar question. <laughs> so I'm moving on to Elaine. Yeah, okay, so I'm not sure I'm going to be coherent, but I, um, I was thinking about this product category idea. So the chemical class, I think it's, um, you know, to me, it seems like that's just going to be an important direction to move in. How the class is defined, you're going to get a lot. You know, you'll you'll have a lot of interaction on, on that. Um, I am still so in terms of product classes or product categories. I, I just go back to the one point, and I'm not sure again how this factors in, but there are already you know uh, sectors where they have their lists of restricted chemicals and so when they restrict something something else goes in right and so is you know is that potentially I'm not exactly sure how but somehow it seems like thought around that could be useful um, and then the one other thing I'm going to say is that par part of the driver I think my from that you the driver for your wanting to explore these strategies is is about efficiencies or you being able to do more um, profiles and and I or it seemed like that and maybe that's true or maybe that's not I probably should have asked first <laughs> but so then this is just completely not uh, the, separate from your strategy is in your nomination process can you can you do can you do something in your nomination process where you're actually putting out a call for nominations having people come back back again on this kind of two-stage profile where they submit not just the nomination, but they, they do some of the homework around the nomination that's in the same format as what your first stage profile would be. You know, so they're not having to do too much work, but they're having to do some scoping. And then you're looking through those, selecting some number, and going back to them and saying, okay, well, we're going to consider it for a second stage, now you give us a profile. <laughs> so how and does that differ from the petition? Are you? Are that's you what I'm saying. I, I'm saying maybe. So that's what you're calling it. It's not nomination. It's petition. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I don't know that you have any flexibility around that. But it would be you don't. Uh, I think um, the regulations provide the, for the specific petition process, which is essentially that a petitioner has to do everything we would do in the regulations to identify a, a new priority product. So, so they already have to do that. They have to do that. I think what you're suggesting, though, is something that we probably have the discretion that we could do. We could solicit input, right? Um, either as part of the work plan process or subsequently, right? On, in a, in your priority, right. in your uh, information work collection, plan, in your work plan uh, areas, right? And we certainly have latitude because it's not a regulatory process. There's right. not, it's not a requirement, but we could certainly put out. Uh, embark upon some kind of process that would be asking for more information with some work, homework done, to facilitate our thinking and looking in those. And I think we have the latitude to do that. All right, so before Tim goes, I, I just want to throw out there that something that's a little different than, than what I said earlier about the brake pad thing. One of the characteristics that I've seen about safening a product, which really, to me, that, that word drives me crazy because I know there's safeners and fabric treatments. But uh, the, 
just just the idea it, that that tends to be more of a, a voluntary initiative that occurs when a group of companies in a particular industry says, we're going to work on making our products safer, we're going to work on our supply chains, we're going to do a lot of other things about safer alternatives and practices often as a group. And that is not an element that has been funded in your program of late. I know that you've done prior work somewhat in that area. Um, so, so I'll just kind of throw that out there a little bit. But there are other ways of getting there within the structure of your program than regulating all of the chemicals you might want to see dealt with someday in a product. And one is to, to regulate one that's strong and clear and then signal we're concerned about these other ingredients as well. Um, and so they might be future regulations. So, gee, while you're going through all the work to reformulate your product and examine that, maybe you might examine those other ingredients at the same time because then you don't have to do it multiple times if that's your interest. Mm -hmm. If that's not your interest, you may be hearing from us again. And so that was something that I, that my, my take home for this program from the brake pad stuff is really not list everything at once and make them do an AA on the whole thing. But tell them, gee, if you're reformulating here are the other things that have crossed our literature review radar screen that we'd sure like it if you thought about. And I'm learning my experience with the brake industry is they thought really hard about all of those other things and have been handling them at the same time. So that's, that's a thought to just throw out there as a middle ground on that. Um, I want to go to Tim, and then we need to come back and uh, see if there's other discussion about the other two questions, particularly if there's any other strategies. Thank you. I have like uh, four things to say. You can say um, all four. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> and the, and the um, so the, like, the first one is like I really like this idea of looking at more than one chemical of concern in a product, and I um, I think legally it seems obvious. I don't I don't think there's any legal barrier to doing it. I think you could just as easily do two listings, one of a product with chemical A and the same product chemical B, and do them as two. So why not do it as one listing? Um, and I, I think it just makes sense. I was actually kind of surprised to hear so many people kind of a little bit skeptical or down on the idea of making something holistically safer. Because to me, that doesn't sound like a bad idea. That sounds like a good idea. And that got me thinking, so what is the kind of underlying kind of assumptions that are built into that? And I have some guesses about that, which I'll get to in a second. So anyway, from a legal standpoint, I think it... Perfect, sounds like a perfectly legitimate idea. And I think kind of generally from a kind of a 10,000 foot level, it seems to make sense to me if it's done right, which is a big caveat. Um, the second thing is it kind of feel like, so one point was, wow, that's going to be a lot more work for the industry. It will be. Uh, and for the agency, I don't doubt. But I think there's probably also a level of economy of scale there in that you're not going to have to like get up to speed on the industry twice, right? So you're going to get up to speed on the industry and their product, and then now you've got two chemicals to look at in supply chains and stuff. But it doesn't seem like it's going to double your effort. Uh, it will increase your effort significantly, but I think it's maybe not as much as... Uh, and that leads me to this third point about, like, so what does it mean to do it right? Because I think a lot of these things are... Relevant. So here's my guess about the unstated assumptions that are built into skepticism about it, about safening, which is, there's a, I think that there's a built-in assumption underlying that, that what would happen is you'd look at a, a product and you'd list every possible chemical in it, and then you would have people analyze those to gain kind of incremental marginal increases in safety. That, and that's the worry, that... So it's going to be a lot, a lot of effort for very little payoff, right? And I think, so that's something you can control, I think, in the sense of when you're prioritizing, which would be pick ones that seem like they matter. Like, so your brake pad might be a good example of like, so you don't want to, I wouldn't like willy-nilly just say, okay, our new policy now is to list everything and go with it, but rather you should keep an eye out for cases where it seems like Wow, there's there's maybe just two. Maybe start with there's two in here, and we really should kind of like do this at once and and learn that. And I, I think if you pick the case where 
it looks like there's a large payoff in safety. I don't see why, and, and of course, measuring that against the resources and all those things, I don't see why that should be such a, uh, that to me seems like a positive move. Maybe it's not so positive that it should outweigh other approaches that you might go through, right? I think, it, but, but to me, I think it's a good idea. I like it. I think it's very interesting. Here's the, if you're counting, that's three. So here's the fourth, which is on this topic, but goes a little beyond it, um, which is I asked, hey, would you look at additive or greater than additive effects of the listed chemicals? And you guys said yes. And then as I thought about that, I'm, I'm asking, like, why are we not doing that now? You don't have to list. You don't have to, like, actually list two chemicals. Right? Currently, when we list a product chemical combination, and then you ask, okay, what are the hazard effects of that chemical on the exposure, it seems like we ought to be asking people to think about the additive and greater than additive effects of other things that are in that product. And I don't know, do we do that now? It kind of, it's hard to do. I mean, I don't think it's done generally anywhere except, you know, save some pesticides with EPA looking at, you know, cumulative impacts and that sort of thing. So just kind of like to throw another idea out there. Do we look at additive and greater than additive effects now, even with respect to chemicals that aren't listed in the prioritization? We do. Go ahead, Simona. Yeah, so that's uh, one of the factors that we look at, um, cumulative impacts. Um, so we, again, that comes back to the question of, oh, sorry, I didn't that goes back to the question of how much information do we put in our profiles. So one of the things that we do have in there and talk about is cumulative impacts. Um, so we try to find any information that we can in the literature about other chemicals that may have cumulative impacts with the candidate chemical that we're listing. In that same product. In that same product, oh, exactly. Okay, wow. Well, it may or may not be an ingredient in the product. It could be from other Something sources. that's in the environment that's an additional stressor. Right. So you guys are terrific. <laughs> Can I ask, do you know, um, I'm trying to think of an example where that's come up in one of our products so far. Uh, let's think about that. Well, I mean, I, I don't know about chemicals in the same product, but for instance, in the PFAS profile, we have a section about cumulative impacts. And we, first of all, try to talk about the fact that the different PFASs may have cumulative impacts, and that's something that is still... Um, figured out, but then also some PFASs appear to have cumulative impacts with other chemicals that might not be in the product, right? We often don't know what else is in the product. That's one of the things that we're struggling with. I mean, I don't even know how we would go about finding out everything that's in carpets and rugs. You know, um, so we have that um, incomplete information to deal with. But in the... And then I was thinking about, I don't know if this is exactly the concept, but uh, like MDI sen as a sensitizer, or being previously, previously sensitized by something else and then being exposed to MDI. Yeah, and also, like, to that extent, like, uh, maybe in the prioritization you don't know what's in the product, but in the AA, when the responsible entity is, like, looking at the relevant factors and then seeing what the hazards are, you would expect that they would make an effort to find out what the other ingredients are and then think about what the additive effects of multiple ingredients might be. Hmm. It's hard to do. I know. It's, hard to it's very hard to do. That's yeah. why I'm kind of surprised you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> are you have other thoughts there, Tim? Excuse me? Do you have other thoughts? You're allowed to I have many, but none that I'm going to share. <laughs> <laughs> well, that will be helpful to DTSC. So I want to move on to Ann, but I'm also going to ask that we um, tackle these other questions. So I, if, do folks have any? I, I, I heard fairly I, from the earlier discussion and so forth, people seem to think that it's not a bad idea to keep building on the same chemical or class of chemicals as an efficiency mode. Is that not of heads? Um, but please feel free to comment on that. Um, and I, I'm sure the department would be very interested if we have other ideas about different approaches. So um, I want to particularly challenge if you have any thoughts or ideas about different approaches that they would consider to harnessing efficiencies you know, or, or different strategies for, for handling products to, to bring that up. So Anne's next. Uh, I, I think I already said my bit about other approaches. I think the functional use approach would be an interesting one. And you could build off what you've already done. Um, I wanted to answer uh, 
contemplating Tim's question about why why don't we do this? Why don't we force a full a reformulation or a redesign of a product? Um, I, it's technically complex, and then, then I just started thinking through the, the ripple effects on supply chains. We would get so much pushback uh, because it would really shift an industry if we tried to do that. I'm thinking about nail salons or hair salon products. Um, so I think that's our hesitation, is, is the complexity of it and, and the effects it would have in the market, which would be positive, but would we want to take that on? So I think we take that on with some caution. Um, and I also wanted to add to my previous comments about potentially focusing on nail and hair is that uh, hair uh, uh, products, there's a lot of similar overlap in chemistry, so there'd be some efficiencies there, but the key driver there, I think, is the worker exposure piece, because the industry will come back and say, we've tested this for consumer exposure, and that, which is fine. Consumers don't get a 12-hour a day, seven-day-a-week exposure to these chemicals, and that they've never been tested for that. Um, so I had a question, because there's a fourth question in here about... Um, Leveraging other resources, and I don't that see was it. Pulled. I'm sorry, it that was, was pulled. pulled. Okay, yeah. so I have some answers to that um, yeah. because the two, because <laughs> the, the two things you referenced are things that I'm engaged with. So I was intrigued by that. Um, you said uh, better leveraging other resources such as voluntary programs, such as the California Healthy Nail Salon Recognition Program. I think the example that we used um, of of going through that ingredient list and looking to see what what the ingredients were and whether there's still additional chemicals of concern in the safer products. I think that was a very helpful model and I would happily volunteer the California Healthy Nail Salon Program uh, to do that again. I chair the Scientific Advisory Committee for that. I think what's key about leveraging a resource like that is that you get a different perspective. You get the worker perspective, you get people who are in that community that... Um, and then of course I would very strongly put a plug in, I'm going to channel Meg since she's not here. Um, uh, Using, some th using a resource, we have an invaluable resource in the Berkeley Center for Green Chemistry and the Greener Solutions Program. And we also have deep expertise across the UC system and across the, the, universe, the, uh, the state system, state college system as well, that, that we need to take better advantage of. Um, uh, deeper expertise on, on chemistry and markets, I think, and supply chains. So, so you're thinking particularly thinking about supply chain, so where the same supply chain plays, plays in to provide a chemical into more than one product to try to check a lot of ones. Yeah, potentially, yeah. Um, are there other folks with thoughts on these topics? I am seeing a lot of quiet. I think that although it's early, I'm thinking that it might be time for a break and for everyone to go for a five-minute walk circling the I'll wait here and come back. <laughs> um, I'd also kind of like to take this break a little bit early because I am sensing that we may have a little more discussion than we have time for originally on the agenda on the work plan. Um, so with that, I'd request that we come back at 3.20. Welcome back to the Green Ribbon Science Panel meeting, and apologies for the delay. I think the group needed a little couple extra minutes to move their bodies because we were slowing down there, and I think it was pretty successful. I saw a lot of body moving during the break. That activates your brain, according to science. <laughs> so hopefully we'll have incredibly excellent brain activation for this next section. We've been circling around a lot of these ideas on work plan. So I, we touched on some stuff this morning, and we've been building this afternoon's conversation towards this item right now. So I'm actually glad that we have a little extra time in this area. And I'm going to challenge everybody to be thinking about not just what's the scope of the work plan and the regulation, but what's the function of the work plan? What can the department do in this area? You know, think about some of these, these bigger strategic questions that staff have asked us some very good questions um, in this area and are prepared to tee up the conversation. And we'll be starting uh, with uh, Carl Palmer with some introductions. Thank you, Kelly. Um, yes, I'm just I'm briefly going to tee this up. Um, the two slides are just reruns from what you've already seen. One, which is um, the category of the current work plan. Um, and I wanted to just highlight what the requirements for our work plan are in the regulation. The regulation really dictates that we only do three things in the work plan. One,
Other than that, it's quite open ended. We've um, taken the opportunity in the last two work months to uh, and not just explain the, why we picked the category, but to explain even more in more detail some of our policy priorities in terms of how we take the, the variety of criteria we can use and we pick some that we think are going to be more important in that work plan time frame for priority product selection. One thing I would say is that were I king of the forest and go back to rewrite our regulations, uh, I would probably not call it a work plan because I think most of us, uh, when we think work plan, we think of a traditional work plan that has a specific goal, a spe specific scope, schedule, and budget, um, um, and it's sort of methodical, iterative process. And I would put out there that that's not what this really is. This is a an effort, and if you look at um, the initial statement of reasons in our regulations, our intent was in part to message to the variety of stakeholders out there what are these buckets of uh, products that we're looking at to start sending messages that we're going to be entering a dialogue about our concerns in this area, what they might be thinking about, what they can do um, to inform us and to make decisions on their own. And we know that in implementing our, our work plan that we've heard mostly anecdotally, anyway, not directly, um, that some manufacturers see the work plan and the Canada chemical and they go, oh, I'm using that chemical, I'm a potential target, I'm going to start taking action to get out of that and hopefully move to not a regrettable sub substance, uh, but a, a safer alternative. So we've outlined a few questions and it came up earlier in the day in terms of, you know, what is the work plan, how does that, um, how, do, how do we use it, has it been effective, are there things that we might um, do differently in the development of the, the next work plan. Um, and within our discretion, we've got a fair amount of options. It, it, it'll be here before you know it. This uh, will, early next year, start the process of developing the 2021-2023 work plan. So this is timely for us, um, and we want to take this opportunity to be thoughtful about where we're going in the future. So with that, I'll just sort of leave it to the questions we've outlined, and uh, we'll dive in from there, unless anyone has any clarifying questions. So two requests. Uh, first, do you have a slide with the questions? I uh, didn't put the slide with the questions. Paper? I just put the I had the other slide I have is the one with the. Oh, I do. I'm sorry. See, once again, my staff make sure that I'm prepared. Yes. Actually, there's a couple. Yeah. So there's two. There's four questions. Yeah. So here's there. the first two, which okay. is about the effectiveness of this and it and or not. Um, and then also, what are the disadvantages or advantages? of this type of work plan. I would note, too, those of you who were following in the legislature last year, there was a bill, SB 392, which would have um, imposed some changes in our in our process, specifically on the work plan, making it more like a traditional work plan. The thinking, I believe, being that some of the other elements in that bill would I'll give the department additional authority to collect information on ingredients. Um, and with that wisdom, then we would then be more prepared to know exactly what we're going to do when. Um, I think that's worth a lot of discussion in and of itself. But again, uh, the regs are what they are right now. And um, But I think that opens up some other questions as well. I think the other two questions are, um, you know, is it working? When we put this out, are we actually lever leveraging uh, good work by just putting the work plan out and making signals to the industry or not? Um, and then there are certain questions within how we do that. Should we go broader, deeper, wider, um, more narrow? <laughs> um, and then what other formats might we be looking at? Um, and should we look at things like functional use um, and, and signal that? And, because we do have some latitude there. But um, as you see by what I put up earlier in terms of the party products we've already adopted and what's in the works of the seven categories in the work plan, uh, we, there are some categories we haven't done much in. So in the built environment and in the consumer the, um, office products, 
Um, it's not that we haven't looked at certain things in there, we just haven't taken action on that. So again, back to the overriding question for us sometimes is where are our resources best spent? How do we use the work plan to facilitate that and send messages um, as well as identify our um, priorities in terms of decision? That I'll turn it over to Kelly Mark, unless there's questions. Yeah, are there any um, information or clarifying questions? Okay. Um, seeing none, uh, let's move on to the, the topic at hand. So the staff have asked us kind of four big picture questions. Actually, I do have one yeah, now that you've walked all the way okay. back here. Um, the, you and I both um, have, I, early, I earlier and you now in the meeting expressed that the uh, primary reason for this requirement was to signal to the industry what was upcoming. Did, did I say that correctly and is there any other reason for it? Um, I think you said that correctly. That was the primary reason. I think there was a lot of discussion back at the time of the regulations in terms of concerns about the scope of our authority. and. Um, uh, because there are very few consumer products that are exempted from our process, those being pesticides, food, dental restorative materials, medical, devices. medical yeah. devices, that there are still literally tens of thousands of potential products that we could be looking at, and the industry doesn't like uncertainty, um, and we thought that there were benefits to sending signals of who we were going to be working with um, and the type of information dialogue that would, would be uh, coming forth in the next three years. So that would that was to lend some certainty to our discretion, I think. And is there anything that, other than money, that would uh, prevent the department from doing other things with this document? Um, can you, when you mean other things with this document, like? Include things that are not required by the regulations, but that might be helpful in various other ways. Why don't you make suggestions and we'll tell you whether we think we're comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I've made a couple this morning that I'll make this Well, happen. let me just look, riff yeah. on my earlier point yeah. was is that we, we in the work plan, uh -huh. went beyond the requirements in the regulations. We, yeah. we thought it was important, given these broad categories and the multitude of factors um, that we can consider, to send some signals about those which we think are some of the most important um, and that we would focus on. Um, and so like looking at children or a, a, a practical example is the first three products we did were all human health um, concerns. So we are, do con are concerned about uh, the environment in general. And so we said we're going to be looking at the aquatic environment because we're concerned about that. And so you can see that some of the products that we're putting into the process now are directly related to concerns about impacts on the aquatic environment. We have a lot of latitude. Yeah. Well, you talk, Carl talked about legislative intent, intent for the work plan, and that was your question, but I will just say that a lot of people have uh, looked at the work plan and uh, postulated that it might be a tool for work. I'm just putting that out there. We're informed, and I um, see, I'm going to go with Mike, I didn't see who went first, so I'm going to go with Mike before Tim, so Tim doesn't have to. And so, so I'm going to start with maybe it's a clarifying question, but if I recall, the, the, the first work plan was much more specific on product to chemical than, than subsequent, that, that you, you did broaden it out as, as work plans, as the work plans developed, right? Well, I, the way I would describe it is that in the original work plan, we put more examples of things that, yeah. that could be looked at. Um, and what happened in practice was that a lot of folks that were related to those examples took it as, oh, we're, we're doing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we didn't intend to say those were ones we were definitely doing. We were saying these are examples because we, even though we said in there that all of the candidate chemicals are options mm -hmm. and within a category, every product is an option. 
we just were giving examples of, to try to do what the reg said, which was say, why are we looking at this? And we had some examples. So in the subsequent work plan, we took out some of that specificity because we, we didn't want to send messages that, that um, m some people assumed we had predetermined where we were going to go at that level because we hadn't. Okay. It, it, that's what, so so I, I think, you know, and you commented that, that part of what you saw was, was a, an activity by industry to say, we, we saw these examples and we're just going to take it out, and you're hoping that when they took it out to, to exit that they did something not regrettable, um, which would be my hope. To me, I, I, I think there's that, that negative, but there's also the positive of you've kind of given industry notification of here's what you're looking at, and, and if they start taking action, and you've not formulated something yet, you can go back and, and change how you're formulating it. Um, and also you've got a lot of, of industry that's very small that doesn't necessarily do their own formulation. Mm -hmm. So you've kind of put them on notice of, you better go find out whoever's formulating this for you, what they've actually put in it, and you might be manufacturing with mixtures and not know because you're a small little mom and pop shop, but you're still accountable. So I, I think there's value to allowing industry that, that option um, to, to go in and, and look things. Um, so I, I thought that was very effective. What, what I'd, I'd kind of like to see in a way changed is, is, and partially this already done, but I, as you look at the work plans, it just seems that they grow and you leave, leave things in there. Um, and there's not a lot of taking things back out. And what I'd like to see is as things get left in there, because your limited resources, you can't keep focusing on everything, is, is an explanation of this, this category is staying, and here might be a new focus of why it's staying. Or if there's something, because I think the, the, the fishing tackle got taken out, you know, maybe an, an annotation that this item was taken out, but just more clarification of, of here's why we're looking at this differently. It's not just a carryover. Um, and if it's, if it's not changed, just saying the following categories are retained from the previous work plan, um, I, I think it just offers a little bit of clarity. All right, some suggestions on approaching the provisions of the work plan. So I see Tim and then Elaine. So I have like a clarifying question and a half. And then, depending on what you say, I have a comment. Either way, okay? So here's the clarifying question and sort of, so um, like um, in your question, or like in the lead up to it, you talk about, you know, the work plan doesn't have scope, timelines, and deliverables. Can you say a little bit more about what you conceive of or the people who make these comments conceive of in terms of Timelines for what and what kinds of deliverables? Like, what is the scope of stuff that the alternative you're asking us to comment on, the conventional work plan? What would that look like? Um, well, I'd back up a little. I'm not, we're asking that sort of because we've heard from some folks that want that. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not proposing that. I'm just oh, open yeah, to I that. Oh, yeah, I understand. Um, and I would say that one of the things that we were hoping to do today is give you some insight into our processes and our project management culture. We, um, so for example, um, we, all of those projects we've talked about today have very defined work plans, timelines, deliverables, expectations. Um, and that's an internal thing. Uh, so we might find some way to, at some point, in some mechanism, be more externally sharing that information as the things that we roll out. It I, might not be in the work plan, but certainly we would be open to hearing um, if people thought that a different type of work plan would have benefit. Um, so okay. I'm not so, sure that answers your question. Yeah, but, it does, actually. Yeah. And actually, my comment kind of is parallel to what you said, because it's kind of struck me like, well, like the design of the work plan ought to kind of, to me, should be dependent upon what your goal of it is and the impact of preparing it is. So it, it struck me that maybe when you prepare the work plan currently, assuming that it does the thing you want it to do, which is the first question there, like assuming that, right, that that kind of sending that signaling that you're doing that maybe before you know enough to create these timelines and deliverables that you're going to do for each of your projects, yes. right? So to me, it seems that if you think the work plan, as conceived of now, serves this purpose, 
then it shouldn't be changed or rushed to give timelines that you're not ready to give yet, which leads me to your suggestion, which is, it, to me, it, it seems legitimate that people would want to know what's going on with a little more specificity than they do now, or at least that there ought to be a more common... My guess is that some people who are persistent and kind of interact with you a lot, have a better sense of the timeline and deliverables than people who are kind of like feel on the outside and don't interact with you. Mm -hmm. So by making, once you're comfortable and you feel like you have timelines and deliverables, by making them more generally available, that kind of evens playing field for everybody. Everybody feels more secure, but you haven't rushed or changed a very valuable work plan concept in order to address that. You can address that at the appropriate time and in a different way. Um, that all assumes that you think it's doing, that first one, that you think it's doing what you hope it's doing, which to me, um, or this, oh, is it achieving its goals? That second one, to me, seems to be an empirical question, which, you know, people probably have anecdotal views about whether it is or not, but if you really wanted to know that, it seems like maybe you should design a... Uh, kind of some type of empirical study to figure that out. Right. Thank, Thank you. you, Tim. Let me just comment, too, and it's related to Mike's comment, too, is that one thing we haven't talked much about is we spend a fair amount of time, mostly historically Meredith before she, what do you call it, got, a, got <laughs> ascended. Um, I'm not dead. <laughs> okay. Um, but we, we spend a a lot of time talking to industry trade groups, uh, advocacy groups, and others about what we're doing and, uh, across the board. And some of that, uh, back to link to one of Kelly's earlier comments, um, for example, the clothing industry, when we had clothing in the work plan, they've uh, got a, has spent a lot of effort over the last several years on developing restricted substances lists and uh, MSLs and things like that. And those started out largely as lists of, of chemicals uh, that were regulated. It was, it was solely lists that there were regulatory requirements. They've evolved into that looking more broadly into uh, looking at things like our work plan and emerging contaminants and things to, and to give them credit and other trade organizations trying to be more proactive about looking at what's coming. And so the, the work plan, I think we've done a lot of work in communicating that and it's part of a growing awareness in industry uh, and the markets just kind of writ large of awareness about green chemistry and about uh, exposure to chemicals and products. So I think in some sense, we, we don't have, your point's a good one, could we get some metrics and some data that would support how effective it's being? Certainly. Um, uh, Tim, I just wanted to kind of pull the string a little on your idea. So that the, the way that might look is we put out the work plan without dates, and then in some other document, maybe be a little more transparent about now that we've chosen this product, here's what the what the work plan is for this particular topic or whatever it might be that we're We call it something else. Implementation plan. Are you asking me yeah. that? Um, so I would say, I'm get, yes. Um, and I think one thing would be, you. Um, I was thinking about, okay, once you put a deadline out, then people are kind of like gunning for you on that deadline, and if it slips, then it's like, and there's more, and I had two thoughts about that. One is, it seems like you guys have established a really terrific infrastructure and management system to kind of track things and stay on, but I think it would be important to make sure that those deadlines reflected kind of cushion and realistic assumptions, and then you know, it seems like you're tracking it. So if it looks like you're moving off a deadline, it seems like you could let people know. You, I think it's more effective to tell people what you think you're going to do, and then if it changes, to tell them rather than to for people to like not know what's going on. And then I think for them, it makes it seem worse. Like it's directionless, you know. So, um, but it seems like you ha you're building the ability to do this, and and yeah, probably creating some uh, generic milestones of importance would be seems to me like it'd be a good idea or you're already doing that letting people know you're doing it seems like it would be a good idea christine why don't you follow up on that yeah i have a, a comment because i think it's challenging to share timelines um, from a project manager's perspective and a research scientist because if we're looking at a certain
product category. And we, like, we've identified a certain product in particular that we're going to look at, but we don't know specifically which candidate chemicals we want to look at yet. So we do some preliminary research. Well, I can say it's going to take five weeks to figure out, you know, what the chemicals are, but now, but up front, I don't know how many there will be. So the amount of time it's going to take to research three chemicals versus ten chemicals is significant. So even though I know I may be looking at product X, I can't tell you how long it will take the team to do the research for product X in advance. We might wait until we're ready to, to, to start sharing those. Yeah, I think Tim's making a really important point in that a lot of other agencies will give you a kind of a crystal ball on stuff that provides a little more transparency than the department has been providing. I mean, until you get to the workshop profile stage, there's nothing out there. And that's something that has caused a lot of reactions. And Tim's, I think, proposing that there be something that's more crystal ball-like that's before you get to the formal rulemaking calendar that you have to provide the state every year. Am yeah, right? but balanced, like Andre's point, I think is important along the balanced like you would create it when you're fairly comfortable, you know where you're headed, right? You don't, you wouldn't kind of rush doing it. And I'm, I'd also say you don't want it to be like, it's not like a, what are they called, Gantt charts? I mean, you're not going to give somebody yeah. that. You're going to be like the major milestones, give them major milestones and that sort of thing, just so they have a sense that they know there's being progress and things are moving along and when to expect stuff. And it doesn't have to be all that precise, just maybe in the second quarter or something like that, maybe. Well, I, I'm the last guy. I, you should not be asking me about project management and deadlines <laughs> because uh, I'm an academic, which means, you know, at a certain point in our careers, deadlines t take less, have less importance, so we blow by a lot of deadlines, right? So don't ask me how to set up a deadline. You guys are much better at that than I am. As an example, going at what you're saying, uh, the EVA, EPA Office of Pesticide Programs uh, puts out a crystal ball schedule for when it's going to release uh, risk assessments, so scoping documents, risk assessments, proposed decisions. Um, it, it puts out a, a, a calendar for the next calendar year, and you know, they're, they're, they do lots and lots and lots of them, and it's a crystal ball. Do and they under-promise and over-deliver? They, um, they over-promise and under-deliver every <laughs> single time. <laughs> but there's a reason for that. And one of those reasons is science, particularly when it comes to getting to the risk assessment, which is the, you know, it, it, not exactly the equivalent of the product profile, but it is in terms of research and what's going on, is they put something out there and then they discover they need something else that's going to take a while to get. And they change that. And that's okay. So, so that's, that's one of the things that I think is really hard as an agency it, it, you feel like you can't put something out there until, you know, I, I worked in government, I got told that mm -hmm. I couldn't put anything out publicly unless I was 100, commit to anything unless I was 100% sure, sure I could deliver it before the date that it was out there. So I, that's, that's the cultural challenge in asking for this kind of thing. So I, do other folks have thoughts on this kind of schedule question? This, this has been a, a very big conversation outside of this room. And I think folks and the science scientists recognize the challenge in, in coming up with a schedule for activities that involve some unknowns in terms of science. So, um, and, and, and so Elaine, I've been holding you off for a while, but if you want to say something, and Becky, please do on this, and then we can come back to, uh, to your other question, Elaine. You can leave it up. I think it's on. So, um, <laughs> it's green, it's on. Oh. There's a little button on the side. Hey, Tim's. Oh, it's on. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't ever, don't ever throw a mic. Cause the people You're right. The I know. I, I know. I panicked. Are... I panicked. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was me. There's a whole that. bunch of people who are really mad. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah. I um, so as somebody from science side of an organization who's under, under no regulatory pressure whatsoever. Um, we, we do now have, um, I don't know, 
we we have Gantt charts or whatever. We have we have we have people imposing all kinds of schedules on us. But um, so w one thing that I um, I'm wondering about because I keep looking at some of your language and I'm sure I'm interpreting it way outside the box of where you're wanting to go. But in terms of leveraging authorities and sending the signals, you know, you're to in industry of what you may or may not be thinking about is um, almost some kind of tiered <coughs> signals. So if you're giving, if you're giving um, insight into what you're working on, you know what you're working on, right? So some of that you'll be able to drop in and say, here's what we're working on. And then you know you have these other sectors or product categories or things that you're interested in learning more about, but... Um, well, no, before that, you know what you're working on. You know what chemistries are particularly of concern um, in terms of classes and function, um, and you can state that. That's not going to be anything new to anybody. If those industries are not aware, <laughs> they should be. Um, and if, you know, if you're able... Um, and then, the, then there's this like next category of, of there's a products that you know are important and understudied, and where they're really um, uh, sparse information. And maybe what you want to signal is either that um, industry should be aware that this is on your radar and um, that you may put out information calls or do some kind of voluntary, you know, that, you, that maybe what you're wanting to do, and I don't know, again, under your... Band, you know, within your bandwidth and within your authority, can you then tier that as um, we're going to go, we're, we're concerned about these, we don't feel comfortable, we have enough information to really act, but we want to get you guys on board and do something voluntary or do some other kind of um, information gathering. And so then I think it'd be easier to put some timelines, you know, whether it be year one, year two, year three, even as crude as that, what are these, they're three-year plans. Mm -hmm, yeah. So you know what you're going to get done in year one. You have a pretty good idea. Do you know by, I, I wouldn't put in by what quarter you're going to get it done. I'd say year one, you know, we know we're working on this. Year one, we're going to do something here. Year two, these are the, you know, these are the chemistries of concern. And so we're, you know, going to start ex what we are exploring and just put it on your radar, these other high areas of concern. And then you know, year three, we're hoping to be getting back enough information that we can start doing something on those product categories. Is just one possibility. Mm -hmm. Becky, did you want to comment on timeline or? Yeah. Okay. yeah. I, I always put into my um, uh, product, my deliverables, I already always put in the things I, I'm already <laughs> mostly done. <laughs> 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 yep. That'll be next year. <laughs> Index finger on the works the best. No, no, oh, no. did I get it? All right. Okay. <laughs> Just very briefly, uh, I I follow some of the some other government agency deadlines uh, forecasting, like Kelly, and uh, I'm not sure I've ever seen one met. So <laughs> just in the, the stuff I look at, and whether it's the tricky science questions or a new issue pops up and resources get reallocated, I mean, I'm sure there's legit issues. Also, um, leadership review can throw things for a loop. Um, so I guess it's, this is more of a question to, to folks who actually make and produce things. Is, is an unreliable deadline better than no deadline? I don't know. I, yeah, so, my my opinion, yes. You know, ha having having a stake in the ground, even if you know you're not going to meet it, is is better for everyone involved, so that they're all working towards it. And then open discussions about why you're not going to meet it, and then you change you change the deadline. Okay. Other is my opinion. Yeah, I, it's actually related to the comment I was going to make, which is that. I think an unreliable deadline actually is better than no deadline because I know this is shocking news, but California is not the only jurisdiction in the world 
<laughs> and, and so any company that operates in multiple jurisdictions has to decide where and when and how we engaged and engage in things. And so it's really helpful to, to say, oh, on November 20th, I have California doing this. And on, you know, December 1st, I have Norway doing that. And so I have to have a person here at that and I have a person there at that. Mm -hmm. And so I think there is still something to that. Some, not having any sort of deadline basically means we don't look at it, not because we don't want to, but because there's always something on fire somewhere. And so I think it's just a practical thing that if, if you're hoping to get the sort of casual, hey, hey, baby, you know, I, I don't think that that's actually going to happen because we're off like somewhere else, you know, putting out a fire some, in some other jurisdiction. So that, it's, that was actually going to be the comment anyway. And I want to add on to that before passing it to Art to just say that it's my experience that if you've got something out there with a timeline, people think it's real. And that signals not just your industry, but also your other stakeholders and academics, your other people you want information from. Oh, we better start sending these people the information we have or get ready for discussion on it. Whereas if there's nothing out there, there's no way to, for them to prepare. And then you wind up with very little preparation time before the workshop. So there's not the same length as if you have you know six months or a year to think about it. Art? Um, uh, so I agree with Mike and Helen in terms of having some type of, let's say, flexible or even unrealistic uh, timeline is a, or deadline is a good thing because it gets that issue on the radar. Uh, that's just important to do. And in terms of specifically how it's related to safer consumer products, um, you know, um, part of it, you guys have a lot more flexibility than other regulations when it comes to the so-called deadline or mm -hmm. timeline. So make, take full advantage of it. And the part that I, gets, I find kind of amusing is that um, how uh, you guys are struggling with deadlines. So in industry, if we have a product launch, trust me, those deadlines will be met. <laughs> That's just how it is. So given the fact that you guys don't have that you know, same kind of um, pressure requirement, take full advantage of it and just uh, do what you think would be best for the state of California. Mike, you want to build on that? Yeah, just another, uh, and it, it maybe it goes back to thematically what I was saying before, way earlier today, but, but with, with deadlines, I don't think you have to look at the work plan and say, oh, we're, we're setting a deadline for this product category and we're going to have something by then. You can say these are our product categories and kind of do what Elaine was, was, was saying. These are the ones we're going to look at first. But then if you have a, a, a schedule of when you're going to make decisional meetings, you know, if you do that once a month, if you, I don't know, maybe you do it ad hoc, I don't know. But if you say, yeah, and, and every month we will uh, deliver a brief synopsis of our decisions for discussion and create deadlines that are based on milestones in, in your process rather than specific products, that might be a, a way to kind of build some structure and give people something to respond to because then they know, okay, every month I need to go look at your website because you're going to announce your decisions or whatever. It might just be a different way to look at the deadlines. What I'm hearing coming out of this discussion is not that the work plan is necessarily, in fact, and maybe that it's not the right place for some sort of scheduled transparency, but there seems to be a lot of consensus around the value of providing some sort of scheduled transparency, some sort of what we're working on. Do you want to say something here? I just, I want to put this in the larger challenge for the department, if I could, just because this is a challenge for so many things the department's doing. Right now, for instance, the department is trying to figure out how to take into account cumulative impacts and community vulnerability in our permit-making process. And we're wrestling with all sorts of regulatory framework questions, fundamental questions about how you do that. And that, I mean, this is a, that's a heavy lift. And we haven't communicated. We had a lot of workshops early on, and then the team is working through different concepts one at a time, and there's radio silence out there. And so, understandably, when there's a void, people are going to fill that void by either thinking nothing's happening or thinking something the worst is happening, right? 
And so this whole conversation to me is very, um, it resonates on a larger challenge for the department. I mean, that's a big criticism of the department. It's not transparent. And so I just want to express appreciation for giving us some practical suggestions about how to provide that transparency along the way. Um, I think there, there are ways to do it. Yeah, and, and it, it, with that context, actually, that makes a lot more sense, and it resonates personally with me because sometimes I'm working on heads down types of analyses and project and on projects like writing a white paper or whatever, where where I do have a hard deadline at the end, but my intermediate work progress needs someone needs to know if I'm in trouble, if I need help, you know, where am I? And so um, back to Mike's idea of like um, a an, um, an update that happens no matter what your state, mm -hmm. that might be very helpful. So, or like the way I the way I handle it on the on the white paper, for example, is every four hours I tell you what I'm doing. It's like, and I, and I will have like the time stamp and like this is where I am, or this is the state of the document at 4 a.m. or whatever it happens to be. <laughs> and um, even though, you know. After it's done, no one cares about any of that stuff. But in the meantime, my boss is not freaking out, going, "Is this done?" Right. You know, or, or you know, have, has she passed out? And and it's not, and nothing's <laughs> happening, right? <laughs> so, um, if that's really the concern, I think that that's the way to go. Is that there's just status, status, status at some regular interval, and then, and that will it'll take care of itself. So that's the same reason I call my 92 year old dad every day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, seriously, it's the same kind of thing. Alive? Alive? Is he okay? <laughs> Mental state? <laughs> I love you. Okay. Those things. Um, so I want to take the conversation in a different direction because I think we've beat that one pretty thoroughly. Um, and ask a question about goals. So, like, written motivation and the motivation for the work plan has been one specific piece of transparency. And I'm wondering, and I'm going to throw some ideas out there, whether there are some other things the department could get from going through this work planning process that it has to go to to get to the work plan. And so I'm going to throw some stuff out there and also just give you guys the chance to comment on not just my ideas, but overall whether there's value in some other kind of look forward stuff to being done by this program. So uh, one of the goals of, of the work plan is transparency, but it has really only been around what products, categories are we going to look at. Uh, but there's other kinds of transparency that could be afforded through a work plan. Um, another um, potential goal of the work planning process could be to afford a broader public input of a variety of types uh, from academics and NGOs and industries that have some laggards that they'd like to have competitive advantage from and so forth about what product chemical combinations really are ready. Because um, I, what I saw in the, the, the thing that actually disturbed me, of, of all the wonderful things you sent us, there was one thing that bugged me, and that was the, a list of product chemical combinations that you started investigating. And for me, that was a real bummer because I felt like it was kind of catch as catch can. And I'm, so I'm thinking the work plan might be the, a way to have some sort of more systematic process for figuring out what you might start with. So it's still a public input process. There may be a different systematic process you might prefer to pursue. But I'm just throwing that out there as should we be thinking a little more and maybe not even for the next three years, but about what, what product chemical categories are important or to be teed up or should we be looking into for future work plans, that kind of stuff. Um, signals for folks other than industry, we've been talking about that in terms of, of the scheduling here. Um, I'd also like to mention longer term priorities for California as a more general thing. So uh, you're only required to go with the product categories that you're going to look at. But I know that the state has chemical priorities. PFAS is a glaring example of that. And if the department were able to come out and say, we're going to work on PFAS in products, that has a lot of repercussions around all of your fellow Cal EPA agencies and the legislature and the public, because suddenly they have confidence that the state is tackling this problem at that fundamental source level. 
So maybe or maybe not. That's something you want to do. Just throwing out that out there as a potential. Can I ask a clarifying question sure. on that? So for the most part, even within Cal EPA, each board or department has its specific authorities and mandates and resources mm -hmm. aligned towards those things. And PFAS is a great example. We have a lot of collaboration going on, but Water Board has their thing, DTSC has different things, ours and our cleanup folks. Um, your suggestion sounds like a good one, but how do you bridge between um, this concept of a statewide chemicals policy perspective for a program which has, doesn't have that authority? I'm, or, go ahead. No, you go. No, I'm thinking only that we're looking at the product contribution piece of it. So something that I, I hear over and over, I've seen fact sheets written. It's not our fault. It came from somebody else. It came from someplace else. Okay. And if, so, if the department were willing to signal, we're going to look at that source control, product, pollution prevention, whatever word you want to use, part of it, it changes the conversation a little bit in a lot of other ways. And it may or may not something be something you want to commit to. But if it is something that you want to commit to, putting it out in a work plan signals groups other than the industry of something going on here. And I would just add that I think we have more power and agency to drive some of that than we have taken advantage of. So first of all, I think um, there is an initiative. This is a new administration, and one of the things they're really looking at is how to leverage the power of all the BDOs to make the sum greater than the, the whole greater than the sum of the parts. So how do we have kind of a one Cal EPA where we're taking advantage of it, using it as an opportunity to have a bigger impact? And so that's a very active conversation that's going on right now. And I think... DTSC, for instance, could be a convener to, to say, okay, the governor has made a priority around drinking water. We're going to bring together all those agencies that are touching drinking water, have them help us come up with a problem statement that could, you know, that's related to source control and pro product-based source control, and then turn our attention to that. So I, to me, I think, I think it's feasible. It's not... You know, people do look through that lens, but I think we have the potential to pull them out of their silos. But I'm optimistic. Meredith was apparently reading over my shoulder because the <laughs> they, I, I, I gave a chemical example, and the next example I was going to give was, was a policy priority around drinking water. Um, because, and this is why I mentioned this morning when Meredith wasn't here, but the um, wastewater and, uh, and um, urban runoff our future water supplies here in California that we're having to drive towards. And there are a small, Dr. Doherty has actually been making me think a lot more about the small group of chemicals that could pass, that would be persistent, mobile, and toxic. So therefore pass through the treatment barriers uh, that are available there that wind up being ones that are important for making those, those future water supplies safer. So for example, the department could also signal we're going to take a look at products and are trying to identify chemicals and then products that are made sources of those because our long-term vision is to play our role where it's appropriate to help make those future water supplies safer. So that's something that's, that's just an example of something that could be part of our plan that is not now. And then I'll wrap up with yet another potential approach um, that saying we're interested in this chemical, but we don't know what the major exposures are, the major sources are. So I, having um, in your work plan or somehow signaling the need for information for stuff that you might tackle in the future, then it, that's one example of how you might stimulate research. You know, give, us, give us what the products are associated with these exposures. That would be really helpful. So I'm just throwing out that this is a very different set of goals. It would not be required by the regulation. And so I'm throwing that out and also wanting to challenge panelists um, to respond to some of these ideas and present their own. So Anne, you're up. Probably by the end of the day and a half, I'll have figured out how to use the microphone. Um, thank you, Kelly, for, for taking that conversation in another direction. I just wanted to, to strengthen your idea of, and Meredith's idea also of DTSC stepping up and being a convener around uh, a chemical issue that touches a whole lot of different environmental media. 
Uh, Gina Solomon and I pulled together a group of NGOs last fall for recommendations for Governor Newsom. Uh, we didn't know he was going to be governor then for sure, but it was fairly, uh, came up fairly quickly after that. And one of the strong recommendations that came out of the public health world was lead, for example, that we could still collectively put lead on the, on, and PFAS was the other example of how we could, you know, bring all the agencies together. Some of them are working in disparate ways, some are working on these issues and some aren't, but to, to really highlight, as, as Kelly says, this is going to be a problem for California. It is, in, it is now, and here's what we're looking at in the future. I really like this idea of looking at our water resources and what we need to do to make them safe going forward as they're going to be uh, tighter. So I, I would strongly recommend that, that DTSC take on the agency, agency with a small a, uh, <laughs> The, the idea that you have more agency that you could pull together your, your fellow colleagues and your fellow agencies to, to work on a long-term long -term vision and maybe just start that conversation and say, what, what do you all think are the long-term uh, priorities for environmental health from your different media uh, and public health exposures? Um, I'm going to take this a little. So uh, I'm going to go in a slightly different direction. So we had this question of... Um, what, what are the impacts of releasing this work plan? And, and we have, I think all of us have this anecdotal idea that um, putting out this list of products of concern, the functional uses and the chemicals that meet those functional uses has some impact in the market. Is it worth pursuing, and is this DT something that DTSC should do? Is it worth pursuing? To, it's, it's hard data to gather, uh, but it would be really helpful in, as a feedback loop to what kinds of goals you want to set. Uh, when you're putting a work plan out, if you want to have that intention and have that be a little more intentional, um, is it actually happening and how is it happening? I don't really know how to measure that or how to gather that data or who should gather that data. So I'm just throwing that question out there. Maybe somebody else has an idea. Um, this last question about uh, different formats that might be more effective, I just want to put a plug in because I am the functional use person on the panel. Um, we, we talked about this in, in this morning as well as we're thinking about you know making pushing a signal to say that this whole product has troublesome chemistry and may need to be redesi redesigned. I'm thinking again about the nail salon idea that we take one chemical out, but the functional use requires another toxic chemistry to come in. Um, so I would push for more functional uses, but I think we'd need a little more thinking about what the p potential impact of that might be. I, I have liked this. I think there's a nice balance between when you put out your work plans and say these, this is the product category, these are the individual products we're concerned about, these are the individual chemistries. I think that's a nice balance of we're not going after your particular product, Industry X, um, but this is the things that are raising our concern in this combination of product and chemical category. So I think that's a good balance and should continue. hope that was helpful. Okay, anybody want to follow up on goals approach to work plan, bigger, smaller? Wow, I'm not seeing any excitement there. Okay. So, <laughs> um, so uh, another question that depart oh, Elaine, go ahead. So, um, yeah, no, I just want to just, again, I think I probably already said this, but just follow up on this idea that um, you've mentioned multiple times, really, it today and previously, that, you know, what you do does send signals and there are, you believe, market implications to how people are formulating or changing their products, right? So, um, and how you would get that information and how you would somehow be able to um, say something about whether those changes are beneficial or potentially um, uninformed substitutions. And, I, and, you know, and again, I don't know your full authority, but it does seem like there might be some kind of, and the reason I keep going back to these voluntary things and stuff is you threw in stuff at the end, you know, that other organizations are doing, and, you know, whether it's some kind of crowdsourcing thing or some kind of um, voluntary, you know, call for, you know, those of you who are doing the, 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 the cool thing and you, and you feel confident that it's a, it's a good change, you know, can you, how do you, how do you want to let us know and... How can we help you um, promote it as, as, a, as a positive change without undermining, um, you know, confidential business uh, and, you know, in information? So anyway, I, I do think that um, you, you could potentially set yourself up to collect that information by designing it into your, um, into your goals. 
Link. I just so in thinking about what Elaine had said earlier, and and, and what you said, Kelly, I, I think there's a lot of, of value if we look at, at structuring structuring the work plan to to saying, okay, three years out, here's what we'd like to be working on. And as you were saying, Kelly, you know, if, if you can get people, if, if you say, oh, this this is what the agency is considering, do people have ideas about it? Or objections, you know that that might be a way to kind of hit back to an earlier conversation on how do we set the profiles, how does how do we help the staff with resources and, and less work? Maybe if part of the plan becomes that here's here's our our broad far future thinking, you know we're looking at nail polishes or whatever, and and leave it generic, but what what. Do people think, and it can be industry, it can be NGOs, it could be any anyone interested, but to start to collect information informally, maybe that can inform without it being a data call-in, something very structured, but but if it's part of the work plan and gets people's attention that way, if we're if we're thinking that the work plan's already causing a reaction of, of people to reformulate, then if, if we're giving them something a little less structured, but here's our far farther future. Maybe it's an, it's a, a convenient information gathering tool that can be built in, and then save the folks at, in the program time to pull that together and try and 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 build it later. Just a thought. So you're raising something that's another one of the questions that's here, which is uh, I, this particular I, I think industry folks it would be helpful to weigh in on what what's the reaction that comes from putting out the work plan. I mean, is it your sense that actions are, are, are triggered by the work plan by itself? Or is your sense that very little happens as a result of the work plan, other than perhaps hiring a lobbyist? <laughs> Which I have observed, so I can say that. <laughs> I can't make a broad statement for, for everybody, but again, knowing how we approach regulations generally Probably, unless there's a deadline or a request, there's probably not going to be any action. And if our uh, product class is in there, then they're probably that raises that raises um, the awareness of the regulatory team, compliance team. Um, different groups are going to have different approaches to what they do at that point, though. So I don't think there's one size fits all on that. Um, some much more um, aggressive than others. But being listed as, as a potential, I, I think, does get someone's attention. Um, Helen, does it, you know, when uh, it does get listed, uh, even though the product's not specific to, let's say, the electronics industry or uh, something that your company makes, does that add to the fact that there is increasing uh, public awareness or interest in the regulation of hazardous chemicals in products in general? I mean, that's how I see it. It's, so even though right now the uh, product priority products are not specific to what we make, it just adds another, another um, uh, additional, not pressure, but just, uh, you know, um, Visibility to the fact that yeah, hazardous chemicals in products, that's going to be becoming more and more highly regulated, and that when we're thinking about through design decisions, that it's very much a part of our design, uh, you know, material selection process. So even though it's not specific to our products, the fact that it's happening does um, signal to us that it's becoming more and more important that we should be you know thinking about it at the earliest stage as possible. I have a, I have a question, Art, can I chime okay. in the, uh, related to that? Um, you know, we're aware that a lot of industry leaders, Apple, Nike, HP, others, have strategic plans or goals for sustainability, um, lowering their carbon footprint, et cetera. Is there, do you think it's, there's an opportunity to uh, reach out to see if there's uh, some nexus that we could um, get input from people who are thinking the, along those lines um, in the context of uh, what we're doing. I mean, 
a lot of and a lot of what we see, uh, you know, obviously climate has been a huge focus, and there's a lot of resources, chemicals policy, not so much, but um, it seems like there's more and more that people are recognizing that industry leaders need to have plans, and so the question then broadly is, would it be worthwhile for us to reach out to some of those leaders to say, could we talk to you about? what would be motivating for you in our work plan, or could you give us input of where you think we should go? Just a general question. Um, I mean, yes. We, you know, <laughs> we, we always like to be yes, what we think about things. I mean, that's, that's a thing. That's a human thing. Um, so the, I guess there's, there's, kind of, there's, there's a couple different things in there that I would kind of think about. Um, the, the, there are leaders and laggards, and we have maybe slightly different goals. Um, even among the leaders, we emphasize different things. So that would be something to just consider, that even if you've got two actually really strong uh, environmental programs, they, that we might have slightly different specifics of it mm -hmm. for good reason. You know, we have, that's just normal, right? So um, that, I would just factor that in as you, as you canvas is that you're, you're probably not going to just get one answer, right. even within one industry. Um, we tend to get a little bit more um, consensus in group, but it tends to not necessarily be that aspirational, maybe. You know, uh, because of, again, if nothing else, just different values on the different parts of sustainability. So you might have one group that highly values water, you know, another group that's highly valuing recycled content, you know, and again, these are value judgments as we've talked about before, so it's not right or wrong on, on those. Um, so, you you know, you could go to the more progressive industry groups and, and get a, a read on if there's a consensus. That might be an idea. You know, there may be something there um, on process chemical, for example. Uh, process chemicals are of great interest at the moment in, in electronics, for example, or I don't know, there, there may, I don't want to get too far ahead of my skis on that, but you know, it's like there may be other uh, topics that in the progressive industry type groups, you might have some consensus on some points. Does anybody else want to weigh in on that before we go to Ann and Tim? Okay. Ann? I think I have a sort of related question, so I have a, a clarifying question for Art. Um, so you said the general, that um, listing of a chemical or a chemical class would, would stimulate you to think about that in your, your design decisions. Is it just increasing general chemical awareness or is it something specific like, for example, if DTSC lists phthalates in personal care products, you have the signal that phthalates might be a concern in your product, even though it's a different functional use. And maybe, you know, given what Helen just said, the answer may be different depending on who I'm talking to within the industry, even if they're leaders. Yeah, so, that, I what? actually see it as both. Um, so the fact that, you know, there's a safer uh, consumer products program that came into in existence elevates or leads us to the conclusion that, you know, uh, hazardous chemicals in products, it's becoming more and more of a concern, yep. right? And then specifically, when it comes to specific either chemicals or chemical classes, so, you know, something like, you know, uh, functional use plasticizers. So anytime a plasticizer, even if it's a specific chemical that we might not be using, gets listed on uh, you know, uh, some kind of restriction list and or some type of regulation, then that is another signal that, gosh, we need to start thinking about those chemicals when we're doing the product design and during the material selection process. You want to weigh in, Mike? You look like you're sitting up to do that. Okay, I'm great. Um, yeah, and I, I, I agree with, with what Art was saying. Yeah, we we build our processes to continuously make our, our product safer. Yeah, we're we're looking at that. Mm -hmm. um, but by by DTSC indicating here's what we're looking at. Um, it can help us prioritize mm -hmm. what order we're doing that in. You know, our, our products also do need to be functional for consumers, so it's got to be that functional use that we're talking about. Um, it's, they've got to be cost-effective for consumers, but you've got to take the order in which you're going to work on things. So if, if DTSC, as, an, as someone outside of us, says, mm -hmm. here are the issues in our, in our realm, you know, you know, DTSC is looking at California, they're not looking global or across, you know, the, the, they'd like to, 
Um, and it does impact the globe. It, it does help prioritize. Um, and it also helps set a level playing field across industry. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, there is, if there's a reason we're all doing it, yeah. um, it helps set a level playing field. And then it also then sparks the vendors for those chemicals to say, okay, we've got to start looking at it because the people that are buying it from us to formulate with are going to start asking you for that. Elaine, are you following up on that? Yeah. yeah, I'll let you go ahead of Tim if you are. Tim's going to be very patient. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I have a question, and it's not well formulated, but just some things that were just said um, are interesting, and I'm not I'm not sure how they would how they fit in. But this issue that there's, you know, there are the leaders and the laggards, and there's the um, some of that there can. The, there are leaders who, based on their market segment, can do things in one of their lines that they can't do in the other line because not everybody can pay for the products um, and not everybody cares to, about what's in the products, right? So the, this question of how you put people on a level playing field, how you encourage um, or... How, how you move the entire, you know, how you move all products and all sectors and all supply chains toward, what would we call it, safe, how you safen them, <laughs> toward safer is, I, I just think it's a really, it's such a challenging question, um, and I know you've, it's come up a lot in the, you know, since I've joined the panel, I'm the newest to the panel, but um, in terms of, you know, what is it you what is it you can do and who in industry is poised to even be able to respond? Um, I think these are all really challenging questions, and I'm not exactly sure if the work plan is someplace that you can also, you know, sort of tier what your goals would be towards those different kinds of uh, customers or um, regulated entities. We keep making the... The goals of the work plan larger. <laughs> well, I don't change the goals. Yeah. No, that was just a... No, it's, uh, these are important thoughts. So I want to move on to Tim. He's been exceedingly patient. Unless, Simona, is it okay if we let Tim go? He's, <laughs> okay. And Elaine, are you... <laughs> yes, that's okay. Um, yeah, this has really been an interesting conversation. I'm learning an awful lot from all this discussion. Um, in thinking about it, it, like when we're thinking about the work plan and what it can do, it's, I've, sound, I've heard like different functions that people are suggesting. So one I would call like the signaling function that Lane's been talking about. And like on that, it's like I have no doubt in my mind that there is some impact, some signaling function that's going on there. Uh, and I agree with um, Helen. My guess is that the stronger the signal, the more likely you're going to actually see action but once you have kind of vague and tentative signals, I think they are much less likely to create any action, partly because people are going to wait to see what happens and also because there's so much other stuff going on that the signals are not strong enough to drive behavior. So, um, so with that in mind, unless you like, you know, if you had some empirical work that indicated like how strong it is and under what circumstances, I think of that signaling function as kind of a co-benefit of the work plan. And I don't think you could, you know, uh, I wouldn't go to great lengths to put a lot of resources into that to change the work plan to, for that function unless you had a kind of more of an empirical basis to figure out how best to do that, right? So low resources in the work plan, why not to get that? But if you're changing the work plan or focus or incur a lot more resources, I'd be more hesitant in terms of weaker signals. Um, then there's, I think, what I would call the catalytic function, which moves away from trying to drive the behavior of the potential response, uh, are they responsible entities, right? Okay. To the idea of like, uh, I liked your idea about, okay, we're going to, we really care about drinking water. And by sending that, it's got kind of a catalytic function. It's going to drive kind of other agencies moving in that way. So it's both signaling and, but also catalyzing behavior and like, um, and I, I have to say, I kind of feel like the discussions there are kind of a, run the risk of turning the work plan into kind of strategic planning light, 
in the sense of I feel like to 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 drive and catalyze disparate agencies with different resources and incentives and all that to kind of drive them in a certain takes a lot more than what a work plan could do that in fact the work plan should be a indicator that that's happening rather than a driver of that right that I feel like you'd want to like have resources where you're kind of moving everybody to get them there and then as a result of that happening you see the work plan starts talking about it I'm skeptical that you'd be able to use the work plan to actually you know, create this integrated approach. Um, I'm in favor of integrated approaches, but I think if you, if you wanted to do that, maybe a strategic planning activity, an actual one, would be a great way to do it. Um, I don't think the work, I think the, of the work plan is more of an uh, implementation type document, not a strategic planning type document. So I think maybe strategic planning of a sense might be a great idea and involving other agencies in it could be a good thing to do. And then that could, maybe that process could create these things that then the work plan tries to implement as opposed to the other way around. All right, you've been patient, Simona, thank you. Especially kind of connected. So here in this discussion, I'm wondering, um, so far in these work plans, Not actually working. Colors. Oh, that means the battery's dying. Um, yeah. No, it, it's Here. coming. We need to have something. So, so far in the work plans that we've had, uh, we actually had more product categories than we were able to research or to actually cover during that three year period. So, I wonder what does the panel think about that? Is it okay to put more in the scope of the work plan than we actually get to scope during that? Or is it better to try to focus it and narrow it to what we actually think we're going to look at? Because the first strategy gives us the opportunity to adapt and to change as we learn more information, whereas the second way, um, I, I just wonder if there's any um, concerns that being too broad might um, decrease the signaling function of the work plan. So before we go to Helen, Ann, and Mike to answer this question, Andre's got something to I add. just wanted to kind of follow on what Simona's saying, which is when we initially uh, announced our first products in 2014, we sort of did them in sync, but we're no longer in sync. And in fact, the dates that the work plan sort of remains in effect don't necessarily coincide with how long it takes to do the things we're doing. So one of the reasons for carrying over categories was we were right in the middle of them. Uh, and I suspect that that's going to continue to be the case. And, I, you know, maybe the panel has perspectives on it. Like maybe going forward, the, the, as with this one, we added food packaging and we, we took out clothing. Uh, that might be kind of what's realistic to do given what's already on our plates and the constraints that we have in our resources. So start with Helen and Mike reacting to Simona's question. Um, so, I mean, exact obviously would, would have some benefits to sort of everybody back to our accurate deadlines and know exactly what's happening. Okay, that's not going to happen. But um, I would say that uh, err on the side of more than you can do because um, what would be bad was, would be to say, I'm going to do three things and then surprise people by bringing a fourth one in. That would be, like, really, really, really bad. Actually, you would, you would get stopped. I mean, if you said you were going to do three, there's no way you could bring in more after. So it's much better to overshoot. Um, it'll also... So I was thinking about the whole, like, signaling thing, though. If you have categories that, like, persistently don't get action, you will get a little bit of numbness, you know, um, and maybe just deal with it, you know, deal with it as it happens because it's like, because the surprise factor is such a bad negative that you just, it's better to go in the other direction. Um, and uh, it also gives you a chance to um, get that feedback about whether this really is a good, is this really where you want to spend your time? Because, you know, you, you do get pushback and questions and feedback and all these different things. And if you don't have 
if you don't have a little bit of slack in the system, you can't react to what you hear. Before we go to Anne, we do have, I just want to clarify, we do have the authority to amend the work plan. So that's a way to change it that softens the, what? Have you ever used that ability to amend the work plan? You have, I think. Uh, the only time we've done it is when uh, Governor Brown directed us through administrative uh, order to look at lead acid batteries. Subsequently, the legislature also adopted that in, in statute. So that's the only technical change, I believe. That really wasn't an amendment. That That's actually, it just became part of the work plan. By, right. By before the legislature adopted it, though, yeah. we did functionally amend it. Right? We were, right? So, so it was not, oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Quibble. Yeah. Is your <laughs> thing blinking green, or is it not blinking at all? It is green. blinking a very okay. slow green. Okay, it's probably about to lose its battery. Okay, so I'll while you're fast. talking, maybe somebody can walk by <laughs> um, I'm not sure that I have much more to add to what Helen said. For all those reasons, uh, I would keep it broader. Yeah. I, I think you were just starting to say, I mean, if you go into someone and you discover that it's not a great product, then you have more flexibility to go through. And you don't have the surprise factor. So. So I just strongly we, echo that. Someone hand one over there, because Mike's next. Mike needs a mic. <laughs> We're just going to wait for a minute while we get the battery. <laughs> we could use more. You can take first. Like, I was just at a meeting that had a, a mic in a box that you could throw. <laughs> it was like a stick. It was great. <laughs> yeah, as long as the <laughs> as long as the webcast audience <laughs> turned off while you were throwing. So. Yeah. So, Mike, you can go ahead. Okay. Yeah, and, and I'm, I I'm totally aligned with with what. Helen and Anna said, and I'm not, I don't know they're going to add a ton. What, what I wouldn't want to do with keeping it broad, if there are categories you're not going to look at, do take those off. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, and, and it goes to what Helen was saying. You know, don't lull people you know, in, into going numb off of it. There is a lot of value to the signaling. Um, and if, you do, if you're not going to work at it, on it, then, then do get rid of it. But leave it broad enough. I, there's so much talented staff, and, and, and the impression I get is, is a lot of where we're seeing things is, is something sparks interest in, in an area of knowledge that the staff here has. Mm -hmm. you know, so don't cut it down for the sake of having a smaller work plan and then limit what they can do. Um, if, if there's a possibility that they'll work on it, then leave it in, keep it broad. Um, but then do report out. You know, we looked at, at things, you know, it'd be nice to see in the work plan, yeah, we looked at five possibilities in this category. None of them made it, but, but there was activity. So um, at this point, I want to ask the staff, are there other things that you'd like us to cover? There's a question here that we haven't talked about the work plan format at all, or um, there may be some other questions that you all have about work plan before we wrap up this afternoon. So does anybody want to make any comments about format of the work plan? I think we're heading towards the end of the day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I, I've got to say that the, the staff work behind this, and I really appreciate how brief you made the presentation so you maximize the time available for the discussion. And also, the, I am hoping that folks are feeling comfortable with the interaction. I've certainly appreciated the staff interjections and guiding us towards giving you advice that you want. Um, but I think it is that time in the afternoon where it might be best for us to adjourn um, towards our, our evenings. And um, so with that, I, I, I just need to, I don't think there's anything specific to summarize. Is there anything anybody would like to say to wrap up before we? I, I have one comment that's very unrelated, if you don't mind. Yeah. I just, for our webinar listeners, the public comment period again tomorrow is toward the beginning of the day, and I did want to make sure people were aware of that if they haven't looked at tomorrow's schedule. That's all right, and uh, so with that, uh, tomorrow uh, we have a couple of interesting topics, and there is always the, um, if we 
wrap up um, either of those discussions early. There's the opportunity to revisit um, the items from today. So if you have some thoughts overnight, please do not talk about topics on the agenda at dinner. <laughs> but please do um, make a note of them um, and, uh, and let me know and, or Art know so that we can afford the opportunity to bring those up. And that also goes to staff if there's something that you'd like to pull the thread on a little more or something that we missed or you'd like to build on. Um, we do have a, a few minutes in that tomorrow. Um, so with that, um, please, in order to comply with Bagley Keene, we ask that panel members refrain from discussing the agenda topics outside of the meeting. And we will see you all tomorrow morning. We start at 8.30. For those who want to be on time, please do be here before 8.30 because I'm going to try really hard to make sure that I'm here at 8.30 and that we can get started. <laughs> so thank you very much and have a good evening. We'll see you tomorrow morning.